very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second edition of the PR and Popcom Women Achievers Summit and Awards 2021, presented by Ad Factors Knowledge Driven Communication, powered by Standard Chartered Bank, Hero Motor Corp, PhonePay, and Hill and Nolson Strategies Gold Partner Tute Consult. Before we move forward this morning, I'd like to play the introductory audiovisual for all of you. Can we have the AV, please? The second edition of Exchange for Media, PR and Corporate Communication, Women Achievers Summit and Awards 2021. Presented by Ad Factors PR. Powered by Standard Chartered Bank, Hero Motor Corp, PhonePay, Hill and Knowlton Strategies, Gold Partner, Toot Consulting. The Summit and Awards are the celebration of the contribution of women and their relentless pursuit of excellence in the field of public relations and communications. The second edition of the awards identifies, acknowledges and felicitates those women leaders who are shaping the industry through their incredible work. Through this initiative, we also applaud the agencies and corporates who are setting remarkable examples by encouraging gender diversity in their work culture. This year's jury panel was headed by Dr. Anurag Batra, Chairman and Editor-in-Chief, BW Business World and Exchange for Media. Ms. Nidhi Hola, Microsoft. Mr. Partha Ghosh, Samsung. Ms. Rama Paul, ABP Mr. Sanjeev Honda, Maruti Mr. Subhayu Mishra, Standard Chartered Bank Ms. Jasrita Dheer, Antara Mr. Atul Sharma, Radofin Ms. Pallavi Singh, Senior Business Advisor Mr. Abhishek Gulyani, Hill & Knowlton Strategies Ms. Ruchira Jaitley, HMD Ms. Kavita Jagtiani, Pitalite. Ms. Parachi Mohapatra, Dr. Reddy's. Exchange for Media and the Jury congratulates all the winners. Once again, a very warm welcome and very good morning to everyone who's joined us today. It's a very special day as uh, it's the second edition of the PR and Corpcom Women Achievers Summit and I'm Khyati Kawai, your host. It's a pleasure to be the host to all of you. It is my second year in running with this IP as well. Now, let me tell you something about the Women Achievers Summit. Brought together illustrious women leaders who are stalwarts, pioneers, revered in their field of work. As per a recent report by Catalyst in 2019, women held only 8% of management roles, 9% of business management roles, and were only 2% CEOs of India. Within communication industry, around 60 to 80 percent of workforce are women. 30 percent of the PR agencies are run by women leaders. Women not only bring creativity, as we all know, multifaceted talents, but also empathy and flexibility. Exchange for Media, through its initiative of Women Achievers Summit, wants to bring fresh perspective on trends, challenges, opportunities for the women in this industry. Today we have all a very power packed uh, session starting with five keynote sessions, six panels, and the key discussions will focus on subject of gender diversity, creativity, self growth, world beyond COVID, PR and communication skills and strategies, of course. As the day unfolds, we will hear stories unheard and untold by the pioneers of the communication domain. Now, before I take you on this journey, let's quickly take a look at our partner's audiovisual. Can we have the AV, please? Hey, I was thinking about taking a scooter, right? Which one? Hot pink or baby pink? Girls, what do you think? Wow, no pleasure. Right? Okay. First, I thought of power. No, this is a good idea. Then, what did you think? What did you think? Mileage. Let's go. Okay. Let's go. Then, think about power too. And ratio. Love me. 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 Now, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? Why should boys have all the fun? Whole new 
न्यू स्टाइल जिपी राइट बट वही इजी हैंडलिंग नई हीरो प्लेजर प्लस हर बार जब तुम बस अपनी सुनती हो वॉट विल पीपल से मैं नहीं पढ़ती हो तब हर बार मनाती हो तुम आजादी हर बार जब नहीं देखती तुम घड़ी की सुई जब हर बात को नहीं कहती तुम सही हर बार जब तोड़ती हो ग्लास सीलिंग जब खुल के एक्सप्रेस करती हो फीलिंग तब हर बार मनाती हो तुम आजादी हर बार जब लगाती हो कॉमेंट्स पे भी जब करती हो अपने करियर को एक्सेलरेट और हर बार जब तुम बेफिक्र बिंदास सड़कों पे निकलती हो तब हर बार मनाती हो तुम आजादी क्योंकि आजादी तुम्हारे लिए एक दिन नहीं एक आदत है मनाओ आजादी हर बार हर दिन Every corporation and brand has a public, and today's public is more powerful than ever before. They have the power to topple CEOs, reshape strategy, influence government policy, kill products, and create unicorns. They demand truth, transparency, and the highest behavioral standards. We are embracing change, constantly innovating the way our clients and the public communicate. whatever the sector and whatever the challenge our client obsession means constantly evolving new products and services we are innovating the future of public relations our belief is that brands with a clear authentic purpose and performance strategies aligned to business objectives are most likely to succeed we use strategy creativity and innovation driven by data and analytics to put your purpose and performance at the heart of all communications together purpose and performance drive audience preference we call this approach 3p communications hill and nolton strategies always in beta exchange for media a name synonymous with the latest news about the advertising industry in india The Exchange for Media Group, set up in 2000, has the most credible media platforms covering the entire advertising, media, and marketing domain, with its highly acclaimed digital, print, and on-ground assets. The group's flagship news portal, ExchangeForMedia.com, reaches over six lakh subscribers, who are the first to receive breaking news in the industry. The buzzing website not only covers the news but goes beyond the obvious to bring in a fresh point of view. Impact, the weekly news magazine from the group, is the most widely read business magazine in the advertising trade with in-depth analysis and news-based features providing perspective to key happenings in the industry. The monthly Pitch magazine provides a ringside view of events unfolding in the marketing landscape along with media and advertising. Another monthly magazine, Realty Plus, is a market leader in reportage on the real estate industry. Today, Exchange for Media is not only a leading publisher in the domain but owns the IP of more than 50 events spread across Mumbai. Delhi and Bangalore making it a powerhouse of information and knowledge sharing. Exchange for Media has curated and launched some of the most successful IPs across marketing, digital, TV, print, radio, mobile, OOH and PR. The Impact Person of the Year, Exchange for Media Conclave, Indian Digital Marketing Awards, Tech Munch Pitch CMO Summit, India Marketing Awards, Prime Time Awards, Indian Content Marketing Awards, Golden Mics, Enbar, 
are some of the group's top-notch events in addition to niche, bespoke events and roundtables curated especially for discerning clients. Exchange for Media events attracts stalwarts as speakers along with a loyal audience comprising of leaders, trendsetters and opinion makers. They are the perfect networking platform for the entire media and advertising industry. No wonder Exchange for Media group publications and events have high credibility and reach and are the destination of choice for agency, brand and media professionals across the industry. Exchange for Media BW Business World presents a rich legacy of curated events that enable conversations on policy issues in India. Because of the state of our cities, we have no option but to build smart and resilient cities. Digital India is more for the poor, underprivileged and the deprived. Covering a range of topics, BW Business World events look to create a strong narrative around smart cities, digital India, healthcare, Swachh Bharat, human resource issues, education, banking and finance, among others. The world is fast changing. Best practices are available now on the net. Because development puri rajniti mein ye focus ban gaya hai. BW Business World events provide a speaking platform to the voices that matter. Smart se taluk ye hai ki hum jo basic amenities hain you don't have to be a technologist. You need to understand how technology influences the world. Mahatma Gandhi was a great man. He was the leader of the freedom struggle. We believe that e-governance and IoT will play a very, very important role. BW Business World is an excellent exhibition platform that helps you showcase your services to the right audience. To be a part of our legacy, write in to us at partner at the rate businessworld.in. Thank you once again to all our partners and thank you all of you for joining us here today. Now I would like to invite on forum Dr. Anurag Batra, Chairman and Editor-in-Chief BW Business World in exchange for media to formally inaugurate the summit. He sent us his video message here but before we play that I'd like to inform all of you that we are buzzing on Twitter so we'd like all of you to not forget to tweet to us about this fantastic morning and evening using the hashtag, which is E4M Power Women Achievers Summit, E4M PR Women Achievers Summit, E4M PR Women. All of these hashtags can be used, use all of them or one of them, but do tell us about the, the event and what do you feel about it? So here we have Dr. Anurag Batra's video message. Can we play that please? Good morning. Welcome to the second edition of the Exchange for Media we are Women PR and Communication Professional Summit and Awards. This is the second edition of this initiative, which recognizes the leaders who are women in the corporate communications PR domain. Uh, uh, the media advertising marketing domain itself has a high participation of women across leadership, across middle level. Uh, the PR and communication industry possibly as a dominance of women. This is one domain where if we did research, the number of women in PR and COPCOM is tremendous. So this initiative looks at leaders who are making a difference, who are at the cusp of being a catalyst to change and who are making impact not only in their organization, but beyond that. Uh, we're talking on 2nd July 2021. Uh, I hope the last 12 odd weeks have been good for you and your family, you are safe for your organization. I know it's been a tough time, but as they say, tough people last, tough times don't. So clearly I'm sure you have refocused, re-energized and re-emerged to be able to go on with whatever you set out to do. I wish all the winners today evening, 6 p.m. is the awards. The PR and communication industry possibly has a dominance of women. This is one domain where if we did research, the number of women in PR and COPCOM is tremendous. So this initiative looks at leaders who are making a difference, who are at the cusp of being a catalyst to change 
and who are making impact not only in their organization but beyond that. Uh, we're talking on 2nd July 2021. Uh, I hope the last 12 odd weeks have been good for you and your family, you're safe for your organizations. I know it's been a tough time, but as they say, tough people last, tough times don't. So clearly I'm sure you have refocused, re-energized and re-emerged to be able to go on with whatever you set out to do. I wish all the winners today evening, 6 p.m. is the awards. Uh, congratulations to all the shortlisted nominees. Congratulations for being shortlisted. I'm sure you'll do well next year. And throughout the day, we have thought leaders who are women who will talk to us about their professional and personal journeys. So I look forward to celebrating the milestones of these women leaders with all of you. I'm sure you get inspired by their journeys and their stories. I am and I will. We at Exchange for Media wish you good luck. Stay safe. Get vaccinated. God bless you. Thank you so much, Dr. Batra. He sets the context right for this event. And now, without further ado, as we have our uh, speakers, panelists already on board, will not waste any time, but request all of you to be active uh, during the event. Tweet to us your key highlights from the event, from the sessions. And we're moving towards our first panel discussion, which is going to talk about women power in PR and purview on affluent leadership skills. We have a panelist for this discussion. We have with us Ms. Shivani Gupta, Chief Happiness Officer, SPAG Asia. Ms. Pooja Pathak, Co-Founder and Managing Director, Media Mantra. Ms. Arjuna Jain, Managing Director, PR Pandit. Ms. Manisha Chaudhary, Founder and Director, Value 360 Communication. Lavina Gujral, CEO of Candor Communication. And moderating this session is Ms. Tarunjit Ratan, Founder of PRPOI. A very warm welcome to you, ladies. And uh, Tarunjit, just to give you a markup, we have 40 minutes for this discussion. We are looking forward to uh, this very interesting discussion with all you lovely ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. Um, yes, that was a note on me making to make sure that I keep a you know watch on the time. I'm so happy to be hosting the session with all you know such awesome ladies out here. So let's get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for the first E4M session for the PR and Copcom Women Achiever Summit, where today we will discuss and gather insights on women power in PR and purview on affluent leadership. This is the second edition of the Women Achievers Summit and Awards, and it's a celebration of womenhood and the contribution of the relentless pursuit of excellence in the field of PR and communications. And today, to talk to us on the subject, we have with us a remarkable panel of women who have made an impact in the industry across segments and generations. Without much ado, let me introduce you to our panel. We have with us Shivani Gupta, SPAG Asia, Pooja Pathak, Media Mantra, Archana Jain, PR Pandit, Manisha Chaudhary, Value 360 Communication, Lavina Gujral, Candor Communications. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tarunjit. So let's get started, right? Uh, as Mr. Batra also said, and you know, all of us have seen it throughout our experience in the industry, women have dominated the PR space just in sheer numbers. But for the benefit of our viewers, could you help us understand why? and what makes this field more appealing. Um, Archana and Lavina, I'd like you to kind of, you know, uh, share your perspective first. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think there's a great time for women in PR and marketing. Women have the opportunity to become the driving force, take leadership positions. I think more and more companies, not just in PR and advertising, but across industries, is recognizing and promoting individuals based on their talent. Uh, rather than on their gender, right? And the right. same is being emulated yeah. in our industry too. And mm. it's nothing, more, nothing is more inspiring than seeing women in the industry uh, that are willing to take risks, are, you know, are coming out of maybe projecting more innovative ways to reach and influence the right audiences. And we are seeing also some inspirational sort of role models for us to follow. 
for example, Minu Han Dahina global role at Google, you know, so that will inspire a lot of young people to come in and join our profession. I think that is what makes uh, the profession quite appealing. Absolutely. And I love the background that you have. We're still buzzing from home. We all are. Yeah, we're working from home till the, till the end of September right now. <laughs> awesome. Everybody's got to be double vaccinated. <laughs> Absolutely. Pooja, would you like to uh, add your views to that? Yeah, so, uh, you know, as Arjuna had rightly said about uh, the impact and, you know, how women roles have become very powerful. Also, the fact that multitasking and problem solving skills, which, you know, are key components which, which women bring on the table and compassion is something which, you know, I feel that women are able to nurture it better. So I think these mm -hmm. are skill sets. Which probably is the real thing that why the, you know, why there is so much of fascination for this kind of a trend coming up. Absolutely. Um, thank you for sharing that. You know, while we all agree this is an appealing field, there are a few key skills I feel that one needs to have, not just to make it, but to actually thrive in the industry. Can you share three top skills that you would want women in PR to focus on? Um, Pooja, uh, Manisha and Lavina, could we hear your views first? Yeah, um, so I'll start. So, um... So I think three skills which I feel women should definitely have in this fast evolving industry is being agile. You know, the media landscape and the way we are consuming content is changing. So we need to adapt quickly to use these media. And here's the constant need for upskill. These are the sk three skills I feel is required here. Yeah. I think in, uh, I'd just like to add to that and say that, uh, you know, because the situation today we are in is not something any of us have experienced before. So uh, there is a need to, uh, you know, be a constant learner, to be to have a collaborative uh, approach uh, to our work, to towards, you know, whatever uh, we are involved in, and also to have a higher degree of empathy uh, in in today's scenario, right? Uh, because you know, people are stretched, people are in a situation. Uh, where there has been no precedent that they could have looked up to or, you know, so right from leadership onwards, right down to the, you know, the newest kid that you have on your team, everyone right. is at a, you know, at a different level, coping with things, coping with struggle. So I don't think that, uh, you know, we, uh, we need to, I think at this point, uh, look for newer traits in ourselves also to be able to do better at uh, what we do. Okay. okay, that's that's very relevant. Uh, Shivani, would you want to add to that? Thank you, Taranjit. Um, I believe that uh, women naturally have the attribute of creating a strong ecosystem, you know, and the three things which I think that really carry forward women very strongly are the courage, uh, compassion, and the connection. You know, the way uh, I think uh, women are able to carry forward in terms of uh, courageously multitask things that balance, you know, the work-life balance. And uh, of course, all of us know the kind of uh, uh, empathy when we are talking about, you know, so the kind of connection a woman can make, whether it's, you know, with your peers, your clients, or uh, through the messaging, through your campaigns. Right. Uh, these are three important aspects, uh, which I feel are the key to any woman in any industry. Absolutely. Uh, May I just add another couple yeah. of points? Sure. Okay. I, I believe that, you know, we need to look at two other factors, which is how is it that we increase our influence? Mm -hmm. You know, I say this because, you know, to be able to influence decision making at every level of the organization is going to be very, very important. We can be excellent professionals, you know, we can have great writing skills, being able to sort of create uh, campaigns but unless we are able to navigate and convince people of the value of PR and communication in general we're not going to get that seat on the table right, right. and I think uh, to be able to influence the conversation is more important than having superior skills today then the second point that I think is something that the industry needs is mentoring you know all of us need a network of people from whom we can exchange point of views 
right? If we know each other, we can pick up the phone on each other, get a point of view. As Tom Peters, really the management guru uh, said once, true leaders don't create followers, but create leaders. So we need to nurture leaders in, in as women leaders. So we must support more women in our industry. And so whether it means speaking to students or uh, within our companies or outside the companies, young managers that are trying to, maybe other entrepreneurs, that's become <laughs> something that I think is the need of the hour. That's a, you know, that it would be amazing if uh, a mentorship program of sorts, specifically in PR entrepreneurship, were to take, uh, you know, uh, take place. Maybe it's another opportunity for each one of the PR firms or maybe for them to create a forum like that. That would be wonderful. Yeah. But I hear you, you know, the, while we've all spoken about empathy on some level or the other, learnability and increasing influence. These are two crucial skills that I agree we must do so that you can get it right. So how do you actually get started on it? How do you start, you know, um, nurturing learnability in the teams that we have in ourselves? How does one get started on enhancing influence uh, given the situation that all of us are working in? The question is open to the floor. If any one of you would like to start first, that would be wonderful. Ashna, why don't we start with you on increasing influence? Okay. I think uh, increasing influence is linked very much to the mentorship, right? right. If you have the confidence, you know, somewhere along the line, um, uh, if, I, if I look at it, there's been a gender imbalance, right? I mean, that's because historically uh, there's been inequity in leadership. Men have always had the stronger role and that needs to change. And that needs to change in the way we, uh, maybe the organization culture mm. that we, right. we inculcate and we foster in all of our organizations. Uh, it's not like big initiatives are required. It's just small little things you know, maybe making your teams more inclusive. If you have a, have a sort of a committee on a particular subject, make sure that there's, there's a balance. And mm -hmm. I'm not just talking about PR because in PR, we still have a lot of women, but right. in other industries too, it has to something, I think it's gonna be systemic. It has gotta be across, across society uh, where <laughs> women uh, kind of come to the fore. And, and that'll encourage, you know, uh, more and more, uh, women leaders for sure um an area that i find is women tend to be more inhibited you know there's a lack of confidence they, they just self-belief is a major inhibitor where women limit their options to you know okay when the opportunity drops on that table they're very happy to rather than go chase that and and we're mm -hmm. seeing that change but there's a lot more that has to happen there have to be role models that we need to you know so when you when you hear of a fencer who's going to the Olympics or you hear of Deepika who's won the sort of archery thing, those are role models that, you know, women uh, definitely, we need, to, we need to get more people to sort of uh, recognize that, learn about them and therefore follow the unexpected path. And if we can, Absolutely. we must strongly believe in putting ourselves outside that, you know, to create an opportunity own the unexpected and create something new. I think that'll foster a lot of change. Uh, but it, it, you know, so you've got to have role models and you've got to sort of break down that lack of confidence by nudging more of the young people forward. Interesting. So I was reading, you know, recently reading this uh, HBR corporate research that had just come up. And they spoke about the fact that, you know, when they asked uh, women themselves to, to rate themselves on uh, leadership skills and different parameters, it was found that a lot of them rated themselves much lower when it came to leadership positions. But this confidence that you're talking about, you know, substantially increased as they hit 40 and above. And that was a time that um, the confidence with men in leadership kind of started declining. Now that's an interesting conundrum, but wow. you know, could each one of the uh, panelists to give us you know, one key thing because self-doubt, self-bias is a very crucial thing that 
you know, we kind of kill our own opportunities before somebody else has to. Yeah. Uh, I would like each one of the panelists to, you know, recommend one thing to all our women PR and COPCOM uh, attendees today uh, that will help them kind of get over the self bias. Pooja, let's start with you. So, you know, I feel, Tarunjit, that, you know, career interruptions that happen, the hindrance sometimes is also restricted to the way we kind of feel. So my tip would be that you got to be yourself very, uh, you know, confident and you got to be very sharp and out there because if we limit ourselves into that thing, we will, of course, get into those things. And, and another thing is that it's percent or 90% and still be out there. So every role you can't do 100% right. So delegate the work. If you can't do it yourself, delegate the work. But if you have a strong career that you want to foster for yourself, yes, you have to yourself get out of that hindrance block and do it yourself. So my thing would be that do it yourself. Be that, uh, you know, runner yourself. Nobody else will do it for you. Understood. Shivani, how does one, uh, you know, get over the self bias? Uh, so Tarunjit, I think uh, the self-bias and uh, self-doubt begins right from the young time when it's more like conditioning is such, you know, when right. uh, you are kind of always told that you are supposed to do this, you're supposed to not do that. But I see that uh, with millennials and Gen Z in the workforce, you know, and I see that uh, the sharpness and I see that, you know, uh, looking up to something, I think it is very important to find a mentor to find, uh, I don't say that um, you need to find one particular influencer or anybody you look up to one person, but I think you pick up things from all of the places and you can kind of build that your own uh, characteristics and attribute in yourself. And right. a lot of millennials, and I think most of the millennials and Gen Z are now doing that, you know, there is no one idol like earlier always used to talk about, oh, I have this role model, I have that idol. Now, I think people really talk about uh, pick up attributes from different, uh, you know, successful women, men, whoever it would be. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, diversity has already started, uh, you know, in terms of uh, taking place, in terms of, uh, you know, the mindset of people. So right. that is uh, something that I would still suggest everybody that, you know, look up to pick up the most important attributes you like in others and learn from them. Absolutely. Having a good role model makes a lot of difference. Uh, Manisha and Lavina, would you like to add to that? So, uh, you know, we have uh, heard it from many people that if you are in your self-doubt, you know, you have to uh, work on your emotional question or intelligent question. However, for women specifically, I would like to add that along with other questions, it's very important to work on our you questions and why questions. Your question is basically, you know, uh, acknowledge your weaknesses, work on your strength, and then carry forward in your life. And why question is define the purpose of your life, where I'm not just talking about the happiness, you know, but other aspects, you know, that you can actually question, you know, while, uh, you know, uh, thinking that how to move forward in our life. So I think, you know, it's very important to engage all these questions, you know, questions together, and then try to make big things in your life. Definitely, you know, such, you know, small steps, which you will take, you know, to work on your personality, definitely going to, you know, uh, you know, remove self doubt, whatever you have in your you know, life. Yeah. Absolutely. Self introspection always helps. Uh, Lavina? Yeah, um, I also think that, uh, you know, we need to know our core values and our core strengths, right? Uh, once we are sure of what those are, we can build from there on. The rest of it, a lot like everyone has said, depends on mentoring, you know. I think Tarun. I think that the core yeah. values and our needs and what we stand for, uh, you know, let's let's just keep that in focus because you know, women are born with a few inherent traits which I think we are, you know, uh, like everyone has said multitasking and problem solving and all of that. So I think if those uh, things we try to build on from there, I think, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great place to start from. 
Yeah, since Tarun has, uh, has seems to Tarunji should have dropped out. I'll just continue and add on another point that, you know, yes, you all spoke about the fact that we need to play to our best skills, etc. But I think learning constantly is another thing that will yield a little bit of confidence. If you are sure, you know, like, because the, you know, the outside ecosystem, specifically in PR keeps changing so rapidly that we need to be learning all the time, always being at the cutting edge of innovation or technology, because that's what our profession requires. It's important to be looking at what trends are there, what's going to happen next, uh, then figure out how to stay ahead of them. So how do we master new mediums, like whether it be social media, podcasts, influencer marketing, only then you will have that disruptive or clutter breaking campaign idea to impact stakeholder communication, whether it be in the B2C or the B2B domain you know, uh, predictive and analytics and those mega trends as well. So yeah, in continuation to what Archana has mentioned, in 2020, we had seen the kind of challenges, you know, that were thrown upon us with, you know, a, a pandemic, uh, you know, uh, we had to suddenly make changes in the way we were working and communicating with our internal and external stakeholders. So yeah, I completely agree with what Archana has mentioned you know, constant upskilling and learning is very, very important. We have seen the kind of, you know, paradigm shift that has happened in the PR industry in last decade. You know, innovation and technology has taken a center stage. And now it's no more about just telling a story. It is also about driving a conversation across multiple mediums that are available to consume content. So yeah, I was just backing up what Archana just um, mentioned. Rethink, relearn and adapt to the you know, but it's it's interesting that all of you have mentioned learnability, reskilling, upskilling as one of the key skills. However, when we look at, you know, a majority of the workforce, a lot of them want to finish familiar, which becomes a challenge for, you know, uh, it again creates another hurdle or another challenge for people or towards their own growth. Is there is there something that you would like to add, you know, which will help women in PR and communication uh, understand how to unlearn and relearn. Manisha and uh, Lavina would like you to address that. Yeah, I just uh, see uh, one of the things that have changed in the past few years is how much technology has crept into our lives, right? There was a time right. when PR and technology, unless you were working on a hardcore technology client, there wasn't uh, too much uh, you know, association for uh, PR professionals on the technology front. Now, uh, agencies have uh, within themselves built a large framework of, you know, technical competencies with which, you know, which are used in the uh, our day to day business be it in, you know, measurements or tracking or what have you. On the other mm -hmm. side, on the client side, I cannot think of a single industry today that doesn't have a technology element. Right. right. So that in itself is a huge change that has come. So mm -hmm. I don't I wouldn't say that we need to unlearn what we have, but I'll just like to say that I don't think we will ever be at a point that we could afford to stop learning, right? So, and especially being a women-driven industry and, uh, you know, women and technology is a whole different discussion and uh, it's getting better every day. But for all of us to be able to understand the technological aspect, both on the client side, the media side, and the within the agency side, I think that is one area where we will see a lot of growth in the and a lot of changes coming from there in the coming years. Absolutely, Manisha. Yeah, so Lavina has mentioned uh, uh, you know uh, a good point here, but I would like to answer it from a different uh, you know angle. So yes, uh, you know, we have to learn, we have to, and you know, constant upskilling is important and we have discussed it many times also, but I, I also feel that women need a lot of support both from the organization side and, you know, a personal family side to continue their journey, you know, for a longer period so that they get an opportunity to unlearn and learn. You know, we, also, we, we know that in still in many families, you know, women are a primary caregiver. You know, sometimes that become a hindrance for them to continue or excel in their profession. Uh, right. You know, I feel that the entire ecosystem has to be oriented where, you know, at workplace level, we are introducing flexible, you know, uh, policies for expectant mothers or working mothers. 
uh, etc and at the community level we all women you know we have to join hands together to extend support to them when they need it at the personal level so i think if we if entire ecosystem will work together i'm sure you know uh, we have proved our mettle we have proved our potential there are so many women leaders also in the industry we are ready to learn you know uh, unlearn we are ready to you know upskill ourselves but i think here i feel sometimes you know there is a gap that needs to be um, filled you know with the proper support both at the workplace workplace level and at the personal or family level yeah. can i add absolutely what, uh, manisha said here um you know when we are talking about uh, the policies and we are talking about the workplace practices i think it is very important to have balanced uh, policies and balanced workplace practices when we talk about you know maternal leaves when we talk about uh, you know like uh, women uh, leaves caregiving leaves it should be a balanced uh, um, you know policies which is government uh, public policies or the workplace policies uh, it shouldn't be just like uh, for a woman i think if unless and until it starts from uh, having a balance between the genders you know in terms of even the leaves when we are talking about we are talking about maternal paternal you know if the person is a caregiver that person should be getting the equal amount of leaves you know that's where i think we start building in the sense of equality that's where we start building in the sense of uh, you know yeah everybody is in the same ecosystem and everybody is equally responsible if we try keep favoring one particular section then obviously we are still you know on one hand we are trying to uh, fight the uh, gender inequality and on the other hand we are still trying to give them the extra benefits whereas and we are telling okay you are the caregiver and men are supposed to be working you know which is not the fact you know it's interesting that you bring up this point now because my next question is directly on this um you know a lot has been said about gender balance equality especially in the last year where the role of women as you know she mentioned that is primarily been given to women right the role of caregiver has been given to the woman and it's it's been touted as the shadow pandemic but have and a lot of corporates law of agencies have been talking about balancing balancing this equation out <laughs> change for the better or in reality for women on the ground has the needle moved beyond campaign talk pooja i would like you to address that first has has that happened has that happened in your agency so you know uh, tarunjit i would also like to bring it from the client perspective you know there are a lot of clients that you know we had in the manufacturing industry that we are handling and you know it was a perception that how can a Women actually lead that wing, but today, you know, their CEO, their you know, in a way, uh, so this, so this self talk, that awareness talk, has happened for good, and also in our organization, also, it is very gender inclusive, and it is more talent driven. It is more talent oriented. But yes, you know, sometimes uh, these conversations are also important because women themselves have to know that they too have the power to do a lot of things. so uh, this needle i think has worked out in a positive manner only and from the and from the recruitment phase itself you know if there are women we definitely talk about the perks we definitely talk about the benefits that we can uh, give to them so in right. that context it has worked to a better right okay uh, would anybody want to add to this uh, yeah i mean as we are on it we 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 are at 85% women workforce right we are proud about that uh you know we've always and i think we've built that because from way back in 2004 2005 we've encouraged and welcomed women back to the workforce after they've had to take break to start a family or to become caregivers in in any situation you know the flexibility to work from home was has been consciously sort of encouraged i think right. those simple measures have you know it's only now that the government has sort of come in and said okay now we have a 6 months maternity but at that point of time i remember two of my very senior colleagues today who had to you know had had babies to nurture and they said we are not ready to come back to work uh, but we want to get stimulated so we said yes continue working from home in a limited manner mm. you know so you can you can take a limited road you can have limited hours so that you can balance your life and i think those options once available to women will certainly 
a will in God. I think the pandemic will assist this because in a way, uh, the metrics of evaluating work from home have each organization has, has kind of figured out a way to do so. And I think that'll be a really good uh, point in the long run for women to sort of be uh, integrated back into the workforce once they take a break. Absolutely. Well, I just want to add that uh, uh, no doubt gender diversity or inclusivity is very vital for any workplace. But it is also important to understand, you know, uh, that gender diversity it is more than maintaining the fair number of genders uh, in your workplace. It is very important that, you know, uh, at an organization level, we, we actually empower women and, you know, uh, pave the way for them so that they can take leadership roles in the organization. So, yeah, and, you know, there have been studies that, you know, the companies, those who are, who are maintaining healthy, gender diverse in their organization are actually performing better growth wise or financial outcome ties uh, and in the basis of financial outcome, they are performing much better. Why it is also because you know uh, you are you you are ha you having a wider talent pool in your system, you know you are having uh, uh, people from multiple experiences who are you know adding a lot of value or giving different perspectives to your work. So yeah, mm -hmm. so it is important, but yeah, it has to be taken beyond just maintaining the mere numbers. We have to empower our uh, you know uh, women. You know. Absolutely, and since I, I have. Uh... Sorry, since I have such amazing, you know, women on this panel today, it'll be, I'll be amiss if I don't ask you this one question. What is that one leadership trait without which, you know, moving ahead and heading an agency or heading a department will not be possible? It'll give uh, our audience a clue about what to work on. One skill. Could I go first? <laughs> yes, absolutely. I think listening. I think that's uh, seriously uh, um, something that uh, women are good at, um, mm -hmm. but I think it's also something that we need to consciously channel. Uh, communication does involve a lot of creativity, writing, strategy, etc. But uh, the skill that can put all of this into action and 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 channel it towards success is listening. So listen to your customers, listen to your clients. What are they talking about? What are competition saying? What is the feedback that you're getting on a particular campaign, right? How can you, as you strengthen this, uh, you know, and input it, you would be able to adapt your in, into a much more stronger uh, uh, campaigns and strategies. Interesting. All the years of that we have been taught to be good little girls and listen can actually turn into an advantage. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, Tarunjit, I would like to talk about that. Yes. So one skill would be. Yeah, hello. Yeah. Is uh, Pooja going first or I'm going first? <laughs> <laughs> you go first. That's fine. <laughs> okay. I just uh, wanted to add here to in contribution with what uh, Archana said, you know, it's all um, in terms of uh, creating purpose of belonging. Uh, when we talk about, you know, that's an instinct naturally that uh, I think we will have. And that's an instinct which has a deep respect when we talk about. Uh, you know, being a good story there. Awesome. Uh, Pooja? A prioritization. So I feel once you're able to prioritize things, you know, it just kind of, you know, helps you streamline a lot of things. So prioritization for me, I think, is that one skill which should not be a miss for sure. Absolutely. So one uh quality which I would like to add is to, you know, as a leader, we should have an ability to convert an obstacle into an opportunity. I think I learned this lesson when I started my company, which was at the peak of global economic slowdown, and then fast forward to 2020, when the pandemic happened. So I think I was able to apply, you know, that knowledge, and, uh, you know, uh, and was able to convert, you know, the, the uh, opportunities, you know, uh, that we are able to convert the adversities into opportunities for the entire organization. Yeah, absolutely. Very good advice. Uh, Lavina? Yeah, I think for me, the one key uh, thing to keep in mind uh, is to be able to build a narrative at any given point of time, regardless of what the situation is. I think that uh, would take into account uh, many factors like listening, like empathizing, like, you know, whatever converting an opportunity, uh, obstacle into an opportunity, all of those things. But you must always know that, yes, 
yes, I have the ability to be able to build a narrative. I have some inherent skills. I've developed some skills. We have the potential. I have the means to collaborate, all of that. So I think if we keep in mind the fact that, you know, uh, building a narrative is what PR is all about, whether internal or external. Interesting. So while we've spoken a lot about the past and the present, let's end the panel on a note from the future, right? What are the changes that you see happening in the next couple of decades in the PR and communication industry? Ashna, let's start with you. I would hope to see more women leaders, okay? <laughs> on this forum, I can't <laughs> but say that, right? Uh, but really on the professional side, I think um, COVID-19 has fast-tracked everything including the evolution of the digital landscape and then as a result pr has undergone a lot of changes right. it's imperative for professionals uh to stay ahead of the curve in this digitally savvy world that we are living in uh and and how, ace how to leverage technology for the benefit of our craft absolutely manisha uh so I feel that, you know, technology will keep playing an important role uh, in the next decade as well. And I feel that, you know, authenticity and transparency will take a center stage, you know, um, dealing with very smart audiences and, you know, they are aware of fake news and other things. I think it is for us, it will be very important, you know, even technology will keep playing a central role, but authenticity and transparency will, you know, will become a key. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that is, that will be a key factor in helping change the reputation of the entire PR industry as well. Yeah. Shavani? Apart from, of course, technology, which we have been talking about and, you know, going forward, that's going to be the thing, you know. I think a uh, lot of focus is also going on, um, you know, purpose-driven uh, campaigns. So, mm -hmm. uh, like Manisha mentioned, you know, people understand, people are savvy, people cannot just kind of tell them what uh, create a story there has to be a purpose behind anything there has to be some standard positive change which you are actually making when you are working on a campaign or your you know there is a strategy so that i think is definitely very important apart from you know working uh, having hands on with the technology absolutely lavina I think for me, with uh, you know, I I think agencies need to be uh, more wholesome in their out, you know, in their offerings uh, to clients. That is what we'll see happening. Uh, we'll see a lot of experiential stuff coming into PR. Uh, we'll uh, see a lot of creative, uh, you know, things happening in uh, PR. It could be technology enabled, whatever. But I think uh, overall the industry is moving towards a single point of contact for their marketing requirements and i think we will see a lot of uh, you know consolidation on that front in the future absolutely puja yeah so you know uh, as we already have seen that post pandemic pr has already started taking a center stage at most cases and now i think the role of pr would start from the boardrooms so that is how it's going to be an upsurge that we see and how the dynamics of uh, communication would really change. Right. Uh, very, very, you know, uh, we need to see all these trends come into play in the near future, maybe in the next couple of years. I'm hoping we don't have to wait for a decade for all these conversions to happen. Yeah. Um, so on that note, we'll bring this discussion to a close. Any parting shots that one of you would like to? In Sorry? The there are some questions in the Q&A. Just check. Uh, hold on. Okay, so there's one question for Manisha. Why are women domination number of PR and Copcom? Why okay, why do women dominate in the field of PR and Copcom? <laughs> Any discrimination and why this trend? <laughs> there is no discrimination. I think uh, uh, we are very good in storytelling. And you know, we have some inherent qualities that make us uh, fit you know, for the profession. However, I do not believe in being gender specific, whether male or female. I think, you know, everyone has contributed a lot in shaping this, you know, uh, uh, industry. So, yeah, so I feel, yes, PR is a female dominated industry, but yes, I think still a lot needs to be done at the leadership level. We are seeing a lot of leaders, but as Arjuna mentioned, we want to see more women.
But it's interesting. interesting to note how the word discrimination, I think for the first time associated with women, it's never been like that. <laughs> it is um, interesting. I, I see it from the other end. Uh, I'm sure men wonder the same thing. Uh, another question, you know, do you need to be a pastry personality to be in the PR industry? Absolutely not. Uh, see, uh, I, I, uh, my answer is very clear. Absolutely not. Because, you know, maybe the kind of clients uh, that we work with are primarily B2B, you know, so really there is no page three concept in the B2B world. So, uh, no, we are we are very happy to be behind the scenes or just, I, I uh, second you know, so far that. as the client knows that we, yeah, I, I, so far as the client knows my importance, I'm happy with that. I think you need to, uh, you know, what he's probably trying to understand is whether you need to be a center of influence. Yes, we need to be a center of influence in the kind of industry that we are we are in and be able to sort of table uh, trends to our clients. So whether it be in the B2B or the B2C, if you need to be networked, and that is very, very important, right? Uh, to be able to sort of open doors for our clients um, uh, in industry chapters or on the right platforms, then yes, yeah, sure, you need to be certainly somebody who is a center of influence. Very, very well put, uh, both of you. You know, on that note, I will bring this discussion to a close. Kyati is on the screen. That means it's not time to leave. <laughs> Thank you to our wonderful panelists for sharing such insightful views with us. And a big shout out to the entire E4N team and Karan for putting this event together. We at PRPOI have been delighted to moderate this session for you today. Thank you for joining us and stay tuned for more interesting discussions on this forum today. Kathy, over to you. And Thank I you. did this in time. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for keeping it uh, crisp. And thank you, all, all of you ladies, for bringing out such great insights. I can see from the Q&A and the audience interaction happening on different platforms that they really enjoyed this session. So thank you so much for your time and being here on this platform. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thanks, Tarunji. Thanks, ladies, Manisha, Shivani, everybody. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. With that, ladies and gentlemen, let me remind all of you that keep tweeting to us about the event, your key insights, anything that were the highlights for you with the hashtag E4M Women Achievers Summit or E4M Women. We're moving forward to our first keynote session of the day and re really excited to bring on board uh, Ms. Elzandi. She's the APAC Head Regional Marketing and Market Development from Bayer. She has done multifarious initiative for the cause of women empowerment. And today on this platform, she will be talking on the topic of women empowerment through agriculture and food, the role of communication in supporting the cause. So very warm welcome to you, Elzandi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, yeah, so um, I'm going to start off just by telling a little bit about my own story. And um, I hope that there's some learnings or tidbits that can actually apply. It was actually good to listen to the previous um, speakers in the panel because it's very different. The world that I'm operating in is very much a male dominated world, agriculture. So um, if you walk into my office, you would think um, that I have an ordinary job that perhaps I graduated from high school, went to college and started working my way up the corporate ladder. But my career did not take such an organized linear path. And yours certainly doesn't have to either. Um, that should not be the expectation. It should rather be an exception if your career is taking a linear path. Um, so where am I from? I was born and raised in South Africa. I have a bachelor's degree in genetics and mathematics and an associate's degree in teaching. So I taught mathematics for six years for postgraduate math college students and grade 11 and 12 students while I was still educating myself. Um, so I went on to get a master's degree in plant breeding and an MBA. The first two degrees um, was full-time while being a student and the others were all happening while having a full-time job 
getting married, starting a family, and very, very aggressively start to build my career. Um, to say my career path was unexpected is an understatement. Every job I took had some uniqueness to it. Either being the youngest, um, most of the time being the only female, and always the one with the least experience for that specific job. This was many times, as you can expect, a surprise to others and the people around me. For me though, it was not even a consideration. And that brings me to the second topic that I wanna to touch on, and that is what drives success? And this is not just something that I'm speaking from my own experience. Um, for many years, I've been advocating for females in career, for women in the workplace, and working with students at all levels to try and figure out what is it that makes up that magic recipe. And how do we support and enable women to optimize their contribution in the workplace? Um, and, and for me, really, it all boils down to equipping yourself to be the absolute best candidate, which leads into how you navigate the competitive job market. And how do you differentiate yourself from others? Um, it's simple. You have to be authentic, be real, and live with passion. Make the world see and know what you're passionate about. Don't try to mimic what you see around you. Don't necessarily try to mimic and become the leaders that you see are successful. It's really about who are you and what do you bring to the table? So the first step, and I've touched on it, and in one of my previous comments is, you have to ensure that you are the absolute best qualified candidate. Educating um, and daily learning, looking for those opportunities to equip yourself with skills and qualifications um, and being a lifelong learner, it's a mindset and a lifestyle that you have to adopt. So always think about what is it that I have in my toolbox? What are the skills that I've really cemented in me as an individual? And where are those areas that I can further build out my skill set? So that's the hardcore learning skill set part. Then once you have done that, you have to identify the job that is a balance between requiring the skill sets that you've got, utilizing your natural strengths, but at the same time, offer opportunities for you to learn new things, to further develop yourself. Um, I myself have not taken a job where I had already done at least 50% of what the job required. So if you look at the job description, I can check the box on 50% of what's required for this job. The other 50% I view as my learning and development opportunity. And I'm very clear on how I use my strengths to overcome my gaps. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So first of all, equip yourself to be the best. Identify the job that offers a balance between you adding value and you having a development and growth opportunity. Then thirdly, once you have secured that role, focus 100% on performance. Ensure that you exceed everyone's best expectations. Focus on your team and what the team jointly and individually need to accomplish. Go that extra mile to ensure that you do everything in your power to help your teammates and the joint group to achieve and be successful. This is really critical. And this is also how you will distinguish yourself from the rest. You will earn and build a lot of trust and credibility and most needed the recognition and the support that you need from your peer group to be recognized as someone that can advance their career. People recognize great leadership in those that serve the people around them. And this is 
something that I want to leave with you. And it really worked for me in the tough environment that I had to build my career. If you're the odd one out, if you're the one that people question what you bring to the table, this is a really great way to prove your existence and the value that you can add to the team. And then lastly, if you are successful in the first three steps, the fourth will follow, and that will be to, to find that next opportunity. How do you advance to the next step? That opportunity will present itself, um, and it will be well-deserved, and the timing will align with your personal readiness to go after the next opportunity, which brings you back to step one, where you start thinking about what is my skill sets? How do I further build out what I can learn? and then you go through the whole cycle again. Now, um, these are all easy things to say. It's a little bit harder to, to actually execute. And it makes me think about um, what challenges do women face? And how do we behave to take ownership of our own destinies? Um, the one thing that I can say that my own career and many of the successful females that I observed around me did was you have to do things your own way. Um, do not wait for others and try to do things the way that others previous generations have done it. This is a different world and we have to recognize that if we want to have it all, having it all does not include doing things the same way that previous generations did it. You have to get creative and be bold um, and really own how you want to achieve what you set out for yourself to accomplish. Um, we must get creative and find new ways of doing things. So what am I talking about? That include finding ways on how you partner with your spouse or your life partner, roles in the relationship and the family life and setting um, is going through an evolution at last. The world in totality around us have been evolving and changing for many years, but somehow the male female roles in the typical household have been frozen in time. Now, here's the great news, ladies. It's time to change and the change will be for the better, especially for the people on this call. Um, that though, is very closely tied to your confidence. You have to build your confidence and confidence comes really from within. Being comfortable in your own skin and truly understanding and liking, be in favor of your strengths, your weaknesses and your opportunities for development. Take time to really think about this and be brutally honest with yourself. If you do not know what these are, or you struggle to pinpoint these different facets of the individual and who you are, ask the people that you love and trust and that knows you very well. You must thoroughly understand what you are good at and how those strengths could compensate for your weaknesses. Um, be clear on where your development opportunities are and really look for ways to improve in those areas. Um, and once you have this, you have to be able to tell your story and tell your story in two minutes with a lot of conviction. So what do I mean by that? What is my story? Just to illustrate. My story when someone say, who are you and why are you doing what you're doing? This is how I explain it. Growing up in South Africa and traveling the world through many different roles at Bayer, I was privileged enough to meet and see how different people live in their local communities around the world. Working with agriculture and farmers, you go to local villages and you really get a flavor for the country, the culture and how people build a life for themselves. The one thing that was very evident is there's great need and severe poverty out there. I can tell you a career in agriculture is meaningful in many ways because you can touch and change people's lives. Having a great passion for children and elderly 
These are the two segments of the human population that must really rely on other, others many times for their prosperity. And not everybody in this world have a great sense of responsibility. Um, and, and that's really something that I'm passionate about. Almost half of the world's population live on less than $2.50 per day. And according to UNICEF, there's 22,000 children that die each day due to poverty-related reasons. I feel like I can make a difference in this industry. I can change people's lives. The agricultural industry is working to address the challenges that directly impact these people's lives. And this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. In conclusion, there's five things that I wanna leave with you. Um, and if you take away these five things, I strongly believe you can have a very positive impact on your career and your future. When you think about having it all, what does it mean to you? You have to think differently. Do not allow society and the outside world to prescribe what having it all should be for you as an individual. The second thing, who defines what matters and what I can accomplish? Here's the thing, ladies, you own that. You write your own destiny. Do not let obstacles that other people perceive as hurdles and limitations limit your future and your potential. So what do you do about this? You own it. You act like you own it. And where do you find your confidence to execute on all three points that I just laid out? You find it within yourself from the fact that you deserve everything that you are willing to work for and go after. And where do you go from there? You're early on in career many, or you have some choices to make to think about how do you optimize your career life. You go to a place and an industry where you can potentially make more of a difference than anyone else, anywhere else. The same way that I feel about agriculture, that's how you should feel about your career and where you go and what you do with your potential. If you take these five pieces and you cascade it in separate parts, you can feel good about it. But if you take it together and it's clear, if you define it, if you own it, you can have it all. So with that, I wanna pause there and um, any question is welcome. Any thought that someone has that you want me to, to address separately. Great. Thank you so much, Alzandi. That was a wonderful uh, session and so many uh, insights to, you know, how to move forward as a female in your particular careers. We do have a few questions that have come in just for you. Uh, one of them being about your own personal journey. Um, have you faced any kind of discrimination in terms of treatment at your workplace personally? Um, maybe lack of opportunity or a pay gap, gender pay gap, anything on those lines? Yes, I, I obviously had. Um, and it, it's actually stretching over many years. And I would sort of break it up into two different parts. There's the softer um, part of discrimination. And then there's the hardcore part that's very evident and go across industries. Yeah. And I faced all of them. Whether it's you think about the fact that I'm, I, I started off my career in field-based roles. What does this mean? Um, just give me one second. Yeah. What does this mean? Um, you go out to a cornfield and you interact with farmers. And in a cornfield, there's no restrooms for the men. It's not a big deal. For yeah. females, on the other hand, it is a big deal. And nobody necessarily wanted to discriminate, but it's just not a thought that naturally right. comes to mind when yeah. it's one female and 120 men at the meeting. So there were some of those just physical realities. Mm -hmm. And then there's the softer parts of a definite um, discrimination that was systemic. And let's talk about the pay gap. 
yeah. being the first female in role, there was risk to the business. So what do they do? They start you off on probation. You start off with a lower base. Right. If you advance your career fast, like I did, I, I changed jobs every two years. You never catch up that gap until you reach a point where you can have a very candid conversation with HR and your direct manager to say, I need to understand where I am at from a base salary viewpoint compared to my peers. And if I'm at a disparity, which in my case was the, the situation, um, how do we fix this? And then have a clear plan because many times a company cannot make that big of an adjustment in one step. So you need a structured plan to then close that gap. So that's the one part. The other part that I want to call out, I've made my second job, I had direct um, reports reporting to me. Mm -hmm. And I've made sure since day one that I have a very strategic and transparent process to ensure that I correct base salary disparities in my own reporting team. So that's something that all of us can do that have people reporting to us to ensure that we correct if there's incorrect things that needs to be adjusted. Absolutely. And Elizabeth, uh, I just want to point out for all our viewers uh, who are mainly females for this particular summit, that the transparency uh, that you spoke about while speaking about the pay gap, I think it's so very important to have that conversation with the HR. Right. Sometimes we don't even open up uh, and talk about it to our own peers or our, uh, you know, managers or the HR managers to even have that discrimination, you know, eradicated from the system. We don't have that clear, transparent communication. So thank you for bringing that point up. We have another question for you. As a female leader, what has been the most significant barrier in your career? Um, the most significant barrier that I had. Um, throughout my career was probably convincing internal stakeholders that the fact that you are a female or the only female and the least experience should not feed into how people judge performance. Um, and I alluded to in my talking points earlier on how I approached it is I tried to identify the people around me, my biggest critiques first. Mm -hmm. And how I overcome this viewpoint is I try to identify what is it that they're trying to accomplish? What does success mean to them? And are there specific areas that they're struggling with? And then I will dedicate my time and energy to help them be successful in the areas where they have issues. That way you build a very strong report and relationship and you build a lot of confidence. So someone that's not necessarily supporting you might change completely their view. Um, and that's how I overcome some of the challenges that I faced throughout my career, is by making friends of enemies. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful point to be taken, uh, everybody right here. So I have another question, which is uh, in terms of, you know, the context to India, because uh, being an agricultural major country, India is highly dependent on its farming infrastructure. Women do contribute a significant amount, but lack basic healthcare facilities, which uh, you just mentioned in your, uh, you know, your career as well. So what steps can you, know, you propose to enhance health infrastructure for the female farming community? And how can communication play a role in it? Yeah, this is a great question. And we are actually initiating a project where we try to really understand the females within our customer base, agriculture, there's a lot of female farmers and it's either um, from a farming viewpoint or it's from a labor viewpoint. In many cases in smallholder world, the females play a very big role from a, a labor viewpoint. Yes. And there's a few things that's clear. Many times socially, they're not allowed to access um, training and learning opportunities. For example, if there's a farmer's meeting, the females many times is not allowed in the decision room or in the training room, or if they are allowed, they can't come because then at that time when the guys goes to the farmer meeting, female many times attend to the family needs. Yes. So we have to think differently in how we support and reach out 
and touch these females within our industry. And we're having a deep dive now to figure it out. Now, it's too early for me to give a plan, but there's a few thoughts that I have around it. It has to be an ecosystem. One company or one stakeholder can't make enough of a difference. We have to take hands and build an ecosystem in which we can support and help these females in agriculture. Us at Bayer are in a privileged position in the sense that we do have the agricultural side, but we also have a pharmaceutical business and a consumer health business. So by partnering across these three divisions, we can address a lot of the issues that we're having out there. And I also think we have to be realistic in how we approach them. We have to find females to reach out to females, to open up a clear communication path, and also to create an environment of trust and comfort for the females out there to speak up and share their challenges with us so that we can find ways to support them. And just lastly, I wanna to touch on the communication piece. It's critical that we communicate broadly. Now, if you think about us as a company, we're probably gonna communicate within the scope um, that we can reach people. But there's other ways through partnering on communication that we can go much broader. So I wanna be very clear that the communication is the one factor that will drive success. And usually the stakeholders that can have the hands on impact do not have a, a sophisticated communication channel. So that is something where we can really find a way to collaborate and make a difference. Absolutely, wonderful points there uh, as well, as in the. I just wanted to just reiterate the fact that there has to be like a two-way communication where the females can, you know, bring out their challenges and then we create a path for them and as well as create the compassion and trust with, with the workers as well. Beautiful. I have one last question for you, uh, uh, which is how women role in uh, agriculture saw a change with Bayer's initiative that the work that you have been doing. Yeah, so there's, there's a few things. Technologies that we as a company brings forward mm -hmm. is quite advanced. Mm -hmm. And it's really built and heavily invested in building and developing new technologies to make farmers more successful. But the reality is most of these technologies have been adopted um, by the countries, the governments, the regulatory systems, and the farmers on the Western side of the world. Smallholder farmers is still very much relying on very old school technology, regardless of whether you're thinking about seed and traits, crop protection products that help them to yield more, or the agronomical advice and um, predictable um, tools that we have today to predict before a disease actually hits their crop, how can they manage and steer it proactively? And that's our mission. What we do is we are working with regulatory systems and countries to ensure that we can take these new technologies, our know-how and our wisdom to help these smallholder farmers to be more successful. Wonderful. And because this is uh, a communication PR and communication summit, uh, Elzinda, some parting thoughts for all the people part of this community, how through communication and through PR, uh, we can create an impact women. So I can tell you, you all are specialists in an area where many people struggle. And actually teams that's not successful, most of the time it's because of lack of good, effective, clear, crisp communication. So I think you have a much bigger role to play, regardless of which industry you look at, whether you look at nonprofits or corporate companies, by effective communication, we can solve a lot of the problems in the world. So for those of you that have a passion and wanna get involved in areas that goes beyond just your day job and your main responsibility, I truly believe the sky is the limit. Wow, thank you so much, Elzandi. It was wonderful to have you on this platform and have your insights shared with the wider audience. Thank you so much once again for being part of it. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Elzandi. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, you can put it out in the Q&A box or in the chat box, comment box on whichever platform you're watching us on. We'd love to hear from all of you. Also, the buzz is on on Twitter. So use the hashtag E4M 
PR Women Achievers, E4M PR Women, E4M Women Achievers. Go ahead and uh, tell us which were your key highlights. It was wonderful having Elzandi here. And we're moving forward to our next keynote session, bringing in another stalwart coming forward for all of you, Miss Lucy Harvey, Managing Director, Matia Hill and Knowlton Strategies. Lucy has been with uh, Hill and Knowlton from 2010. She has donned several hats during her stints, and today she will be talking to us about allyship, be the change you want to see. I'm sure this is going to be super interesting, and I'm really happy to bring Lucy here. Very warm welcome. Thank you so much, Katty. Thank you. And Alzandi, I thought that was amazing. Um, really, really fascinating half hour. Hopefully, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the other side of that as well, and what we can do for other people um, as well alongside us. Um, so thank you, Karen. Thank you, Katty. Thank you, everybody on the call. Um, I'm really honoured to be here and, and be involved. Um, just to introduce myself quickly, um, I'm Lucy Harvey. I'm one of the managing directors for HK Strategies in the Middle East, Turkey, India and Africa. It's always a bit of a mouthful, uh, but importantly for us, that includes India um, as part of the remit I'm lucky enough to be involved with as well. So I get to work with Abhishek and our amazing team at HK India on the ground here. I've been working out of uh, h &K based out of Dubai for 11 years now. Um, and previously before that, I was working in London as well. Um, I'm so sorry I can't be there in person. Um, I've been lucky enough to attend some other conferences in India and they're always exciting, inspiring and great fun. There's nothing, um, there's nothing quite like uh, exchanging ideas, chatting, creating some bonds over tea, over a drink, occasionally over a dance at some of the events I've been to as well. Um, I really hope for all our sakes, um, for us as individuals, for our families, that we can all be together soon at the next one as well. Um, so sending my love to everybody and I hope you're keeping safe. Um, so today I really wanted to talk about how we can back the people next to us. Um, I'm coming up to 20 years um, in PR and communications. Um, and a subject that is really, really close to my heart is how do we fulfill the potential of everyone in the industry at every step in their journey? It doesn't mean everybody's going to become a CEO, but how do we all get the opportunity to fulfill our personal potential? Um, and to do that, we need to look at both the challenges and the opportunities for different groups for everyone. And I know that as a woman, I can help other women succeed with my experiences. So I want to talk about allyship sisterhood, feminism perhaps, I apologize for the term sometimes. Uh, some people don't feel comfortable with some of those terms. We should feel comfortable with them, but even if you don't like the buzzwords, how about just being a kind, respectful person, helping your neighbor? Whatever you call it, I really deeply believe in the spirit of supporting those next to you. Um, and I think Elzandi touched on this as well herself. It's not just to expand the tent, invite a few more people in. It's about tearing down the walls of that. There's room for all of us and more to succeed. Um, so hopefully I can leave you with a few thought starters um, and a way that we can all be the next step um, in the change we want to see um, in our workplace. And I'm delighted to field any questions at the end. So firstly, what does it mean to be an ally? When do we need to be an ally? When do we need an ally? Um, every stage in our career comes with many, many different challenges. There's an intersection of our personal challenges and expectations, society, cultural, professional. Um, whether we're a young executive coming into our first jobs um, at 20, 22, 25, the middle point in our career when we may also be wrestling with families, um, senior leadership positions, or just having had longer in, the, in our careers, and those career changes along the way that we bounce between. So I would encourage people to think about what expectations you're managing at this point in time. What do you find the most challenging to live up to? What weighs on you? What's actually a help for you? Um, because at every stage in that journey, what would it feel like to know that the woman next to you has your back? That she wants you to succeed. And I think that's so important. Um, it's key to creating inclusive workplaces, feeling like someone else cares. Just saying that actually can feel like a big thing because there are many workplaces where that just isn't the case. Um, we are expected to be incredibly competitive. We're expected to be ambitious just for ourselves. 
I would continue to challenge all of us to be ambitious for yourself and the woman next to you. Um, I started my career, um, I would almost say nervously. Um, I had a couple of experiences in workplaces where it was tough. It wasn't necessarily always very friendly, but I had some really great senior leadership there who saw that I had potential. They gave me confidence. They weren't actually necessarily women. Often they weren't, but often they were from other minority groups who were struggling perhaps in their own ways as well. But they took the time out to celebrate something I'd done, to notice when I needed a little bit of advice, a little bit of support, sometimes just make me a cup of tea on a bad day. But I don't forget the impact those people have. They're really inspiring to me. Um, this, I know they are still there if I reached out. And these are some people I haven't spoken to in 15 years. I know also that they must have had similar support in their lives to have realized how important that is. Um, their panel discussion earlier mentioned the Harvest Business Review case, which I thought was so interesting, that women consider themselves less confident, they rate themselves as less confident than men up until they're around 40, early 40s. Um, they also rate themselves lower as leaders up until that stage as well. I hope as I turn 40, this means that, um, that, I've got, that um, my confidence is suddenly going to change because I can completely understand that. But yeah, interestingly, when judged by their peers and their managers, women are generally considered in 84% of leadership uh, requirements to be stronger than men. Now, these are all averages. But I think what it does tell us is that women do need extra, extra reminders. They do need some extra encouragement now and again. A reminder they can succeed, a reminder that they can climb the ladder so that you can push yourself to do exactly what Elzandi was talking about, taking that next step putting yourself forward, maybe you're doubting yourself that little bit, knowing that you have those skill sets and somebody's got your back. Those first signs of leadership, those first signs of talent need to be encouraged. That might be for you as a boss, and many people on this call would be leaders of teams. You should take that responsibility incredibly seriously as a line manager, as a boss, as a CEO. But don't underestimate the power it has to reach out to the person next to you and say, great job so smart give someone a compliment not just on their hair or their dress that day which is fantastic and we all need that every now and again as well but respect people for the amazing brain power they are bringing to the table respect people for the impact they have made on the client or the challenge or the opportunity i think also an important part of um, allyship and something everybody can show men or women and there are many men on this call as well is when people come back from maternity leave. Um, I have learned a lot. I have a lot to learn about being a working mother. Um, I now have three children under six, uh, so wish me luck. Um, but I really have learned that that is a time when you can show support to the people coming back in. And it's something I take very, very seriously at work. Recognize that people feel vulnerable when they come back. You don't know what your new role is gonna be and your role will always have evolved some way or another. How do I reclaim parts of that role? How do I carve out a new role? Can I even manage this? Um, I have a six month old baby. I'm just three weeks back into work again. And it's really hard. I'm lucky to have people around me who recognize that and say, hey, it's okay, uh, well done. Whether it's my husband, uh, friends back home on, on WhatsApp and, and a few people in the office who really make the effort to do that, that you feel vulnerable. Um, just to be clear, that's not about wrapping people in cotton wool when they come back from maternity leave. Absolutely not. Do not shield me from a tough meeting. Um, I want the tough challenges because I am ambitious. I want to keep growing. But also be the person who says, it's great to have you back. Be the person who checks in, see how it's going. Offer me my full rollback, my full breadth of opportunity, because I want to take it recognizing that many, many truths can live alongside each other, I think is really, really important here. I can have huge ambition, but I can also have huge guilt. I can also have intense vulnerability all at the same time. Um, and that is the nature of being human. So I kind of sum allyship up in a way as look left, look right. Any level um, in any business can be competitive with men, with other women. But part of building a culture of allyship requires a little bit of opening up, 
a little bit of honesty and setting an example, particularly for the people in this call who are seen to be leaders, not just in terms of the obvious business hierarchy, um, but also maybe you're quite a influential person in your office. It is hard <laughs> and say, no, I'm busy. I need to stay in my lane. Um, I don't want to butt in. This is their business. Absolutely. But it works for everybody as well. You set one example of support every day, one little example of support. You're starting to create a culture of support, ultimately creates a safe working space. And a safe working space means better work. It means more fulfilling work. It means a happier day, a more successful business for everybody. It's a win-win taking those little steps. And ultimately, the more people, the more women who are stepping up another level, who get the confidence to push themselves to the next promotion, normalize it for the women next to them and behind them. And potentially our daughters coming 20, 30 years behind us as well. Really act out the change you want to see, be the first step. And again, think about, is that culture of allyship live in your office, in your organization, in your meetings? How do you support that? And there are many, many ways we can do it. Um, you may be thinking, I do this already. What could I do more? As I say, the first thing for me is look left, look right. Can you offer someone that encouragement? Can you spot something they're struggling with? Can you offer them a tool? Can you share some experience? If someone asks you how you are, that is often a sign that they want to connect. So be honest, take a time out to answer honestly, share something, because it's possible they wanna share something back with you um, as well. Formal and informal mentoring at work is really important. We have some fantastic global mentoring schemes at HK, um, connecting people from around the world. We have exchange schemes, and I'm really proud to be part of some of those. Whether or not you do that within your workplace, whether or not you do that external through an industry body, through people you worked with in past roles, do take the opportunities to be a mentor and seek a mentor, particularly a reverse mentor, which I think is a really interesting area and something I want to work on at the moment, so I can capture some learnings as well. Um, but allyship during COVID is tough. Some of those things I've talked about, it's easy to sit at my desk right now, my backdrop screen, um, uh, look, to look left and right, and I'm not looking at a colleague. So how does that work? And there is a danger with the working from home. I think as women, particularly, it's given us amazing opportunities. Taking out the commute can release more time. We can do more things. There's the danger. Flexi working and remote working have in some ways brought us all closer. They've given us opportunities, but there are dangers. And I think the burden for women and having spoken to colleagues um, and friends across India, it's particularly true. The burden has only increased. This is across the world. There are campaigns about this across the world. Do not let the situation with COVID, even as we come out of a pandemic um, on the other side, do not let that set back the progress of women. We have too many responsibilities and we can often get dragged into too many caregiving responsibilities. Um, and suddenly the careers we've worked so hard for as maybe slightly separate from our home lives can all get blurred in and become the thing at the bottom of the pile. I do worry about that, um, that this, as we become more comfortable with flexibility, it could become an excuse for either exclusion because you're not given the opportunities, you're not there in front of people or potentially just overwork as we try and fit in more and more hours of work and caregiving into the day. So flexible working does not mean always working. Hybrid working does not mean work anywhere, everywhere. Um, create the boundaries um, and let's keep up that casual day-to-day -day connections with people, whether it's checking in, giving someone a call, just tell it, asking someone how they are um, and do ask up, down, sideways as well. Um, in our India team, um, our practices are really actually led by a super strong group of women who are absolutely fantastic at their jobs. They're on the senior management team. They make decisions. Um, and we're constantly looking for ways to keep supporting those women. Um, for uh, one of the team who has a young child during their lunchtime management meeting, um, they always take a half hour out at the time when she needs to go and sit with her little boy and make sure he gets his lunch. That's really important. Um, and those are the moments you can do to show the flexibility. Don't let that become then creep into every single part of the day as well. Um, and I guess finally, um, allyship is also about looking internally. 
be your own best ally. Um, as we are investing effort in others around us, um, and just to be clear, investing effort, love, empathy is not a female thing. Men don't get, get off the hook on that. It's for everybody to invest that time in culture, uh, a culture of allyship. We need to make sure we are still looking after ourselves. Um, we need to take that first step. Um, and every little thing counts. Um, I personally have a thing where every morning I see my husband go downstairs and he takes two or three minutes to make sure he has a big glass of water, he has a small juice, and he takes his vitamins. In my head, sometimes I'm like, how can he be so selfish? How can he take that time? It's not, he's just carving out two or three minutes to do something to set him up for the day. And I do think many, many women, and this applies to all stages, not just mothers, easily forget those pieces. Look after yourself. But then the second part of self-care is care for your own career. I think this does lead on from what Elzandi was talking about. Respect your career. Give it the time it deserves. We're going to be in these jobs for 40, 50 years. Um, as I am just turned 40, probably halfway through where I need to be. I've got a long way to go and the industry is going to keep changing um, in incredibly exciting ways. And I'm incredibly excited to see that happen. But if I don't invest in my own education, my own learning, learning from those around me, taking the extra training course, listening into that. Um, I, I risk becoming irrelevant and I'm not setting a good example to women around me about how they can keep growing. Ultimately, our industry is dominated by women. This is not really an issue um, of getting people through the front door into our industry. The issue is about making sure people keep on pushing up, taking senior leadership positions, taking on CEO roles, being brave, taking those steps. That change can seem scary. I just don't believe it is. I believe it's about the confidence we have to grow in ourselves. It's about the confidence we have for others. We need to make sure we're creating the right opportunities and environment for young women coming in at all those steps. We need to be ambitious for ourselves. We need to be ambitious for the women next to us today and tomorrow. Um, thank you for your time. Um, I'd love to take any questions or comments. Um, Kathy, if anybody would like to, to share anything. Absolutely. We have a few questions, Lucy, that's coming for you. And uh, I just want to start with the first one, which says, in course of your journey, uh, what key changes you saw with respect to women empowerment globally, especially when we are witnessing perception change in gender neutrality and gender inclusion? Um. I suppose I've been in the business for 20 years. Um, probably one of the most obvious things I personally remember is coming out of university. Um, I was lucky enough to go to a prestigious university in the UK. Um, and I remember sitting um, in the library and this was a time when we didn't all have laptops. There were computers lined up down the side of the library. I apologize to everyone, it seems absolutely insane. Um, and there were so many men, young men, sitting there filling in their applications to be bankers, um, lawyers, go into the city, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember at that time really feeling like that was something for men. It's not entirely true. There were women going into it as well, but the huge majority of those people, and I really believe that came from conditioning from their schools, potentially from their parents, that those are the roles they would go into. And I do feel that potentially as women at that time, we were slightly more left to work it out. There could be an expectation to go into something slightly softer. It would have been slightly harder for me to go into those roles. Now, actually, I think I found a career that I love and I'm good at and I get to balance all the different parts of my personality. But I do feel at the time we weren't necessarily given the, the openness around that. And I think probably at the time, 20 years ago, the PR and comms industry was seen as a very soft skill. I was always passionate about brand building. I was always really passionate about media and how those all come together. So in the, in the end, I kind of saw that opportunity, um, but it was seen as a soft skill. It wasn't seen as respected. I do think over the last 10, 15, 20 years, as particularly as social media becomes so pervasive in everything we do, you have to understand that. So big companies now see the need for that. And I think for women, who've been grown up, grown up in that, as long as we've kept learning, we now have an amazing opportunity to sit at the boardroom table in new ways. We just have to be continuing to push ourselves and saying, I can sit alongside that lawyer. 
I can sit alongside the management consultant who 20 years ago was sitting in a room tapping out that application form when I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, but it's needed and we need to have the communication story at the boardroom table. Absolutely. Um, another question says a lot has been spoken about female empowerment and inclusion and pay gap as well, but we somewhere lack in knowledge, the value, this gap that still persists being a uh, creative naturally entails ensuring higher freedom of expression and celebrating the nuances of diversity. What are your thoughts on the same? Um, there's a lot there, right? So that's a lot, yeah. quite a lot to think about. But um, for me, I think sometimes, I think someone spoke about this in the panel. You don't have to put the fact that you're a woman just to one side, you know? Like, it's great and it brings many parts of my personality of who I am as a mother, etc. But sometimes I can just put that to one side and think of myself as somebody who is good at being creative, who's good at problem solving, who's good at bringing up the table. And I would hope that in our offices, we are able to do that. We bring together diverse groups. We bring together people from different nationalities, from different genders, uh, with different life stories and bring them together and create the space for those people to create, create the space for that. Our industry is a quite unique in its needs. In a modern world, we are asking for a huge array from left brain to right brain. Yeah. We want people to be amazing at data analytics, be able to dig into brand watch and programs and be able to pull all this smart data. Then I want that person to analyze that data and bring that together, starting to get in the middle and give me a trend. I'd also like that person to give me a creative platform and a full creative execution of how that's going to work. We ask a huge amount from people. It's really important our industry gives people space to explore where they sit on that spectrum and then they give, get space to learn and develop within that opportunity. Absolutely. Um, now, since you spend like most of your time in the PR industry and move through ranks, what has been your experience in seeing the industry moving forward from different times? Um, I think the biggest piece for me probably is that really growing the communications mix. Um, it used to be when somebody employed a PR agency or a communications agency, we got a tiny little piece of the pie. Um, yeah which actually when you're learning your trade, isn't too bad because you can focus and become an expert at the media relations, the creative stunts that will lead to media relations. Um, 15, 20 years ago, when I was kind of first working in London um, at a big creative communications agency, that's where we were. Mm -hmm. But over the course of five, 10, now 15 years, that has absolutely expanded exponentially. And that to me is that biggest change and challenge now. And I do absolutely feel for people coming into the industry, it's a huge opportunity, but with that opportunity comes a challenge of learning a lot, being yeah. open to so much. Um, and I would really recommend people to find the areas of passion, find the areas they're interested in. You need to bring all your understanding up to a certain level, but then find the areas where you're gonna push it to the 10 out of 10. Where are you going to be the expert that you're going to be incredibly passionate about? Whether that's data, whether your mind kind of moves more that way, whether or not it's creative solutions, whether or not actually you find that you're in communications, but then start looking at brand or other areas. It's now an area where you can do that. You have to increase your understanding to a certain level to become a trusted advisor to your clients and then bring those extra sparks of your passion and your talent to the table. Absolutely. Uh, we have another question which says, in leadership, uh, key aspects in comparison with male and female role play. Mm -hmm. Is there like kind of a comparison that you would make or in leadership people make? I honestly think there are so many different sorts of leaders. And I don't think you can say male are more like this or female are more like this. Um, I don't think that's true in any part of our lives. And it's absolutely true in leadership. I know people try to make sweeping generalizations of women are more like this, men are more like this. That's partly social conditioning, but actually it's just not true. Um, I think you have to embrace and try and spend the time to understand the type of leader you are, whether that's when you're leading a team, whether it's when you're leading a project, you bring different skills to the table um, and recognizing that and being really proud of that and continuing to work on it. But to, um, to Zandi's point, be aware of your weak points. You have to be aware of them. You have to work on them but yeah. also here are the things you're great at because the fact is you've got to get famous for certain things. Um, yeah. And your leadership style is one of those. I would definitely say though, 
you need to, and no one has any excuse not to have a leadership style that is inclusive and diverse and supportive of all people and opportunities. That's not a nice to have now. That is an absolute essential in any leadership style that anyone, male, female, wherever they come from, everyone needs to be working on that. Absolutely. And because this is a Women Achievers a Summit, we have this question for you. Uh, who are the women leaders whose work inspires you? Are there any particular um, ones that you uh, kind of gain inspiration from? That's such a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, there's been a few people, as you can imagine, many people over the years who've inspired me. Um, I would say we are very, very lucky to have um, a set of women in senior leadership teams in H&K that really inspire me. That doesn't, I mean, we are actually lucky enough to have a female CEO um, who has come from a really diverse background and is really exciting. So we have our CEO there who's a great inspiration to us. But I also see women just on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, a, coll a colleague of mine literally inspires me every single day by her commitment to learning. She's always signing up for another course. I have a junior uh, on my team um, who is every single day signing up to something new and telling me something new. And those, to be honest, are the leaders that I'm talking to all the time. And yeah. they remind me to push myself on. So although there are senior people in the organization who kind of give me the big picture, it's mm -hmm. actually the day-to-day -day inspiration that I think sometimes works better than anything else. Absolutely. And because we, uh, your topic was about allyship and sisterhood and, uh, you know, just building that community. Would you like to give some parting thoughts for the women achievers here on uh, how to build that community, how mentoring or being a mentee can, you know, become like a big thing for the industry to move forward? Yeah, um, I mean, I think I'd say again, the, the idea of the idea of ambition, be ambitious for yourself, be ambitious for the person next to you and talk to the person next to you about what they want to do, about where they're going and support that ambition and back them and tell them that they're great. Um, I would absolutely just reinforce that doesn't need to be huge steps. Change doesn't need to be everything at once. If everybody is doing something extra to support the person next to them every day, that is going to move us all on. And that will absolutely change a culture in an office incredibly quickly. If you have that sense of you have that person's back. And I know I feel excited about the idea of a being in an office where that is the case for everybody. And I hope everyone would agree with that as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lucy, for your time, for sharing these insights with us and being on this platform. Right. Thank you. Thank once you, everybody. Again. Have a really great day. We're taking a quick break here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just about 30 minutes and we'll be back right at 1.30 p.m. Till then, let's sink in all the insights and knowledge that has been shared till now from all our speakers. Go ahead and tell us your key highlights from the session so far, tweeting to us using the hashtag E4M Women Achievers, E4M Women Achievers Summit. Go tell us in the comment box, in the chat box, what have you loved uh, the most till now. And we'll be back after this uh, short break with another keynote session by Ms. Manmeet Sandhu, head of HR Phone Pay. Till then, we'll see you back. We'll be back right after this break. Thank you. The second edition of Exchange for Media, PR and Corporate Communication, Women Achievers Summit and Awards 2021. Presented by Ad Factors PR. Powered by Standard Chartered Bank, Hero Motocorp, PhonePay, Hill and Knowlton Strategies, Gold Partner, Toot Consulting. The Summit and Awards are the celebration of the contribution of women and their relentless pursuit of excellence in the field of public relations and communications. The second edition of the awards identifies, acknowledges and felicitates those women leaders who are shaping the industry through their incredible work. Through this initiative, we also applaud the agencies and corporates who are setting remarkable examples by encouraging gender diversity in their work culture. This year's jury panel was headed by Dr. Anurag Batra, Chairman and Editor-in-Chief, BW Business World and Exchange for Media. Ms. Nidhi Hola, Microsoft. 
मिस्टर पार्थ घोष सैमसंग मिस रामा पॉल एबीपी मिस्टर संजीव हांडा मारुति मिस्टर सुभायु मिश्रा स्टैंडर्ड चार्टर्ड बैंक मिस जसरीता धीर अंतारा मिस्टर अतुल शर्मा रडफिन मिस पल्लवी सिंह सीनियर बिजनेस एडवाइजर मिस्टर अभिषेक गुलियानी हिल एंड नोल्टन स्ट्रैटेजीज मिस रुचिरा जेटली एच एम डी मिस कविता जगतियानी पेटेलाइट मिस पराची मोहपात्रा डॉक्टर रेडीज एक्सचेंज फॉर मीडिया एंड द ज्यूरी कंग्रेचुलेट्स ऑल द विनर my name is pallavi and i'm glad that i was part of exchange for media pr and communication women achievers award uh it was amazing to be part of uh, you know this jury because i had industry peers who were also part of this jury um and i i think for me it was most important to look at the entries which came in and a lot of efforts everybody's put in it's amazing uh, for all the women professionals who've put in so much effort to fill in the entries so everybody i think in in my view is a winner for taking that effort amazing shot uh for me the important there were two important criteria to judge the entries one is apart from the work uh, which is your domain how have you uh, kind of uh, uh, you know shown uh, or paved the path for the organization's growth overall uh, and how is it how your role has led uh, to overall growth of the business uh, in 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 the role of what you've done whether it is to do with pr communication working with different peers and organizations uh, to get your um company up there in the list and second most important thing for me was how have you developed yourself as an individual because that is the key as a professional how are you changing and how are you developing um that was the second one and i think um if you look at for women achievers um, we've come a long way to what it used to be a decade back organizations are more receptive receptive for women now um uh, especially for whether it's senior positions or for that matter even if i were to say some interesting strategy work but we still have a long way to go i mean i'm only talking about maybe 0.5% or lesser uh of what has happened till now I think organizations have to still invest a lot of time and not just do a tick box of hiring women and giving them a platform uh, but it's also very critical to um help them um and they should help themselves as well and um, yeah so and the last one i would just say um i just want to say that everybody during this time has done amazing work what i read through all the you know detailed notes what exchange for media has put out and it was very very nicely done simple to evaluate and it's a great platform i think for me it's a great platform exchange for media anything to know about marketing advertising uh, any news uh, any new thing which is coming into the market from an industry perspective so yeah i wish them and i wish all the women who've uh, come in the entry best of luck you guys are winners any which ways and be safe take care um and let's really make this community proud i'm so glad i was part of it Thank you so much. Let me start by congratulating Exchange for Media for organizing an event that celebrates power of women in the communications industry. At Edge and Key Strategies, we are very proud to partner for the second edition of E4M PR and Corporate Communications Women Achievers Award. The experience during the jury meet was very rewarding. an exchange of ideas very thought provoking it was a delight to be a part of an esteemed jury panel that cut across industries the entries this year for the second edition of e4m pr and corporate communications award were not only exemplifying clarity of thought but also showcased innovation leadership and a remarkable zeal towards driving and contributing to the future of communications in india the entire process was very transparent and the criteria very holistic however for me it was important to see leadership skills 
and the future and contribution to the industry. All the stories this time were very authentic. Women today are leading organizations or actively contributing to the success of an organization and are really driving us into the future. And platforms like Exchange for Media, Women Achievers Award, recognize and celebrate the contribution made by women. very good experience um, when this invite had come one was wondering that uh, looking at the number of people how are we going to make it uh, happen uh, because so many heads and so many opinions um, also the nominations ran into about 140 which had come down to a short list of about long list of about uh, 80 and from a long list we had to bring it down to a short list of let's say uh, about 50 odd so one thought this is going to be a daunting task, but uh, full marks to the Exchange for Media team, the planning team. Uh, they meticulously planned it out in terms of breakout rooms, in terms of uh, you know breaking us into two, three different groups, and then allocating about uh, you know twenty-one odd entries to each one of the you know breakout groups to do. Um, so I think my experience has been very good. It was meticulously planned, well thought out. Um, and uh, the experience of meeting other jurors uh, has also been uh, quite enriching. If I talk about the first, the quantum, then I, I, I am given to understand that 140 nominations were received, out of which the Exchange for Media team brought it down to about a long list of 80. From a long list of 80, our task was to bring it down to a short list of about 40 to 50. Uh, that tells you about the quantum, and uh, which means that this is this continues to be a very popular uh, summit and award. As far as the quality is concerned, um, I can speak for the entries which were allocated allocated to me, uh, and the quality was quite good. The quality was very good, in fact, I would say, because um, there were a couple of entries that I was. Um, confused about and I had to uh, go over them at least thrice to say where, where do I put them uh, and, and when you have this problem of plenty, um, this problem of plenty happens when there is good quality across the board. That's as far as the quality, the quantum and the quality of entries is concerned. The two main criteria that I was looking at is one, uh, how, how honest the portrayal has come of the content that uh, people have put together because um, oftentimes what happens and especially with communicators uh, one sees that there's a lot of jargon thrown in there's a lot of content which is written so basically there's a lot of English uh, but when you distill it down there's very little substance that you're left with it happens oftentimes uh, this didn't happen uh, you know in too many entries that I saw uh, you know that, that I judged so for me, one criteria was that how honestly, uh, how, how genuinely, how authentic the um, sort of entry comes across as being the profile. That was one criteria. The second criteria was uh, that giving a balance to not just the accomplishments that have been done so far, uh, what has been accomplished so far, but also about the future potential, because a lot of categories were emerging leaders, emerging leader in public relations, emerging leader in Marcom or in Copcom, etc. So uh, future potential is also uh, a balance between what you've accomplished and what your future potential is. These were two main criteria that I had put to test while uh, a judge of these categories. It's a mixed bag, if I would say. Um, mixed bag in the sense because when it comes to women leadership, to me it seems more of a two steps forward two and a half steps backward kind of a story. Uh, I've been around now for 20 years and it's, it's, these are these quests and troughs that women leadership goes through. There is a time when you see a whole lot of global leaders and therefore a lot of Indian leaders in BFSI, in ITS, in some other sectors. Um, and at the same time, equal number of industries you see where at a base level, at an entry level, at a junior to junior level, there are huge employers of women uh, but more often than not, the top is still represented by men. Take the example of PR um, as a function, public relations uh, as a function. So public relations as a function, 
um, has a whole lot of women uh, who enter the ranks, you know, so at the entry rank, at, at, at the entry rank, at the ranks, which is junior to mid management. Uh, but most of these public relation firms that you can think of um, are headed by men. So therefore, like I said, it's, it's a mixed bag. Um, but one, I think what one has to do is to keep forging the head, the agenda. Um, and for that, uh, women empowering women uh, is going to be an important factor in, in ensuring that how far we go, how far the tra trajectory goes, because women have to empower women. And when we reach wherever we reach in life, uh, it's important that we lend a hand uh, to other women who are down the rank and bring them up um, rather than just reaching there and shutting the door behind us. I, I think it plays a pivotal role. It plays a pivotal role because, um, see, what what does this platform achieve? Let's break it down. Let's small things, but small things um, add up to make big things. Uh, first of all, um, today in the managing team, in, in the operations team, in the managing team, one sees a whole lot of women around, right? And 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 at all uh, echelons of power, from uh, lower to middle to senior in the team, which is there at e forum. So in terms of women representation. Um, it's a good, it's a good uh, platform, number one. Number two, look at the uh, number of women which are there on the jury. So if you see there's a very, very uh, healthy mix, there's a very good representation of women on the jury. Uh, so therefore, you again give representation and exposure to women leaders uh, who are in um, the who are in different organizations. That's what it does. That's the second thing that it brings to the fore. The third thing, obviously, is that it's um, it is encouraging women uh, to say that uh, your work is important. Uh, you hold up half the sky, uh, and uh, you need you know you contribute so much to the GDP. Um, this can't be work that is just going in a big black box that nobody gets to talk about. Uh, you need recognition. Uh, you need a reward, and here is a platform which will give you uh, recognition and reward at a national level. Uh, so that's what it does for uh, young upcoming women. And I think this encouragement will go a long way uh, in them uh, reaching up to the, uh, you know, the top. So that's the third thing that this platform does. The fourth thing is also honor organizations which are headed by women or which um, give a lot of support to women to reach the top, which have good representation of women, which uh, are doing a lot in terms of um, the diversity and inclusion agenda. Uh, so celebrating those organizations, this is what this forum is doing from their own internal organization to a jury level, to a participant level, to organization level, um, all encompassing. And I, th I, I would hope that more uh, media outlets, more media portals and organizations follow suit because I'm sure this is one area where E4M would like others, um, like to say, uh, you know, imitation is the best form of flattery. Uh, I don't think that you'll mind being flattered in this particular aspect. All the best. It's a pleasure to be here as the jury member for E4M Women Achiever Awards. Um, I think considering the fact that 70% uh, of the workforce in this industry happens to be women, I think it is high time that we recognize that. And I think it's a brilliant initiative by E4M to make sure that women who are leaders of, in this space are actually given their due. So very happy to be a part of this great initiative. Um, it, I think I went through a, quite a few entries and what I found the most interesting was that it was not only around communications, but also around categories like entrepreneur of the year, emerging leader in uh, corporate communications, corporate communicator of the year, uh, mentor of the year in Copcom, best organization for uh, women empowerment. I think there were a plethora of categories. And what I found the most heartening was that, uh, you know, it's not only organizations and people, but uh, uh, there were a lot of interesting stories that people had to tell. 
people had painstakingly put in a lot of effort uh, in these entries and i was very very uh, you know very happy to see that uh, some of these entries are really really uh, you know just out of their league and uh, completely showcases the kind of innovation the kind of uh, great work that we are seeing in this industry especially by women um i think i was definitely pleased to see uh, some great storytelling some great um, uh, ways to capture the uh, the outcome that you know uh, the candidates had put in their categories i think and quite rightly so their entries stood out from the rest of the uh, people um i am looking forward uh, i think we have a meet right now and i'm looking forward to see uh people who emerge uh, winners out of uh, this hotly contested uh, uh, award category and i'm looking forward uh, to making sure that uh, the best uh, person win congratulations to all of you i think uh, i always prefer judging you know in person where you get to interact with the uh, candidates you get to interact with fellow jury but yes uh, in the given pandemic situation i think what was arranged and the way the jury uh, was judging was very very uh, high quality uh, the jury spent judicious time on each entry going through the details of the candidates that submitted and i really appreciate being part of such a jury see i think the uh, number of quantities uh, oh, sorry the number of entries in terms of uh, total entries i think exceeded 180 is what i've informed uh, we finally you know after going through the second round the juries went through nearly about 82 entries together uh, so yes the entries are there uh, they're quite a bit in volume and number i think but the most important criteria for any entries that we were judging was to see how the correspondents have told about them uh, how the respondents have written about their achievements have written about the future plans that they have in this field we are to your query about the entries this time i think uh, there were a total of 150 plus entries received uh, the jury went through all of them in fact in the final jury round we judged around 81 entries so that speaks volume about the quality of entries that we have received because normally in the final list the list is slightly pruned down it's very small but this time we had a tough time going through all the entries uh, you know each one is a winner in its own criteria uh, participants who have participated trust me are winners in their own rights the whole fact that you're part of this event itself is commendable and the fact Uh, you know, as a jury, uh, as a jury member, I think the key things that uh, one is looking in all the entries that you're going through are a brief detailing about the person who's filling the entry, their key achievements, what they have done, and most importantly, what are the plans for the future. I think that speaks volumes about uh, you know what you're doing and what you propose to do as you move ahead in this field. Tuition is the name of the game today. but i'm surprised that it had to be given a name first of all i think as a society we are all equal uh today everyone has a right to grow and excel in whatever they do i'm really really delighted to see uh you know many of my friends many of my uh, colleagues heading organizations as women you know there's a colleague of mine who's heading pfizer and she's right way up on the top and 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 you feel proud about the fact it it gives you a lot of happiness to see women excelling in whatever fields they are in today and in pr and corporate communications i think it's a field really governed by them you know i am new to this field and i i have no qualms in saying that i've learned from the best in this field today and they were all women i think e4m uh, i think value is separate i think it's a platform that's giving so much of visibility to so much of good work that is happening and a platform that has been consistent over the years recognizing women for their achievements it's afreen and i really salute e4m 
for their contributions in this part. Thank you. Hey, I was thinking about taking a scooter, right? Who did you take? Hot pink or baby pink? What do you want to think about girls? Wow, no pleasure. Right? Okay. First, I thought about power. No, don't think about it. Then, what did you think about it? What did you think about it? Mileage. Let's go. Okay. Let's go. Then, I thought about power too. And ratio. Boys are the dialogue. Now, I forgot to think about pink. Now, do you know what I'm thinking? What are you thinking? Why should boys have all the fun? Bold new style, zippy ride, but very easy handling. New hero, Pleasure Plus. Every time when you just listen to yourself, what will people say me nahi padti ho? Tab har baar manati ho tum azadi. हर बार जब नहीं देखती तुम घड़ी की सुई जब हर बात को नहीं कहती तुम सही हर बार जब तोड़ती हो ग्लास सीलिंग जब खुल के एक्सप्रेस करती हो फीलिंग तब हर बार मनाती हो तुम आजादी हर बार जब लगाती हो कमेंट्स पे ब्रे जब करती हो अपने करियर को एक्सेलरेट और हर बार जब तुम बेफिक्र बिंदास सड़कों पे निकलती हो तब हर बार मनाती हो तुम आजादी जस्ट फोन पे वी बिलीव दैट एवरी कॉर्पोरेशन एंड ब्रांड हैज अ पब्लिक एंड टुडेज पब्लिक इज मोर पावरफुल देन एवर बिफोर they have the power to topple CEOs, reshape strategy, influence government policy, kill products and create unicorns. They demand truth, transparency and the highest behavioural standards. We are embracing change, constantly innovating the way our clients and the public communicate, whatever the sector and whatever the challenge. Our client obsession means constantly evolving new products and services. We are innovating the future of public relations. Our belief is that brands with a clear, authentic purpose and performance strategies aligned to business objectives are most likely to succeed. We use strategy, creativity and innovation, driven by data and analytics, to put your purpose and performance at the heart of all communications. Together, purpose and performance drive audience preference. We call this approach 3P Communications. Hill and Knowlton Strategies, always in beta. Exchange for Media, a name synonymous with the latest news about the advertising industry in India. The Exchange for Media Group, set up in 2000, has the most credible media platforms covering the entire advertising, media and marketing domain with its highly acclaimed digital, print and on-ground assets. The group's flagship news portal exchangeformedia.com reaches over 6 lakh subscribers who are the first to receive breaking news in the industry. The buzzing website not only covers the news but goes beyond the obvious to bring in a fresh point of view. Impact, the weekly news magazine from the group, is the most widely read business magazine in the advertising trade with in-depth analysis and news-based features providing perspective to key happenings in the industry. The monthly Pitch magazine provides a ringside view of events unfolding in the marketing landscape along with media and advertising. Another monthly magazine, Realty Plus is a market leader in reportage on the real estate industry. Today, Exchange for Media is not only a leading publisher in the domain but owns the IP of more than 50 events spread across Mumbai, 
Delhi and Bangalore making it a powerhouse of information and knowledge sharing. Exchange for Media has curated and launched some of the most successful IPs across marketing, digital, TV, print, radio, mobile, OOH and PR. The Impact Person of the Year Exchange for Media Conclave Indian Digital Marketing Awards Tech Munch Pitch CMO Summit India Marketing Awards Primetime Awards Indian Content Marketing Awards Golden Mics NBAR are some of the group's top-notch events in addition to niche, bespoke events and roundtables curated especially for discerning clients. Exchange for Media events attract stalwarts as speakers along with a loyal audience comprising of leaders, trendsetters and opinion makers. They are the perfect networking platform for the entire media and advertising industry. No wonder Exchange for Media group publications and events have high credibility and reach and are the destination of choice for agency, brand and media professionals across the industry. Exchange for Media BW Business World presents a rich legacy of curated events that enable conversations on policy issues in India. Because of the state of our cities, we have no option but to build smart and resilient cities. Digital India is more for the poor, underprivileged and the deprived. Covering a range of topics, BW Business World events look to create a strong narrative around smart cities, digital India, healthcare, Swachh Bharat, human resource issues, education, banking and finance, among others. The world is fast changing. Best practices are available now on the net. Because development puri rajniti mein ye focus ban gaya hai. BW Business World events provide a speaking platform to the voices that matter. Smart se taluk ye hai ki hum jo basic amenities hain you don't have to be a technologist. You need to understand how technology influences the world. Mahatma Gandhi was a great man. He was the leader of the freedom struggle. We believe that e-governance and IoT will play a very, very important role. BW Business World is an excellent exhibition platform that helps you showcase your services to the right audience. To be a part of our legacy, write into us at partner at the rate businessworld.in. Welcome back, everybody. And uh, yes, we are at the second edition of E4M PR and Corpcom Women Achievers Summit. And we are ready with our next keynote session. Before we do that, once again, requesting all of you, if you have any questions for our speakers, you can put it in the Q&A box, chat box, comment box on whichever platform you're watching us. Also, there is a buzz on Twitter with the hashtag E4M PR Women Achievers. So you can tweet to us using the hashtag as well. Moving forward, it is our absolute delight to welcome Ms. Manmeet Sandhu, Head of HR PhonePay. Manmeet Sandhu heads HR for PhonePay, digital transactions platform anchored on payments. As the Chief People Officer for PhonePay, Manmeet supports the organization's goal of scaling leadership to keep pace with its exponential growth and build a world-class HR organization with the right tools and systems so PhonePay employees can access opportunities to be the best version of themselves. Today, she'll be talking on women in leadership and phone pay's efforts to change the equation. A very warm welcome to you and me. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot and a pleasure to be here, Kathy. Thank you, we're looking forward to your session. All right, great. Um, let me just get started. And firstly, just acknowledge how happy I am to, get, to be here with all of you today. People who have managed to achieve so much and do so much with their lives. Um, I know, given the fact that uh, women in the Indian workforce are less than 20%, getting to where you are today would not have been easy. But at the same time, I think it's great for us all to acknowledge that being here today um, is also a source of great inspiration and uh, hope for so many women going forward. So, um, as Kathy mentioned, what I'll be talking to you today about is women in leadership um, and also what we are doing at PhonePay to help change the system and make it, make it a much better and much more equitable world. 
But before I get started, let me talk to you a little bit about myself um, and how I got where I did and what I learned in, in all of those, those years. Um, I'll start right at the beginning, the year I was born. And the year I was born was uh, the year in which the head of the country for India was a woman and what a woman she was. With her in the most powerful position in the country, I think the strength, the willpower, and the competence of women uh, was never really going to be in question again. And with that uh, as my starting point, and also growing up in uh, Mofasil towns all over India, the world for me at that point was small and slow, but at the same time, there was a lot of space to also dream big dreams. In the 90s, as India began to open up, there was now a possibility to make a lot of these dreams come true. Um, and for inspiration, there was, there was Kalpana Chawla, Sushmita Sen, to Arundhiti Roy. No matter who I wanted to be, there, was, there, was, there were examples of great women right in front of me doing a lot more and being a lot more than they had originally thought was possible. Uh, it also helped, I think, that growing up, I was left free to chart my own course and do my own thinking. And um, as I looked at young women and girls around me at that point in time, it felt that it was more or less the same for all of us. Uh, our mothers seemed to really be filled with this, this desire to, to, to make sure that the girls that they were bringing into the world were filled with diligence and courage and very sure about uh, the life they wanted to lead. Uh, we were never told. Uh, that there was someone who we could not be or something that we could not do. And this, I believe, was our biggest gift. Um, but then it was time to start being a part of the workforce. And um, there is what you believe of yourself and what the world believes of you. Um, entering the workforce, I will admit that it felt a little bit like being a part of a foreign country. Uh, the rules of success are different, but not in a way that is immediately obvious. And like in a foreign country, what are the rules that apply to the majority don't really quite apply to you. And this again is, is not a new thing. Uh, for centuries, the survival and success of the outsider, whether men or women, has really depended, depended on our ability to sort of follow instructions, work hard, and gain trust. But the thing is this, that uh, trust is not just about competency and credibility. It is also about being able to figure out what the unwritten rules are, knowing what favors to call in, who to go for advice, what questions to ask, and what topics not really to bring up. This is what culture is. It is the rules that makes a place what it is, and the things that nobody really tells you about. The better you understand the culture, the more you thrive. The more foreign the culture, the more difficult it is for you to succeed, no matter how hard you work. I realized that some of this, um, when I was actually in a foreign country, this sort of came home to me at that point in time. I spent a few years working uh, in the US. And as an Indian, I was part of a model minority. I, we were a bunch of people who worked hard, who seemed to know technology stuff really well, and in general, sort of kept their heads down. I got a lot of credit for knowing more maths and more uh, computers than I really did, and it worked well for me. But at the same time, I was also conscious of how much easier it was for me to make a point uh, if I was tentative, when I was not really shaking the board, and when I knew when to keep quiet. And again, this was not unique to me. I saw this play out in meeting rooms again and again. Women, people of color, or foreigners generally found it much easier to succeed when they knew what were the right opinions to hold and when it was really safe to disagree. Uh, once I came back to India, I noticed that the same thing applied more or less uh, here as well. In fact, I would almost say that we are much better at understanding these ancient, um, ancient rules of power, if you can call it that. Um, and I think I've sort of basically come to the conclusion that women in the corporate world are in a foreign country. We succeed only by changing ourselves to suit the expectations from the others. Um, some of us are better at it than the others, but it is not that it is ever easy for any of us. So with all of that, uh, when at PhonePay we decided that we wanted to focus on uh, developing better gender balance, the goal we took on was to make the place a little bit less foreign for women, to make it actually a place where they felt they could belong. And our starting point was having more women in leadership. 
this was not just about creating role models. Um, it was also about ensuring that women were in positions of power and influence so we could begin to change our unwritten rules. We believe that if a quarter of the leaders in the organization were women, uh, it would help create that critical mask, mask, which will make it easier for women to have their voices heard. And this as such is not necessarily a new idea. It's been done before. Uh, in fact, my favorite story about this is from um, Obama's presidency. Um, at the time when um, he first became the president's uh, president, the, the women in his staff were a small minority and they usually found it difficult to be effectively able to make a point. So they came up with a mechanism. Whenever a woman made a key point, the other women would repeat it, giving, it, giving credit to the author um, until it just became an everyday thing. And then Obama noticed and began to do the same thing until everybody felt a lot more comfortable being able to share opinions and make sure that their voices were not, not sort of quieted down before they'd had the chance to make their point. And ultimately it translated into a much more equitable gender distribution by the time of his second residence. Um, so to me, the fact that, that it is possible um, for, for sort of creating that um, critical mask was, was a fairly strong learning. Um, but then what do you do? What do you do to get more women into leadership positions? So one thing we decided, um, a simple enough starting point was that we would make sure that all external hires that we made at phone pay at senior positions in the organization would only be women. So we'd take whatever time it took, we'd work hard as hard as it took to make sure that all of those positions were filled by women leaders. And this was not an easy decision. Um, I myself was not sure if it was the right thing to do. Uh, it felt like a quota. And uh, I had been conditioned to believe that quotas are wrong because they distort the market. But the point is, the, the market is already distorted uh, in the other direction, uh, whether you consider the motherhood penalty, the access or the lack of access to networks, or the expectations of managing the house and the husband, the dice is already loaded against the women. This little thing is just the, um, our mechanism, our little effort to make sure that the, balance, the equation is rebalanced a little. And if we did nothing, it would simply perpetuate the current system, which was definitely not something we were willing to accept. So once we'd taken the decision, we had to now make it happen. And that, again, had its own set of challenges because there were always good reasons to just hire men. Um, it was a bigger pool. They were a better fit frequently. Uh, in fact, was turning out that we could hire them for less money that, we, that was needed to sort of pay uh, the women. And uh, we are a startup. We felt like we are in a big hurry to hire. Uh, and we couldn't really wait for so long to, to get all of the positions filled only with women. But we stuck to the principle and slowly it has begun to give us the results that we wanted. Not just in the fact that we have more women, which is also happening slowly, but also in the way the leaders in the organization have begun to take responsibility and ownership of creating more equitable cultures within their teams and to get more curious about what it would take to make sure that the women in their organizations wanted uh, to continue to be there, felt like they were a part of the team and wanted to belong. Um, the visibility did another thing which was possibly um, um, an unexpected outcome. Uh, it also translated into a lot more people across the organization, men and women, uh, to really talk about their own experiences and their own, um, own uh, means of being able to, to feel uh, like they were, they were being included. Uh, when we first began, in fact, when we first began, started, began to talk um, about this, uh, it was very, very hard for us to get women to share their challenges and constraints. But once we make the, made the commitment a lot more public on creating a, an equitable workforce, more people were willing to come forward and share their experiences. Just knowing that this was an organization that felt strongly about this meant that people wanted to sort of be a part of the story that helped make the change happen. Uh, one of the things that we did as, a, as part of the entire initiative was also that we spent a lot of time talking to women, both inside and outside the organization. Um, and what was interesting about that was that when women talked about their challenges, they were not usually about childcare and work-life balance. Those were things that mattered, but far more frequently, the challenges were really about 
managerial support, about being aware and well-informed and having their opinions heard. The issues that women seem to care about, the things that they wanted out of work, were really not all that different from what men seem to want. So we've decided not to really pursue any women-specific leadership programs or to single women out or uh, to identify policies that would single women out. Our goal is really to make the system better so women can contribute without compromising or limiting themselves. We're also creating the space for women in the organization to surface their challenges and constraints so we can band together and push for this change much more strongly. By creating a community, we're amplifying women's voices. The fact is that we want more women because we believe that they bring a different perspective and a different lived experience. But we will only be able to leverage this experience if we don't first require the women to change who they are. If people believe that they're valued and they have a voice, they will fight to make things work. And our promise is just that, the promise of a voice. There have been generations of women who have joined the workforce since I began my career. In some ways, the paths are broader. There are more opportunities. There are different things that people can do. And careers are not just about means to independence, but are also frequently about having a calling. And there are so many more role models, all the way to the vice presidents of the most powerful country in the world. But women are still only a small part of the corporate world, still much harder to find in the most powerful roles. Only 8% of the CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies are women. Although this, mind you, is a 1900% increase. In 2000, two out of the 500 women were, uh, two, two out of the 500 CEOs were women. And today that number is up to 40. So things have gotten better, but then as I look at the successful women I know, my managers and women leaders across the organization, across various different organizations, whether in India or abroad, the common factor invariably is the support systems around them. Frequently, it has meant that whether as fathers, managers, or husbands, the men have made the space to build the collaborative relationships that puts the woman first. Sometimes it is about the advice, encouragement, and faith that they demonstrate in the person. Sometimes it is about opening doors that they have access to. And sometimes it is simply about getting out of the way so that the women can, can shine. And it has to be acknowledged that it takes courage for men to do this. It requires them to stand up to society's expectations of themselves. But in the process, I believe that these men and women are creating a generation of boys who have role models, not just in their mums, but also in their dads. So as successful women yourself, you probably have examples of these people in your life. I certainly do. People who, uh, for me, both men and women, who opened up doors that I wouldn't otherwise have had access to. So as I think about what it takes to, make, to build a world where more women can play to their potential, I think about little ways in which I can make an impact in how I engage, not just by me, but also with my nephew. And the conversations I have with young women, so they know not just to be diligent, but also ambitious, not just hardworking, but also willing to take risks. And also, of course, in the system that we build at Phone Bay that helps them all belong. So today, ladies and gentlemen, my ask of you is just this. As people with power, please help tilt the world a little bit more towards equality. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Manmi. That was really interesting to hear you talk about so many aspects. And we have many questions that just uh, jumped in on our Q&A box and also we have from other platforms. So I'm just gonna take a few minutes to ask you this. Um, our first question is, since HR involves a larger gambit within the organization, what are your views on role women play? And is there any kind of discrimination, pay gaps issue, uh, and inclusivity in leadership? What has changed in these last few years, if you'd like to throw some light on that? Okay, so if I understand the question, uh, it is about women uh, in HR, or is it about women in leadership? Women in HR and also in the leadership roles. Okay, so um, it's, uh, I think there are multiple different things. And to me, I think the starting point is kind of this thing that there are certain things that women are good at, and there are certain things that men are good at. Um, that unconscious bias, a lot of us just start off with, men and women. 
Yeah. Um, and I think that's possibly the one thing that if we can get over would help. The question about women, more women in HR, actually even more women in, in media sometimes. It's because, oh, you're good with kind of talking to people. You're good with uh, being yeah. uh, somebody that people can um, um, rely on and all of that sort of stuff. Um, we've found that um, when we've been able to create those systems and we've tried to sort of uh, nudge people towards working with their biases and be more open about keep, keep giving people opportunities, about not deciding for them and letting people decide for themselves, it has resulted in, in better output. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's really just about saying that, you know, if, if you think that, oh, maybe I should not give this piece of work to this woman because she's just coming back from maternity, don't decide that yourself. Ask the person whether they'd like to take on that, that challenge. Um, and that sort of helps. On the other question around pay gap, um, I think I have a little bit of that in the, in the uh, conversation that I just had as well. I think it's interesting what happens is that uh, one part of it is about the roles that women kind of end up taking up. They're frequently the roles that tend to be the less paid roles. But yeah. even in roles that are uh, uh, more highly paid within an organization, um, once you get to the more senior roles, that disparity sort of tends to um, get better in control. I think especially because in recent times, there's been so much more communication about the women needing to stand up for themselves. But I think in the junior roles, uh, when women are still sort of trying to figure out who they really want to be, those discrepancies tend to come up a little bit more frequently. And at an org level, what you can do about it is just kind of do those surveys, do that analysis, figure out where those discrepancies are and help manage them. Right. Um, now, this is uh, in uh, relation to phone pay, particularly, is how phone pay has curbed the gap between being financially independent and being between financially educated. What is phone pay's vision on empowerment? <laughs> For, for us, I think, and that's an interesting question because I think it uh, plays out to both sides, both what we do within the organization for our employees and what's happening uh, outside. Yeah. Uh, the outside part, definitely, um, I'm quite proud of. Um, very frequently, a lot of the initiatives that you take around uh, creating a more equitable space are just about opening up opportunity. Right. Um, so they're not, you don't very, as you also saw from uh, what I mentioned in the, in the conversation earlier, it's not really about saying, oh, I will do these special things for women. It's about right. saying that, oh, this opportunity is now available to everybody. And now it is, we're going to make it easier for people to pick it up. So, right. for example, if I make it so simple for you to just open up your phone and make a payment or receive money or uh, to, in other ways, uh, be in control of your finances, uh, right. keeping track of your um, money and all of the rest, make financial investments and all of that stuff. That by itself makes it a lot easier for anybody in a, in an um, uh, maybe a less powerful position to take advantage. And I think that's sort of how we as an organization are helping opening up uh, the financial space to make, make sure that there is a lot more independence there. And, and we have a bunch of plans that will make this even more, more concrete in the coming years. Wonderful. So there's more like a neutral ground where people can come forward. Uh, what's your message to the new budding women leaders and how they can shine in their respective walks of life? Um, I think if I was to think about it in terms of the advice I would give to myself from 20 years ago, um, I think a couple of things. One, um, be ambitious. And when I say ambitious, I mean, Think about the biggest, most complex problem that you can solve and go ahead and solve it. Don't think about, oh, I don't know. I don't know how I'll be able to solve it. I don't have the capability. I don't have the training. You have all of it inside you. Go ahead and take off a big chunk of the challenge and solve for it because you absolutely can. Um, and the other thing is that uh, build your networks. Have people around you who have faith in you, uh, mm -hmm. both men and women, and uh, move forward with them. Wonderful. Now we have some questions that have come in on the platform itself. So I'm going to take a couple of them here. Uh, Neha says, how do you think we are more empowered now that we are able to speak in leap and leaps and bounds about women empowerment? And what has changed now in comparison to, let's say, a decade ago? Um, I think the, um, I would say that there were some brave people who first stepped out and made those, had their voices heard. And then they turned around and looked at the rest of us and held out a hand. I mean, I would talk about, you know, people like Indira Gandhi, people like Kalpana Chawla, um, Arundhati Roy, people who 
did not necessarily uh, had anybody uh, uh, voting for them or biding for them, but they sort of made that space for themselves. But once that space was made, I think a lot more of us had role models to turn around and say, I can do this. If she can do it, I can do it. And I think that's what has helped. More recent times, I think we are a lot more aware also of the fact that we don't have to be limited. And I think that has also helped a whole lot. Absolutely. Um, next question is from Shikhar. He says, um, are women reluctant to take up a role in operational HR, uh, HR personnel in India? We only see women in recruitment and training. What is your take? Okay. Um, I don't know, Shikhar, if this is more of an industry specific thing. Uh, I have not really seen that. Uh, if I look at my own team, it is definitely a team with more men or more women than men in it. Uh, more women in the more leadership roles as well. Um, and uh, women across roles, multiple different ones uh, and not just necessarily limited to uh, anything which you would sort of consider female specific. I think what does happen is that HR sort of seems like a place that more women will get started on. But I think in recent times, you see a lot more of them also going into uh, more holistic positions, whether it be compensation, whether it be operations, whatever else. So I, I see that changing. Right. And uh, here's a very open-ended question. Any advice to new entrants in the PR industry? <laughs> so I will uh, take inspiration from Priya Patankar, who is our communications and PR head. Um, I will say that uh, if I had... I had thought sort of differently about stuff. I thought PR was the most glamorous place to be and I would definitely have wanted, wanted to be in this particular space. So I love the, love the work that this space does and, and Priya is an amazing leader herself. Um, I think for young women or young people entering the organization at this point in time, I think this is a space that is, uh, that is alive with opportunity given how much more that is happening in media. Um, I would just, again, say the same thing. Just grab the opportunity. Don't let it go. You're great at it. Don't sell yourself short. Just go ahead and grab all, all opportunity and do the best of an industry that has got so much going on in it. Thank you so much, Manmeet, for your time and for sharing these insights here with us on the platform. Thank you so much from the entire team of Exchange for Media. Thank you, Kathy. It was a pleasure being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. The Bye. pleasure is ours. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, we can see the interaction going and the buzz is on on Twitter using the hashtag E4M PR Women Achievers. You can share your key highlights from the session so far. And I can see that all of you are enjoying these conversations. So we are going to straight move into our next panel discussion, which will talk about COVID adversity, what opportunities and challenges lies ahead of us. So here we have our esteemed panelists I'd like to welcome on screen. We have Jeanette Arul. AVP and Head Corporate Communication Akira Birla. We have with us Sukanya Chakraborty, Global Head Corporate Communication and CSR VFS Global. We have with us Pooja Khan, Head Corporate Communications Panasonic. Also on the panel, we have Atipuriya Sarawat, Director Brand Communication and Corporate Citizenship Reserve. And we have with us on the panel, Nikki Gupta, Director, Teamwork Communications. Moderating this session is Ms. Tasmai Roy, Assistant Editor, Exchange for Media Group. A very warm welcome to all you lovely ladies. And Tasmai, I'm going to leave the screen to you to take the conversation forward. Thank you so much, uh, Kathy, for the introductions. Uh, welcome, speakers. So glad to have you on the panel today. Uh, there's a great session waiting ahead of us. So without much delay, I think we should start this chat. And, you know, uh, what's interesting and what we've been hearing from the uh, speakers before this also, that how the uh, uh, year gone by has changed everything, right? It has changed operations, it has changed management, marketing, communications, everything. So, you know, I would just start with one question for all of you, and I would like to, uh, you know, know your two cents on it. How has the past year and a half been? How has it changed? Uh, what is new? What's ha been happening for you and your organization in the uh, year and a half gone by? We'll start with you, Sukanya. Thanks, Tasmai. Uh, hello to everyone uh, who's listening and uh, a big hello to my co-panelists. Uh, it's great to be here on this platform. Um, quickly on how the last one and a half years has been for all of us, I guess the pandemic has been an eye-opener of Thoughts, of, thoughts for all of us, all individuals, businesses, and communities at large. 
uh, disrupting and creating new ways of adapting to everyday situations and a lot of learning as well um, you know setting a you know the so called new normal in every step um, emphasizing the need to be agile flexible uh, to make shifts wherever needed in fact as soon as the pandemic hit us businesses had to quickly relook at the ways that they were working and devise the best ways uh, to reach out to their stakeholders both external and internal and for us in communications at that this time um, when everyone was experiencing uncertainty and turmoil uh, we made sure to shift our focus to address crucial uh, subjects uh, of public information safety health that was more contextual with the times right right uh, we'd like to hear from you niki uh, since you are uh, your brand has so many uh, healthcare brands under its umbrella how has it been you seeing all your different clients all with different demands how has it been just give us an overall understanding of how it's been uh, unmute yourself niki yes we can hear you now yeah. so thank you exchange for media and tamsay for having me here so we are meeting again very soon uh, within the week only yeah so as you are talking about the covid adversity opportunities and challenges right so if you talk about the whole communication industry we all the panelists are from the different domains of the communication industry Absolutely. and due to covid the whole communication has taken a 360 degree approach Mm -hmm. it has affected our way we used to communicate it has affected our daily way of communications be it colleagues be it you know team members be it uh, you know with the media i would say with everybody so covid in the today scenario it's a amalgamation i would say of a traditional right. pr and the new marketing strategy when it comes so in this scenario a multitasking communication person in this world a communicator has to play a multiple roles to meet the brand expectations mm -hmm. as you have correctly mentioned that the healthcare industry i would say that this pandemic has given multiple challenges to the entire communication industry that's how right. however it has given a given has it has given immense opportunity when it comes to the healthcare communication industry mm -hmm. the whole communication industry has got multiple challenges but huge opportunities absolutely absolutely those are great insights you know multiple challenges and great opportunities are something that you know has been a part of businesses their strategies in the past uh, year and half gone by uh, janet over to you tell me a little bit about uh, you know how it's been uh, at your end what are the challenges and what are the opportunities that you could spot in the last year gone by Yeah. Uh, hi, Tasmay. Uh, thank you for having me on board. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Loud and clear. Yes. Okay. So yeah, I think the year and a half has been. I would say. Um, I would say it's a you know. Uh, there's a lot of uh, introspection that we all went through because there was a lot of learning we did, a lot of unlearning we did. Uh, I think we were just thrown into a situation where we had never expected and anticipated this kind of a scenario. so we all had to learn to adapt to the new scenario uh, adjust to our new ways of working whether it is at home whether it is at uh, you know at the office level i think when you're just thrown into the sea to swim uh, you know you'll figure your way out mm -hmm. and from there you know your learnings will begin and uh, i think we all stood together whether as a family unit or as an organization we all stood by each other and i think that has been uh, one big learning absolutely absolutely uh, atipriya how has it uh, uh, been for you how different was it or how similar was it to the experience of the other speakers we just heard how has the year uh, gone by been for you and your company atipriya may i request you to just uh, leave and join back again and connect the audio that's my till then you sure. can uh, pooja uh, meanwhile we can uh, hear from you at panasonic how has it been uh, what were the challenges opportunities if you can sum it up uh, for us honestly you know the life as we know it will never be the same again and Absolutely. i think the year has been like it's really an extraordinary time that we are living through it's a life changing experience true we all have recalibrated what we believe in what we stand for our priorities are starting to change 
Mm-hmm. And I see this whole concept emerging, whether it's with my colleagues or with my friends outside. The whole YOLO concept or carpe yes. diem. So it's it's kind of taking the whole world by storm, and you know we are no different. And I see our colleagues going through that quite a bit. Uh, I'll just give you my two bits on today's topic of discussion, which is on COVID communications and how Absolutely. things have been. Yeah. I don't think there's any readily available playbook to help us navigate through what we have gone through. I mean, the last time we faced something like this as as mankind was the Spanish flu. I think that was hundred years ago. Yes. And today, Absolutely. it's 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 really a different world that we are living in, and none of us have ever faced something like this before. It's been about the in, uh, in the first wave, the conversations actually started with that as as I was telling you guys earlier. Also, it was life versus livelihood. Yeah, yes. when the second wave it moved towards, and during the course of the year, it actually moved towards life and livelihood. Both are equal important part of the uh, pillars of our economy, whether it was government, whether it was corporates, we all had to align, switch our narratives and figure out what was the best way to communicate and deal with the situation. And like all industries, every industry had a unique set of challenges. While some uh, somebody spoke about a lot of opportunities. Yes, there were opportunities, but there was also a lot of disruption that happened. Absolutely. And uh, if, if you see the manufacturing index, it's again gone down. So it's not a very happy time to be in uh, in terms Absolutely. of economy and employees and employment generation. But having said that, there were opportunities, and all our industries had unique set of challenges. Whether it was uh, like especially for us being in manufacturing, I mean, it was a big thing of uh, coming back to business, and that I'll speak about more when I speak later. There were some green shoots of opportunities. If I have to look outside the business and I have to say that, you know, cloud kitchens, what a big success yes, that was. That absolutely. was a very big opportunity that came out. IT, ITES, huge opportunity again, and they have made huge profits. So th- that's been, and NGOs have, have really come up quite a bit in this time. And there'll be many more such things with the conversations further will come to light. So I think I will leave it at that. I don't think there's any playbook. It's been a very tough time for everybody. Right. Welcome back, Atipriya, again. Hey, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, you know, we were talking about, like Pooja was mentioning, it was a year like no other. And, you know, while there were opportunities, there was a great deal of challenges as well. So, you know, if you can help us understand how has it been at your end, how have you all been coping with the entire learnings and unlearnings of uh, the COVID times? Thanks so much again, Tasmi. And sorry about that. Uh, those are some perils of, uh, you know, working from home that technology yes. necessarily serve the purpose you want it to serve. So uh, let me just start by saying that we are an essential services organization, you know, focused in uh, financial payments and uh, technology and fintech. Um, I think, you know, I, pretty much everybody has covered different aspects of how the pandemic really impacted us. But two aspects that, you know, I want to be able to focus on is the fact that, uh, you know, we very consciously as an organization took a shift to not necessarily identifying the new normal, but really addressing the fact that, you know, what is it that we as an organization and our people and our clients need to be able to do to, you know, uh, succeed in the new normal, right? And that was, I think, something that clearly stood out for us, especially because, you uh, you know, we saw a massive uptake in, in, in digital and we've all heard about that, right? That uh, the yes. pandemic has really fueled digital. So how do you, you know, ally? And th- those are our clients, right? Financial institutions, merchants and customers where you actually saw, you know, consumer behavior change overnight completely, right? So how do you align your uh, client needs to your workforce? And that required a lot of focus in terms of, you know, uh, uh, continuous talent and de- development internally, internally to be able to address those needs for clients. So I think from my perspective, I would say that, you know, there were two clear aspects that came out when uh, we wanted to be able to see how we succeed in the, in the new environment. And that was culture. Uh, in terms of how you really bring your teams together, how uh, you're able to actually, uh, you know, align them to your organization's goals and your aspirations and to new changing demands in the industry as well. That stood out very strongly for us. And something that we are extremely proud of is the fact that, you know, even before the pandemic, we as an organization have very uh, strongly 
uh, you know, invested and believed in the need for uh, a very strong internal communications charter, which, uh, you know, because you, we keep hearing this and all of us are very familiar with it is that, you know, the internal and external lines have completely blurred. And my employee and my associate is really my first brand ambassador. So, and we really live that, right? And the fact that we have a very uh, robust internal communication mandate actually helped us um, you know, really bring out the whole uh, together piece uh, very, very promptly. And we were able to evolve quickly. There was agility in the system that, you know, we were able to take back to our peoples. The intent was really, and I think like a lot of the panelists also spoke about was that nobody should, you know, in, in a time like this, in a challenging time like this, nobody should actually feel alone, right? Whether it is your client, whether it is your employee or, you know, the communities that you uh, operate in, they should all feel, they, you know, they are shared. This is a shared experience that we all are going through and they should all feel a part of that experience, relatable stories as to, you know, everybody is going through the same thing and, you know, you're not alone in it. I think that uh, aspect, uh, as communicators, we were able to bring out really strongly. That was an opportunity that we saw that we completely, uh, you know, bridged on, and that was a, probably a gap that existed as well that we were able to, uh, you know, bridge and take forward with uh, with uh, the pandemic. It got accelerated hugely. Absolutely, absolutely, very interesting uh, insights, Adipri. And you know, picking up just from there. Uh, it is very important that we value the people that we are working with, whether it's our teams or it's our clients, it's our customers, the entire ecosystem. Right. And just to be there, just to turn up and just to make them feel that, you know, there is empathy and that you're not alone in it. So I'd like to start with you, uh, Pooja, you know, minimizing crisis and impact of COVID on employees, you know, that has been, I think, one of the focus areas of all communicators across board. If you can tell me how it has been happening at your end at Panasonic, even in corporate life, you know, we've been introduced to so many new things like work from home. There are a lot oh, of employees who've never heard about this concept. It's an alien concept for a lot of people, right? So getting aligned to that thought, getting aligned to that new idea, how has it been? You know, how, how have you dealt with this entire COVID crisis and how, what has been the impact of communication in this whole scenario? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there was no playbook. So we all yes. had to kind of put our hats on and move super yes. quickly. You know, there was no time. Agility yeah. was the key. So I don't think I had any, uh, like, you know, we started off, we put together a crisis management plan. And I think in April, in, 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 in Feb, March, I just joined Panasonic. And my most of my time in Panasonic has been in COVID. <laughs> And uh, so first thing I did was put together a quick crisis management plan because that's how we're trained to do, right? Like, you know, when Absolutely. you get in, you look at everything. So first thing we did was that. But trust me, that was followed, but not even followed because things were changing. Things were so dynamic. What each day brought, nobody really knew. I think it was mm -hmm. a big wake up call for the ACE industry, which I belong to, the technology industry. Yes. But it helped us change gears very quickly, pick up digital. I don't think... Uh, Panasonic is a hundred year old company and you know while we're a technology company heavy on digital all that thankfully was there mm -hmm. so the ecosystem was in place for internal communications called workplace you had your digital work from home systems in place which could kick into immediately I think we actually like you know I think lockdown was announced and we all went home and the next day we all were connected at least that was the only positive part of the whole thing I would say so we were at least connected and uh, if I have to look at it from a communicator's lens, it actually furthered management's belief on effective communication. You know, as Atipriya mentioned, you know, lines have been blurring between internal and external comms. And uh, the fact is that, you know, and, and suddenly the management actually started to realize how important communications was to bring people together, to keep people together with traditional campaigns taking a back seat. It was actually PR and social media that gave prominence and became the centerpiece of strategic communication, right? And as I said earlier, you know, every industry has its unique set of challenges. But Panasonic being, being a B2C and a B2B kind of a company with consumer durables, energy, integrated solutions, welding, I mean, name it, and we have in terms of heavy machinery. And uh, with 15 factories across the country, it was like, you know, suddenly it was a shutdown, lockdown across the board. And bringing people back was another challenge. 100% work from home is never an option for an industry like us, where 90% is actually out on the field or in the uh, or on the shop floor, right? So right. communication was the key in bringing people together. As I said, no fixed strategy. The key piece was to inform, engage. The only thing I followed was inform, engage. 
as soon as you get the information analyze process and ensure people are aware of it tone of voice empathy compassion i think because that's how you could really come up to speed without like if i had to think and make strategies at that time we probably won't have implemented half the things that we did right there was a covid task force i mean uh, for example you had uh, our spokes people actually became a brand ambassadors our employees became a brand ambassadors and we rolled out a lot of relevant and exciting campaigns during that time just to keep people engaged and involved right, right. so first we started with work from home hacks because suddenly people who had never worked from home were working from home right it's a work from home hack so how you were dealing with all of this then we thought okay fine let's how engage them more then it was life at panasonic homes so we actually gave people on linkedin and on internal platforms a quick view of how uh, and and it so happened all our employees have panasonic devices at home so they actually became wow. a brand ambassadors during it talking about our products and our uh, whole story out there solutions and you then there was another campaign we launched with leadership where keeping them engaged because when the market is shut you can't do client meetings so many how to That's keep right. them engaged solutions and you so they got down to writing a lot of content and sharing on social media in terms of the kind of stuff they were doing our ceo was hyper active during that time i think he is one of the best communicators in my 20 years i've come across right and he actually came forward like i have not seen many ceos come forward right from town halls i mean bi weekly town halls we had done then just to engage people keep them informed what we were doing to bring them back and and how was business firing and how not to worry that you know nobody will lose their job we did, we did not sack anyone no one lost their job and so keeping that aligned keeping people giving people that mental peace which was a critical thing daily catch ups with the team you had covid task force like most organizations that we also right. did set up ensuring oxygen concentrators and medical supplies and doctors and everything was available but to ensure employees knew about it the uh, comms team was the key we kind of bridged the gap between the management and the people by ensuring all the information was easy to read readily available at at people's fingertips water cooler conversations coffee conversations had finished you don't have them anymore right so internal communications platform like workplace panasonic times and internal newsletter gain more prominence and you had to change the way and the content change you had to change the content to reflect what people were going through and to share what they wanted to listen to i think that was the key things that we had to uh, kind of align and and quickly do that these things also help break silos we, we have some seven divisions right and each division is a business in itself right and so like when you're in office you walk across you talk to people but you can't in a situation like this even when you are back in office you're restricted to your little zone yes, that you are stuck yes, in you know absolutely. you can't move to different zones so what do you do there so all these things help break silos also it was very important to do that so what ssd was doing is we what consumer durables were doing so it just kept them all informed aligned and they knew what's happening with the business information right. is the key if people are informed right. they are engaged they are mentally in a better space so i think this is what communications did and pr was integral for this whole story internally and externally as well i would say right right these are my two bits on this great insights pooja uh, thank you so much for all those valuable uh, anecdotes that you shared with us i'll uh, come over to janet next you know uh, a very interesting thing that pooja mentioned is there was no rule book so there is no handbook that uh, defines you know covid a uh, management uh, 101 or something like that so there is no rule to follow there is no precedent to follow here so and you know while uh, finding new ways of communicating must have been a very important thing for uh, panasonic and the likes for retail i'm sure innovation was the key word right there was a lot of uh, focus on innovation so if you can tell me a little bit about how it has been happening in uh, retail you know at the apparel business the innovation in portfolios we know that for a change that you know an important part of our fashion statement is the mask that we wear right so if you can tell me a little bit about you know how uh, the apparel business has been dynamic enough and adapted to the new normals or the changes that the pandemic uh, introduced walk us through it uh, janet sure. sure so uh, as pooja mentioned you know um, we had to change gears quickly Right. so same happened in the business while the business uh, you know took a beating in terms of stores you know had to uh, get in operational and all of that stuff 
uh, what happened was uh, we could, we had to listen to our customers. Hmm. We had to understand their needs. And right. given that scenario, uh, you know, we had to uh, come out with masks for consumers. Right. Where, when we didn't have the capabilities and the capacities. And given a lockdown situation uh, where your manufacturing capacities are closed, your design teams are operating from home, you can't have your products touch and feel. So in a given scenario like this and your consumers, <clears throat> are, you know, you can listen to your consumers, what are their pain points and you, I think this is where innovation comes about, where you, right. know, you quickly have to adapt, the, the brands have to adapt and, you know, come out with, uh, you know, uh, designing masks, producing masks, taking out to consumers, uh, reaching out to them. And I think this is where, uh, you know, I think, the adversities bring out the best in you. Right? This is uh, a little bit of a uh, cliche, but uh, we were able to uh, create masks for our consumers. And I think that was a very big thing at that point of time, because uh, you know you had to import certain amount of technology from overseas. And how do you, how do you manage in you know, a scenario where everything is locked down? And I yes. think this is where uh, you know, um, our uh, organization, uh, you know, stood very steadfast and we were able to think things in a manner where not only serve customers, but stand united as a team, as it is, uh, you know, um, again, belonging to an Aditya Birla group uh, organization, uh, the kind of support system you get is immense. And I think that helps you, uh, you know, Uh, I think we lost Pooja for a bit there. Uh, we lost Janet, yes. Janet, you're back. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, uh, you know, uh, belonging to a good organization who takes care of you, That's half right. of your battles are won over there. Absolutely. The third piece, uh, you know, was the digital transformation which got escalated to a next level. Because of COVID, uh, we had, while we were there in the digital space, it got further accelerated. Right. So, uh, you know, and the collections changed, uh, masks became the new normal, at leisure became the new normal. Yes. Uh, so I think those were at, the, at, a, at a professional level, those were some of the big changes that happened. Within uh, the own uh, communication space, uh, I realized that, you know, my team, we worked like as if there was no tomorrow. The kind of stuff uh -huh. we did uh, during this year and a half was right. amazing. Uh, whether it was internal communications, whether it was external communications, uh, we were all learning to adapt. And I think in that whole journey, uh, we had to make sure that as communicators, we are able to uh, narrate our story in a manner which will inspire people. I think that was very, very important. So whether it is your digital platforms, your social media space, whether it is your internal communications, we had to keep that in mind, the sensibilities of the audiences, whether it was internal or external, and uh, create a whole uh, communication piece which would uh, bring about unity, which would bring about, at the same time, excitement and not create boredom. Right. So, right. Uh, so we, we built a whole lot of exciting stuff within the communication space as well. Wow. Right, right. So, you know, one very important thing that I picked up from what uh, Janet, you just said that, you know, listening to your customers, what they want. And so, you know, picking up uh, right from there, I'll go over to uh, you, Nikki. Uh, you have a lot of uh, clients. So basically, you have a lot of people asking you for the same solutions, but in a different way. Right. And, you know, we also know that how marketing has changed from uh, having focus on one plan fits all to something, you know, which is customized and tailor made for each of the clients. Right. And since you handle around more than 40 brands under your uh, team. So tell me, how is it? What has been uh, what has been the demands of the clients? How differently were you uh, strategizing, uh, you know, communication plans for your clients in the healthcare segment? Uh, thanks, Tasmay. So, Tasmay, just to add on here, so if I'm talking about 40 clients, so 40 clients, these are all, 45 clients, these are all health specific. Right, so right. Absolutely. On health specific vertical. And it was an equal challenge to keep all the sector's client, keep them happy. 
and give them customized tailor made solution for all the clients right. Right. so when it comes to the healthcare um, you know clients um so as i mentioned that you know it came the whole covid thing came as an opportunity but initially it came as a crisis right of course to be very frank and in the crisis in this whole crisis we try to maintain so that we don't become a crisis it's it's very important yes. losing That's your head in a crisis and become a good way to handle you know the whole crisis thing so keeping that in mind we notice that bigger audience is waiting for the communications because initially if we talk about the post covid era there were only few takers of the healthcare news right the healthcare here the everybody be it adult or a child everybody wants to consume everyone wants to know about what is happening in the healthcare mm-hmm. and keeping that in mind the agility everybody has talked about that was something because nobody was aware even the government who and we have to work for so many clients send the communications to the media and you know at every level i cannot forget that our team used to work till 12 am at night when the, this pandemic started we used to work around the clock no saturdays no sundays we very faster accepted the work from home thing but the whole culture is like you know we were just working like mad people and um, you know we decided okay on a regular basis one can take um, you know uh, chutti and they can take leave they can take a pause because at the same time the mental health of the team was yeah. really important yes. so keeping that in mind because many of them were also facing the covid problem at home so providing the customized and tailor made solutions to the clients so we work for various client as i talked about we have more than 16 hospitals in delhi and cr we have diagnostics chain and these are all working with the covid so how the women so when the communication is going it's not about the communication going and just delivering to the media it was the giving the right information accurate right. information how correct information because multiple time it used to have happen that big media houses were not aware they used to reach out to us okay now what's the solution okay so yes. handling more than 100 plus doctors in our organization the whole media was with teamwork and teamwork was standing with the media and we were just floating and try to give the right information when it comes to the custom made and the tailor made approach for the brands i would say the when it comes to the bigger audience and the bigger medium so if i talk about the bigger medium so bigger medium was the media so the biggest challenge for the corporate uh, so for the pr industry was right. the acceptability was reduced when it comes to the paper absolutely so i would say the transformation of the digitization and the fast track of the digitization happened that time and everybody started communicating prior used to happen only we reach, we used to reach out to the certain cities media and right. the customization happened we started reaching out to multiple cities media and they also become quite acceptable absolutely they also started supporting uh, you know us and they uh understood that it's a need because they also want to get the what is happening in the national capital healthcare right right of course it's not about the national media even the international also we did multiple huge level campaigns right in of course covid and mm-hmm. along with that um i would say when the government started doing the press conference digital uh, the biggest thing is happened that we also started communicating with the media on via twitter Right. all the communication used to handle that was a one tailor made communication because crisis was you know the every become a everyday affair and right. um, twitter was the one thing and the digital media was the one thing we started communicating and keeping the bigger market scenario in mind right. um, everybody wanted to know what is in it what it uh, what is it in for me so absolutely every health status of every individual vary so be it vaccination so government also issued multiple time you know uh, yes. communication related to vaccination yes. so keeping that in mind that's also we started communicating for the uh, you know brands 
in a different level uh, with the different, uh, you know, uh, be it influencer marketing, be, be it a regular shortage plan because you you don't know uh, what you are going to communicate tomorrow so the plans of the all the healthcare clients become uh, you know a week plans we switch to the weekly plans weekly strategies and um, moreover uh, with the meetings with the journalist on a regular basis so that that was a more uh, you know strategic approach that we took right. along with the i would say the influencer marketing is one of the new tool which course, come up as the, not only for the other vertical healthcare also it has become a really big market it is not the next big thing it is the big thing and every brand be it healthcare corporate everybody wants to do it so that's a new thing that we are doing uh, providing a customized solution right. very focused content driven mm -hmm. and then to all the healthcare brands Absolutely. Very interesting insights, Nikki. Thank you so much for it. And you know, one word I picked up from whatever you said is acceptability. And with that, I want to go to Sukanya. You know, there's one thing that none of us have been able to accept is that there's been no travel, right? So if you could walk us through, you know, the communication that's been happening there, there has been, uh, there is so much going on around travel anxiety, uh, vaccine acceptance, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, uh, in a field like yours, where you are working, you know, where you're working with travel, where, where you're working with travel related queries, you know, what has been the communication like? What is the kind of communication that you're giving out? How has there been a change in the tone of the communication, if any? So, you know, just walk us through that. Right. Yes. So, um, like, you know, we know that travel and its ecosystem has been, uh, you know, one of the worst hit in the Absolutely. pandemic. Right. Especially with uh, border closures and, uh, you know, uh, I would say uncertainty over uh, being allowed to move across countries. And of right. course, you know, like in every, uh, in, the, in this COVID situation, you know, no company is a stranger to crisis mitigation, but right. there's no reference point. There was no reference point for uh, the pandemic and for us to go back and check. And our end with the travel ecosystem, um, you know, fronting drastic changes, um, slowdowns, and even suspension of services, um, it became very critical to keep all the stakeholders, both internal and external, apprised of every single development and almost real time. Right. And, um, you know, this had to be done in a way that uh, was both transparent and reassuring. Uh, yes. Because at the end of the day, you know, while we don't know when travel would resume uh, like it was in the pre-pandemic era, but it's always important to keep the faith on, you know, the faith yes, that we will travel awesome. again. Uh, we work across, uh, you know, 140 plus countries and we serve more than 60 governments. And it was no mean task, you know, given the speed at which uh, the information was required to be communicated to every stakeholder. And, you know, this information was changing because uh, every country, uh, every local authority had their own rules and it was very dynamic, very fluid. And we were aware of that. So, you know, uh, from COVID-19 FAQ series that, uh, you know, had all the probable, uh, uh, you know, questions related to visa applications answered right. to, you know, safety first, uh, uh, you know, campaigns that highlighted the health and uh, hygiene measures uh, if one were to visit our centers for anything or even safe travels for that matter, you know, uh, where we spoke about measures that people could uh, follow when they resume travel. And uh, another very important, um, uh, you know, series we did was, you know, how, how do you not fall for fraud? Because this is the time when, uh, you know, there were a lot of scamsters, uh, you know, all over the place, uh, yes. you know, scamming people. And it was very important that we did a series so that people realize that, you know, if someone's, uh, you know, telling you about uh, even, a, you know, something like, you know, come to us, we'll help you with a work permit. No, don't do that because... Uh, there is no work permit at this point in time. You cannot move across the border. So, you know, we did a lot of um, do not fall for fraud series, uh, series and it's still continuing even today. Um, so empathy, engage, educate constantly. You know, these, this became our uh, tent pole for the strategy. And several learnings also came up and uh, very similar to some of what my co research spoke. The first was uh, the need for speed and agility. Things were changing so much, so frequently. So uh, the ability to weather uh, unforeseen disruption, adopting the newer ways of uh, doing business and working, uh, it was important to become agile and adaptive. 
the second one you know one of my co panelists brought out was the culture bit so this it, it's another very important aspect that came out is without seeing people face to face on a daily basis you know it became very important to think of creative ways to bind the employees together in such crisis times big focus on health and safety i mean for everyone uh, you know uh, beat employees beat the customers it it was you know one of the important uh, themes that emerged from on ground uh, safety measures to new uh, health and work uh, health and work related policies right. uh, rise of digital co consumption like um, uh, nikki mentioned you know uh, we didn't have the the luxury of print anymore i mean it was yes. primarily yes. digital at this that point in time and even today it's continuing the dependency on the platforms you know continued to rise uh, which means that for communicators you know you had to expand uh, not to the use of newer platforms for more engagement and more reach and mm. the other aspect internal communication obviously became as important as external of communications course, course. Um, uh, is being because most of the companies uh, do focus on external but internal communications um, uh, uh, is not something that consciously you'd focus except for certain brands who do it very well so this became a, a big focus uh, knowing that how uh, with a remote workforce how important it was to keep them connected and like um, Pooja mentioned about newsletters, etc. So those were the only mediums that were available constantly to keep your employees informed and engaged. And you know the L and D programs that helped employees pick up new skills, upgrade themselves while there was an uncertainty over the business and operations. But how do you keep them constantly, uh, you know, uh, know that they are valued in the company? And uh, you know, how would you reskill them to adapt to the new uh, business or the world order that we were entering at that point in time and right. even today? So I guess these were some of the things, and uh, the other thing we saw is uh, going forward. Also, you know, technology is going to be become a big enabler. It has always been, and even so now, uh, the digital readiness. You know, that's become a big topic for discussion across organizations, uh, especially with the emergence of the hybrid workforce. That's that's you know the the model that's coming up. And from a communication point of view, of course, you know everyone's talking about purpose-driven communication. Right. But uh, that that's going to you know how people interpret that is uh, you know maybe a debate for another day. But right. purpose-driven communication will become uh, very important as we move forward as communicators in this world. Absolutely, thank you so much, uh, Sukanya. Those uh, were very uh, interesting insights that you gave on travel and how communications change. We'll come back to Atipriya. You know, uh, you mentioned some very interesting points in your uh, introductory comment about you know a slimming line between uh, internal and external comms and how there has been a role reversal, you know, in comms and how it has been so dynamic and changing in the last uh, year and a half. So you know, um, Atipriya, if you can elaborate a little bit about the new opportunities where communication plays a significant role or it has the scope of playing a significant role. Be it you know in uh, terms of people, be it external, internal, whatever it is, help us understand you know the new opportunities for communication roles. Yeah, thanks uh, so much for that question. So uh, let me pick up with something what Pooja started with. Uh, you know, one right. of the biggest spaces I see a huge amount of uh, opportunity, and uh, you know, it was to some extent it was a challenge for a lot of organizations. Right. Is, uh, transformation that we're going to see in leadership communication. Right. Uh, the fact that you know how what what frequencies at what levels at what messaging at you know how are you reporting it and how are you putting a framework in order to be able to ensure that uh, that people are engaged and informed is going to see a huge amount of change to my mind and i think uh, i think and it's not restricted to leadership and that's what the that's what that's what makes it interesting right because uh, you know, for an organization like ours, for example, which is like almost 9,000 odd uh, in number of employees, how do you, you know, cascade information across those different levels? So how do you empower people to be able to take messages forward, right? I think that in right. terms is going to see a significant uh, change and a huge opportunity for communicators to be able to build really compelling campaigns around that. The other aspect that I see, which, which, will, which to my mind will turn out to be a huge opportunity is going to be workplace experiences, right? Uh, and so Tanya alluded to that saying that uh, the whole hybrid model that we are moving towards, you know, how are you going, how is, you know, how are you going to keep, a, you know, a hybrid model workforce engaged, right? How are you going right. to how are you going to deliver programs to them? Like, how will your induction module look like? What will your learning and development in, uh, interventions look like, right? And I think, uh, you know, people are, workplace experience by itself is becoming extremely center stage right now. You know, right. where you're able to, uh, 
create experiences you know throughout the journey of the employee in your organization i think that is a place where communicators can play a significant amount of uh, role as well right uh, just the fact that you know how you will uh, define your uh, employee value proposition because that is really what it is you know when you define what is in it for me for your existing people for your partners or anybody else your suppliers or anybody as well right uh, that is what is going to really drive uh market differentiation so i think workplace experience and what communicators can do around that to be able to elevate those experience to build stories around it to build narratives around it share experiences around it is something that uh will 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 become like a you know will become is a massive opportunity that i see and we should all be able to leverage it uh you know to give you another example of external you mentioned right like uh, which which we as a as an organization saw as a uh, as a great opportunity was right. uh, with the whole hybrid model again right we saw an opportunity uh, to you know enhance our talent pools where are we actually going and getting people on board and you know keeping that in mind we introduced this program called forward for her which is basically a program targeted specifically at uh, you know women who have taken a career break and not necessarily because of uh, maternity but any other reason that they have taken a career break and you know how can we as an organization be committed to getting them back to the workforce you know what kind of a work environment can we create for them so that even you know aligns to the focus around diversity and inclusion that you know that the fact that you you are not only creating a new talent pool but you're actually taking forward a very important message which is you know uh, that you're not only a technology organization right and like like any of us actually you're not just a health organization or just a you know travel company yes. you're actually yes. organizations which have very which are invested in very strongly invested in human potential right so right. that was an opportunity we saw we were able to leverage it it gave the campaign had you know it had like a typical 360 degree campaign it had different aspects social media press and otherwise we had a huge uptake and i think that was an opportunity that we were able to leverage really well we piloted it last year we uh, launched a full blown campaign this year uh, that was one thing um i think the last piece that i would uh, you know look at as a as a great opportunity for all of us to uh, jump on in is going to be cultural transformation i think cultural transformation is going to be central uh, and the pandemic has really brought it to center stage it's it's like it's right in our faces and i don't think it's something that we can any one of us can as as communicate communication leaders can ignore it anymore right how do you uh you know like i said earlier how do you align your teams to the goals and aspirations of your organization how do you encourage people to you know be able to thrive in an organization right how do you how do you create campaigns and say success stories and achievements and how do you celebrate uh, individuals in the organization right uh, when it comes for example when it comes to diversity and inclusion you know how are you promoting your people to bring back to bring their authentic self to the organization how are you celebrating originality and these things are going to make a significant impact going forward because uh you know the more you meet your own employees the more interactions you have externally as well whether it is with the press or with partnerships or suppliers or any one of them people want to be associated with brands that have that are empathetic that are that have empathy for their people you know uh, I, they want to be associated with with uh, workplace attributes like culture learning and growth opportunities uh you know like diversity and inclusion and all of that right so how do you build that you know as a very intrinsic part of your culture and you know sukanya mentioned a very uh, pertinent and important aspect uh you know like i said we are an essential services organization right and uh, imagine you know anything that you do digital from online payments to accepting online payments everything went digital right and we are pretty much uh, uh you know we 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 facilitate those services right from starting from for financial institutions right to the end consumer to have a workforce to be a, you know to be to be engaged and to be pride proud enough to be able to ensure that you know there is seamless uh work happening and there is seamless uh, you know contribution being driven and we are adding value to the clients and we are but you know we are catering to market demands is is a very big uh, you know is a very big aspect uh, you know in terms of bringing to front uh, uh, you know what is important at that point in time for the market to be able to do so i think those will be the you know couple of things that i think will make a, a huge difference and just to add to that i think um, again sukanya mentioned this is about security 
security has yes, again absolutely. come for so strongly right and especially for again for a financial services company security for us is absolutely of topmost importance right so building a culture that you know and and your associates and your employees are your first line of defense right so how do you create a security posture security first posture for your organization how do you you know get your people to be more conscious and more aware of it so that you know that is a place that you can you can stop any breach that may ever happen right so i think the many aspects to culture that you can actually take up and i see that as a, you know significant i see communication as a significant and a very um, you know strategic enabler to be able to push those messages across in the organization and influence culture to the extent that you are influencing mindset shifts you are influencing behavioral patterns you are influ- you know you are influencing a uh, change in how you do things probably regularly you you know you are inducing new thinking you are you are you are thinking of innovative ways of doing things i think that is going to be something that uh, you know as communication uh, leaders something that we'll have to very actively look into as to how we can you know bring that about for people how you can bring that about for your organization absolutely absolutely thank you so much uh, atipriya those were very uh, important things that i think uh, as a communicator one must remember and you know things uh, that help in carrying on the communication function better thank you so much uh, speakers for those interesting insights it was a great learning session i think as well for all of us who are tuned in thank you so much for connecting thank you thank you tasmay thanks folks thank you thank you bye bye everybody bye bye thanks to the ladies thank you tasmay for sharing this very interesting conversation so many nuggets of uh, insights and wisdom for all our viewers and if you have any to share with the wider audience then go ahead and tweet to us using the hashtag eform women achievers so i'm going to move forward quickly to our next uh, panel discussion which is going to talk about pandemic and power of purpose power of purpose based communication for brands so ladies and gentlemen i hope you are all ready and set as we welcome our esteemed panelists on screen we have indu sharma senior general manager communication schneider electric we also have anandita mukherjee sinha head of corporate communication lnt metro rail hyderabad we have with us shivalika malik senior manager pepsi co and dr subhi chaturvedi phd iitd chief corporate and public affairs officer at zupi and moderating this session is ms josna sharma from bw business world a very warm welcome to all you ladies and josna i'm going to leave the screen to you to take the conversation forward thank you thank you kyati welcome all um so i don't know we're talking about communication and how the pandemic has sort of moved that but it the pandemic has ravaged the economy it has caused so much destruction to businesses um okay recovery is taking place the finance minister you know she uh, gave some relief packages industry experts say 9.5% is the growth the gdp growth expected this year but throughout it all i think communication is the key for brands which has kind of held us together and today we're going to focus in this discussion on how that communication has changed what has changed in it so let's start first with um, anandita let me ask how has consumer sentiment moved at all if at all during the pandemic uh well uh, thank you so much uh, and wish everyone a very good afternoon uh, so well uh, see the first one foremost thing is that uh, this is so unprecedented we never expected to happen and uh, the entire planning crisis you know the manuals and whatever communication manual or whatever we have everything went topsy turvy so uh, you know absolutely the change in uh, your uh, thinking change in your uh, you know your up approach everything you know completely changed so uh, you know to come uh, you know like the topic today how we uh, say is that you know how do we connect so the connect with consumers the approach has changed now here we know that you know we uh, for any communication for people the two main stakeholders are internal external so as we say that internal are our main brand ambassadors so they can also play an 
active active role in promoting the brand so are the external uh, stakeholders to run a business is imperative that to we keep a close watch on how the consumer is connecting with the brand so you know that is very important now uh, did the brand do this earlier they did but because of this pandemic the approach their way of looking at things that has changed you know they they are selling credibility now you know they are the humane angle being more digitally friendly you know as staying is the new going out as we all know and we don't know when is when this is going to end so you know the promoting the brand ethos of a particular com- company is very very important that would resonate for a longer time you know it has a positive influence so that it has a positive influence influence on the customer. customers behavior and uh, you know the uh, 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 what to say the accepting patterns the habits in accepting the brand and you know the shift away from physical product is in line with the increased health concerns and accessibility also in fact uh, you know uh, deloitte study pointed out that consumer concern for physical health now remains high compared to their concerns for financial health so even you know it, it though it is very very important in this time of pandemic but still it is taking Uh, you know second place so striking a balance between the competitive advantage and corporate social uh, responsibility you know more value driven decision making so that that approach has changed and uh, it has you know now consumers are more uh, they are more aware on how business is interact interacting with the stakeholders the community at large uh, the society at large so today's uh, consumers they are you know they have become more in favor of products that has been produced locally this is one and uh, that uh, there is a greater uh, you know expectation that brands should display a leadership as a process they should be the pioneers the leaders in uh, in their own way in their small way this is uh, one of the very important thing then business already they are uh, you know reeling from the pandemic need they they return to uh, re- they need to return to uh, you know a normal normalcy and of course uh, uh, you know get a hold on their revenues replenish their revenues so organization will need to work out uh, you know more how to serve more value conscious i would say health conscious uh, more more digitally um, you know digital friendly also uh, you know a consumer uh, uh, like who demands uh, purposeful brands that reflects their environmental and social values so what we have seen is that you know everything is having a human connect maybe the way we have dealt with things each and every household has taught us to do so how we did for our family you know it is just resonating with the brands and the customers also so you know need for uh, an accurate trusted and up to date data on how people feel uh, how they intend to uh, engage with brands so it's a 360 degree approach uh, you know i would say jyotsna and uh, it is see the consumer sentiment is evolving for sure no doubt about it you know as consumers feel safer they are prepared to go back to activities previously abandoned they are coming back so therefore any brand whether uh, it's I mean, any 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 sector like re- retail financial services then fmcg travel hospitality we know that everyone uh, or, i mean has faced the brunt and they are crippled in today's day so they need to capture data across all touch points you know online in store customer services and identify what consum- consumers actually will uh, respond to so uh, service experience brand innovation aligning with customer values as i said articulating them in- appropriately and truly to live with them see you know now people have become more aware they see how the brand is living up to their philosophy so uh, i feel that all you know uh, operating more ethically demonstrating a continued uh, commitment to greater sustainability because sustainability is the in thing now we have to think about and being conscious to the current sens- sensitivities also so we cannot be uh, very aggressive in a way that it hurts anyone sentiment or it is completely off sync from what the situation or uh, what the country is going through so the ability to capture uh, you know all these things i think uh, that uh, uh, you know taking this um, you know a wholesome approach and uh, 360 degree perspective of things uh, and um, yes uh, empathy i think uh, you know uh, the last session someone mentioned about empathy i fully feel that it is whether it's your internal customers or your external comes customers it is very very important yeah, yeah. so humane and purpose driven communication is what you're uh, pressing on uh, shivalika let's come to you uh, in terms of you know uh, employees 
and your uh, the brand's communication with the employees and their well-being. Would you like to say a few? Um... So, so thank you, Shoshana. And first of all, uh, a very good afternoon to all of you know all of you. Uh, so, like you did mention, and you know, Anita also mentioned about employees being the real brand ambassadors. It's very very important in terms of a brand and or a company or an organization to ensure that how you know they are the ones who are actually the real mouthpieces um, you know for for stand for for the value that you bring to the table and especially uh, what we've also seen during you know the last two years in uh, in the pandemic one and a half years that we you know faced that that how organizations have really come forth and it's become more of a people first uh, yeah. you know people first environment which is very very good to see so while uh, you know it is very important to ensure that there is a you know a, a conversation going out externally in terms of hope trust you know there is an, a conversation also that flow also going internally as well and that is something that we see across the industry across organizations and that is very very heartwarming to see. and it's very important also at this point in time uh, because what you reflect internally it genuinely comes out externally as well you know and that is what's happening at the moment Right. So uh, coming to you, uh, Indu, this shift that we're talking about, uh, do you see that it is something that's going to now become the new norm and this is going to stay and it'll be consistent throughout? What are your views on this? Definitely. Uh, see, the uncertain times are not going anywhere. We have been anyways talking about this VUCA times for quite some time and you know every brand has uh, uh, maneuvered the conversation around it. But uh, the, um, I would say the proliferation of digital and the lifetime information that people have today uh, demands that a brand reacts to it, you know, much more effectively than it used to be earlier. No more we have the monologue times, you know, people have to be spoken to, you have to take a conscious call of, you know, what do you want to stand for, what your consumers would relate to. And that conscious call helps in making it a lot more uh, realistic. So you have to have authentic communication, you know, like my friends here have spoke about uh, empathy. Your conversation has to resonate and relate with people. It cannot be like a 30,000 feet conversation that we are going to do this and that and whatever and not following it through. So that consistency in communication uh, is going to remain. And yes, employees are going to be the biggest uh, evangelist for any brands in times to come. Because uh, if there is a, a sense of pride in an individual to work for an organization and that person is putting out a, a, a kind of communication, then that goes a long way. And that paves a way for a lot more people to come in because I was just reading up yesterday only that this has been a year of maximum number of resignations globally, wherein after pandemic, people have taken a call to not work with organizations who are not caring enough. So at this time, if you have a strong employer brand and you are able to really uh, you know, already click the right chord with people. So that's going to remain with you, not with consumers, with employees, but, you know, businesses, your partnerships, everything is going to need this in future to come. Right. Coming to you, Shubhi, we were just discussing, we lost you for a bit out there, but we were just talking about how this change in communication and how this change in thinking uh, from the brand point of view is going to stay now. Um, and we've stressed on how employees are the biggest assets and that the change has happened there as well. What would you like to say about this? Jyotsna, thank you so much. And uh, I'm really happy that we're celebrating women. We're celebrating this platform. I really hope everybody's been safe and well. I congratulate E4M and the entire team from BW and the group for bringing in some of the champions and heroes to this session. So I'm looking forward to a very learning, fun, engaging session. On this really important question, the, the, you know, the discussion centered, let me take a step back and let's see a 40,000 feet view above the ground. Um, we're putting purpose at the center of all that we do, which means your employers, your employees, your investors, people who'd like to root for you, people who'd like to consume your brands are now asking for more. So when you're attracting the best talent, you know, many years ago, uh, when we grew up in the 90s, getting a job, getting a house, getting stability in life was really important. Before I came back to my corporate stint, I was teaching for five and a half years in Delhi University. And you learned some of the brightest minds in the country wanted to explore. They 
wanted to take gap years it was not a bad thing to drop a year and suddenly a new world had opened up so when you're looking at either attracting cutting edge talent or you're expecting brand loyalty from a group of young people whose gratification is instant the most important thing jyotsna that we need to look at is putting purpose in communication and at the core of central decision making processes across planning across product offerings and when you talk about this i think the most important journey is the transition from me to be so consumers are no longer making decisions you know solely on product selection uh, though we are a price sensitive market but they are assessing what does a brand say when we say that what do we mean as employees why do we choose an organization why would we not want to go to a particular fmcg brand or work with a certain other brand or work or wear a sweatshirt which talks about brand purpose what are they looking for they're looking for what the brand says what it does what it stands by let me explain this to you the support that the brands give to their beliefs to their philosophy and not just pay lip service is the question that consumers and employees and talent is asking today so harvard business review did a research study and they're saying 64% of consumers say when they connect with a brand it is because of shared value it is because of the causes that relate with them that they also want to espouse so 70% of cmos today are saying that putting purpose at the center of marketing messages is a creep priority you know the metrics have changed towards now the way we operate has changed it's not about sales it is about engagement it is about finding that authentic voice it is about giving voice and agency and purpose to your employees and saying that these are the single biggest brand ambassadors that you need remember why is this so important because we're having this conversation in a post covid 19 world where how we live how we work how we play has changed and that means you had a black swan event where there is a very low probability of that happening but it has happened and it has had a monumental impact which is not incremental it's a paradigm shift so when they say companies you know um uh, several surveys has happened and i can quote to research studies ad nauseum but 94% of companies are now expected to look at critical problems they're expected to look for climate change they're expected to be green companies they're expected to look at solutions around critical issues um shampoo uh, you know and soap companies are today talking about sustainable packaging they're talking about lowering their plastic footprint uh the brands i love to celebrate body form bumble dove microsoft you know a lot of these companies are examples of companies that are doing it right when we talk about startups you know the purpose of spacex is making space radically more accessible the purpose of zupi uh, which is a 3 year old startup that was started by iitians is putting engagement empowerment and education at the center of a rewarding and entertaining experience um when we look at research studies again if you're looking at either politics or if you're looking at policy uh solving for health right now making sure you're saving lives making sure that is not mere lip service uh health causes became the second most popular category after gender equality and advocacy around lgbtq uh, i issues so you know these are campaigns that don't just come in when there is a day to celebrate this is where uh, whether you put your money where your mouth is is important lastly you know on this specific question i believe purpose is an expression of a company's core value proposition viewing purpose as a strategy which is rooted in the company's very reason for existing and that's when we say create a brand with purpose it's not a just a good to do or a right thing to do uh, black rocks chairman larry fink sends out a letter every beginning of the year to all his investee companies where he says if you're not being able to locate your social purpose your uh, social governance strategies and your esg record you're not worth my money so increasingly both employees your investors and your consumers are going to start asking the tough questions and therefore if we look at an organization that puts 
purpose first and that designs your products and you know uh, your way of life how do you and it starts with how do you enter the employee engagement process through the very first experience when you walk into an office when you walk into the campus as a lot of startups now like to call their offices what is it that you see so this is where every aspect of how you're designing engagement will get you the best talent will get you brand stickiness loyalty and engagement and that is what we truly care for today i'll stop here for right Right. So a way of being, a way of living really is what we are going to do. So coming to you, Anandita, I wanted to also talk a little bit now about the specific challenges that were faced, um, you know, in regards to communication during times of COVID. So would yeah. you like to talk a little bit about that? Well, uh, we all know that the first and foremost thing uh, what we are facing today is, uh, you know, uh, chopping off all the marketing and promotional budgets. And uh, so this is one of the things which has badly hit us. But uh, yes, the deliverables has, I mean, they have to be there. So uh, one of the biggest challenges is definitely this, that uh, fund is a problem everywhere. Then, of course, uh, you know, the production also has, uh, you know, been uh, negatively affected. You, whatever, whatever you need to produce even your collaterals or uh, anything for the branding opportunities uh, they are being called off engagement programs uh, for any communication profession which is very important uh, that is very very important which is uh, which has taken a toll uh, then uh, you know you don't have i mean the manpower we know that uh, you know uh, uh, coming uh, coming to the uh, leg work uh, when it comes to uh, any work or uh, even the printing production or anything where all other few many businesses have uh, shut down and the people have traveled to their hometowns we don't have people to do this and uh, one of the thing uh, other than these aspects uh, one is uh, misinformation and fake news about uh, you know we know how uh, it, it is going viral now uh, no matter how much we are trying to control it so i think uh, uh, you know how uh, to combat to counter all these challenges uh, one of the most important thing that we are uh, we want to do is uh, you know being in con being consistently and continuously there you know with your customers yeah. like for us uh, you know every single i mean see we were our uh, metro rail it was shut down for about uh, more than a uh, five, you know for five and a half months but did we completely close our shop no so through our social media platforms and uh, other uh, digital uh, platforms we explored and we utilized them and we were continuously touch with the customers so basically you know to to overcome these challenges what we need to do is we have to anyhow I mean, we have to customize as per the business we are in and then be in complete con continuously touch with the customer saying that hey there we are there okay we may we may not be operating for a particular time but we are there so we know that because of the physical absence to reach out to customers uh is is very you know is being very difficult and we have faced that manpower crunch was also there but so whatever platforms we can utilize we have to do that and another thing is that you know senior management uh, coming forward and uh, being there show you know their face is very important at least for our uh, product our hyderabad uh, metro rail what we did is even the single i mean uh, once we our operation started each and every time change each and every operational updates we uh, sent uh, we uh, we have been sending we have been even if it see in other um, you know time maybe we wouldn't have used a senior management quote but here even if it was not really relevant for a press release suppose a press note but we used that uh, you know our senior management name as a spokesperson otherwise we generally do it with official spokesperson just to say that we even the small time change of even 10 minutes or half an hour or half, one hour uh, you know we are communicating the senior management is communicating that we are taking this business and our customers so seriously so all these are uh, you know this um, posing as big challenges for us and of course um, the industry you know um, I think uh, uh, you know people's pockets also uh, is a big a bit problem mainly when it goes to B two C uh, businesses. So uh, since they are not being able to uh, you know brand properly or 
go full gaga over their marketing uh, communication so uh, you know they are not maybe reaching out to people so um, as we have seen that many people have started uh, you know the other they have um, explored other uh, businesses the mergers happened and um, there are you know uh, all these things which are coming up so for us uh, the most important uh, because you see we uh, hyderabad metro rail we run 69.2 kilometers of stretch in hyderabad city with 57 stations so you can understand how big the network is and not being physically present in those uh, platforms in i mean in figuratively and um, you know literally uh, how we are not being able to get in touch with our customers which has definitely hit so another thing we have explored a lot to face this challenges is uh, you know going digital about purchasing tickets or um, you know the the cards i mean tying up with some uh, you know make my trip and sort of that so that they those gateways can be uh, utilized to uh, for passenger safety so that they don't have to stand in the queues so whatever challenges we are facing as communication team uh, uh, i think uh, we are uh, that, that that is what we uh, it has driven us to go more on the social media and website and other digital uh, platforms so slow but steady i think this situation will be there for some time and we have to really think of more innovation and innovative ways how to look at things and of course uh, the decision making uh, should be more uh, value driven for uh, sure and uh, well we any business i think not only as any business has to be resilient enough to del deliver you know against the cu customer demand and because the expectancy uh, has will be there so there comes a question of efficiency how we can counter the challenges which a communication uh, team has been facing even for newspapers see we are not being able to the print run has gone low for many uh, you know publishing houses most of them has uh, you know have, have gone online the physical paper is not uh, available and uh, so you know the, the the mass what you want to reach out to uh, as you did earlier is uh, really posing as a big problem but yeah. uh, this is i think how we should counter it so shivalika now moving to you uh, what were the key challenges in keeping consumers engaged during this time like um, anandita pointed out that you know still keeping at it keeping them engaged and getting senior management involved and you know that sort of keeping them invested in that what were the key uh, aspects that you want to highlight so uh, so jutna i wouldn't want to call them challenges per se first of all mm -hmm. i think they were you know we were stuck in all we are all stuck in a position where i think this time needed innovation and i think these are opportunities of innovation honestly if i can put this through like that and i think there are four key things that come to my mind in terms of again as communications team what we really had to do at this point uh being in an fmcg company you know myself one big thing what we saw was there was a really diverse and a dirty you know fast evolving changing marketing and messaging mix that happened so you know uh, well when the pandemic hit there was a cautious customer sentiment uh, there was a digital uptake because content consumption was happening more online than anything else uh, there were events being postponed etc but again when we were looking at digital also you know there was a lot of clutter in there because everybody was going there so how to break that clutter how to ensure that we work around the virtual environment more so uh, keeping the customer sentiments uh you know in mind ensuring that we are empathetic as well was really you know one some of the key things that we had to keep in mind and we had to be sensitive to the current environment more than anything else and therefore how to drive that messaging how to drive that mix also and uh, we seem to, to have lost your uh the audio can you hear me now jotsa we can hear her oh yeah we can hear uh, jotsa we can hear her okay so then, then it was me No, no worries, no worries at all. Yeah. So I, I was just saying that it's very, very important to adjust the marketing messages and you know and and, and overall messaging per se and where to do it was one thing. Hmm. Second was in terms of there was there's a big, big focus on the brand reputation because during especially a crisis like this, which is a you know global health crisis, uh, listening, reporting, adapting to the entire environment is very key right now because you know even the smallest mistake. 
uh, uh, in terms of anything can kind of ruin your reputation. So again, working with tact, working with empathy, ensuring mindfulness in terms of, you know, in terms of the media you're using, the forums you're using, the messaging you're having, your in-product, you know, uh, tools that you're using, all of that has been really, really important. Uh, and uh, then applying technology. I spoke about digital platforms, but more in, in, in terms of how you're also being innovative in your, you know, applying technology was important. For example, we just very recently did a campaign on Slice. Mm. And it was all about the fact that we saw that there was uh, a lot of consumer uptake in terms of online consumption. People were sitting at home. Uh, the sentiment was all the fact after the second wave of a lot of gratitude because, you know, India kind of came together and that whole resilience had to be celebrated. Having said that, what we did was we replaced the logo for Slice into an ode and into a tribute to basically give a tribute to these unsung COVID-19 heroes. But we used technology because it was just not using a particular forum. It was a cross that we wanted to go and ensure that at every platform possibly, and also ensuring that it can go online therefore to a larger audience. How can we bring that to life? And last but not the least is, the, it's very tricky of how to get the brand tonality uh, into, you know, into your fold and then yet be empathetic. For example, Pepsi as a brand is very irreverent. It's a lot of fun in that sense. And, you know, the tone has not been really celebratory in that, you know, in, during the last one and a half year. So again, we did a beautiful campaign called uh, Pepsi Salam Namaste. It was all about encouraging people to be socially distanced but yet emotionally be connected. And we also understood that, you know, while people were back home, and this was last year, People were like, you know, were, were kind of wanting that emotion, that fun, and they were getting bored as well. And I'm talking about the first wave. And at that point in time, awareness was important, but how could we do it in a more fun manner? And that's when Pepsi kind of came up with this campaign where we were just talking about how salam and namaste are basically the ways to greet each other, but be socially distant and yet be emotionally connected. So yeah. these were some of the things that, you know, kind of were, were innovation and thinking, putting your thinking hats kind of, uh, came to the forefront. So, uh, Shubhi, I'll come to you right now. Uh, we've spoken about, uh, you know, communication and digital communication and the, you know, importance of it right now, especially Shivalika. Uh, so, was there some sort of, like, also, did you see fatigue? Do you think that there's so much fatigue now because there's too much, you know, happening in that space? Uh, thanks, Jyotna. I think this is a really important question. What is it that you celebrate which is different about your brand? And that's the core of every communication, every marketing professional's mandate, right? Unique yeah. selling point, differential. Each time I, if I heard USP and I got a penny for it, I'd, I'd not, you know, look at uh, a tomorrow where you have to think about anything. When you look at uh, telling your own story, which is unique and different, and this is where the idea that are you just looking at a campaign? Are you looking at periodicity? And are you looking at your bi-monthly plan and saying, hey, I need to get two things out. That is where there will be a disconnect, which is why when we started this conversation, I said, you know, from the journey of me to we, if you're not standing up, then you will not stand out. What does that mean? For a lot of people who play safe, it's a risky proposition and they say, hey, we can look at a backlash. Uh, this is not our job to look at advocacy. It's not our job to look at you know, policy change. We're telling the story. But you have to be invested enough to know how you push boundaries. And that's where brands with purposes brands that understand empathy, brands that build the storytelling at the core of what they're doing will truly stand out. Um, having said that, Jyotsna, this is as much as a science as it is an art form. I believe there are at least five parameters that we need to be mindful of. One, if you do a campaign which celebrates richness of a product while there's a famine, you're going to get hammered. If you do a campaign where there is fear, where there are job losses um, and you want to celebrate joy, you're going to be in trouble, which is why we say that as communicators, it's very important that you yourself read newspapers, you're aligned with what is happening, you're topical and you're relevant. 
to be able to do that um, and not just say we'll be about moment marketing. So if something's happening and you run a digital campaign and, you know, like festivals, a lot of brands would do that and they want to ride on the momentum. Then there will definitely be a me too phenomena. But when I say it's a science, uh, these are the five things that I mean by it. You have to look at geographies. A lot of companies in mature geographies will focus on collective values. They'll focus on shared experiences. Uh, you have to look at product categories where when you look at utilities, purpose will be less utility and the experience. So if you're looking at a cleaning agent or you're looking at a detergent, um, there are some notable campaigns like Daag Achche, which rings a bell that gives you so much happiness. But for a lot of others, it's a basic function. Kapde saaf honge ya gande rehenge. How much mm -hmm. effort will it take? What will be the impact of the you know cleaning agent on the hands of the woman who's washing these clothes, right? So offering experiences less. How much of application will you do in terms of brand and maturity. So if my purpose is building brand recall, if my purpose is building brand recognition, I'll have lesser messages. I'll have one clear message saying, great product, buy it. This is what we mean to you, right? If it's a mature brand, if people recognize you, you know, we've got fantastic brands that represent some of the most powerful campaigns today in the room, especially look at the CSR public service record of Reckon Ben Kaiser, right? So from Swatch Bharat to iconic campaigns, that's when you take that leap of faith and you change things around and you put meaning and purpose in the middle of it because you're looking at brand maturity. But very important to look at demographics. What is it that I'm trying to target? Who's going to understand my messaging, right? What is it that we want to sell? Golden rules, don't confuse the message with too many subtexts or subplots. This is not Shakespeare. You're not doing a work of art. You have to be quick. You're looking at 30 seconds. You're looking at a minute. Tell your story. Look at the demographics. Look at the appetite that they will have for something. And when I say that, don't speak only to the lowest common denominator. Our, um, you know, our young population, one of the most exposed, one of the most articulate and one of the most fantastic and savvy users. So if they know that you're faking it or this is a sham, they'll move on very quickly. So yeah. stand by the causes that you pick up. Uh, lastly, most important, look at ecosystem readiness. So what do I mean by that? It, uh, today, you know, we're all experiencing this. Uh, there are virtual courts which are taking place. We're dependent on the resilience of your network. We're dependent upon infrastructure. We're dependent upon many, many variables. Mental health is the biggest issue that we're all trying to solve for today, Jotsna. 168 children are out of schools. UNICEF is saying that for development of children today, we have taken two decades back in terms of how much of a setback the society is facing. So. Three things, very important. You have to be human. You need to humanize your statistics. You have to be clear. You have to be authentic. And you have to be creative if you want to cut through the clutter. Yeah. So activating purpose-led brands puts the traditional view that customer is a buyer to bed forever. That doesn't exist. Instead, companies will need to focus on creating loyal communities. Why is it that an Apple user will not switch loyalties? It's a brand experience. It is a cult. It is a community. So engaging them, creating value, if you have a ba bad product, no amount of storytelling can help you. So that's yeah. a given. You know, work, bringing this sense of community, giving back. When you talk about gaming, right? A lot of people said that people were scared and people were, and that's the sector, media and entertainment. This is the only sector where you've seen green shoots. If I tell you very quickly, we're doing 13,600 crores in numbers. In 2025, you're looking at an uptake of 30,000 crores. There's 700 million gamers in India. Out of that, 43% are women. These are huge numbers, you know? So if you're looking at projection, Everywhere across the world, India is now the fifth largest in terms of market share. We own 70% of all of the globe. In terms of attention, our user engagement went up to 215 hours in a day. That's not a problem, clearly. What are you solving for? So is the boy in Meerut or is the guy in Lucknow, can I be relevant, therefore, in making his life better? That's yeah. when 
create stickiness. So my digital campaigns will have to work with my CSR initiatives. They'll have to work with my social impact initiatives. And that's when I have a story that's worth telling. So our brand at Zupi uh, look, is looking at jobs of tomorrow. The WEF report, World Economic Forum, Jotsna, talks about the need to upskill at least 750 million Indians by 2030. How will you get there? Um, we're exhausted. We're learning online. This is uh, COVID. It's di disrupted schools. How do you put gaming and gamification in the middle of upskilling, reskilling, in the middle of job creation? And for that, we decided to launch the Zupi Skilling Academy. So as we speak, we're training young people in the uh, uh, you know marginalized communities, in slums, in areas which have been less fortunate. We are giving them digital skills. We are giving them training in retail and purpose-driven marketing. That's where you're truly making a difference. Yeah. That person right. will give their life for your brand, for the experience. And that's when you take an experience which is about mental health, which is about joy, which is about casual entertainment. And you make it relevant and say, how do I make learning fun while staying true to my brand purpose? So right. you know, looking at preparedness, looking at making sure where there's uncertainty, how can you see results? And that's where you cut through the clutter and you say, hey, we're here to stay. And this is a brand that actually makes a difference in my life. Right. Well said. Um, well, I'm running out of time. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to come to each one of you and we'll do uh, your summing up remarks. So let me go to Indu first. Uh, Indu, if you'd like to add anything to that, or we can just go to you and you can give us some summing up remarks your key trends that you uh, see, all of that. Sure, I'm, I'm really happy when Subi mentioned wreck it I've, I've been there for four years, research research. Yeah. So there was a sense of pride when there was a conversation about that. But um, <clears throat> I would say I would do a mix of, you know, what I want to say and, you know, what are the remarks. Yeah. But, um, you know, there's a saying which, uh, you know, uh, I would say for me, it summarizes all of this. People don't really buy what you do. They are buying why you do it. That why is very, very important. And that why is your purpose. Hence, for me, I would say purpose is the umbilical cord, which is really connecting a brand to the consumer. So what you feed through this umbilical cord is going to bolster your relationship. And that's what you're going to carry with, within your relationship for times to come. And broadly, if we have to really look at, you know, for me, I always say there is an A, B, C of purpose communication. So for me, the A stands to be authentic. You know, any story which is real, which is not fake, is going to relate to people. Second is believing. First of all, you need to believe what you're saying. A lot of times, you know, I see a communicator doing a story and which is why your pitches are not those so strong or you're not able to put out the right kind of communication. Because you do not know, you know, what's really happening behind this. C yeah. is consistency. You know, it's, it's scientifically proven that humans don't, you know, remember things only once told to them. So mm -hmm. it has to be spoken again and again with creative ways, you know. So when we did, uh, and I'm going back to my previous employer, and when we did, you know, the TikTok challenge of people uh, being shown or participating in how do you wash hands, it was uh, engaging consumers, it was passionate, it was fun, it was creating awareness. So it ticked all the right boxes. So hence the medium that you choose, the message that you choose, you know, your call to action, what we in comms, we call it CTA, the powerful CTAs, engage consumers. And, you know, uh, in the end, uh, purpose communication humanizes a brand. You can only have a relationship with a human Hence, if you really want to have a relationship with your consumers, be a human brand, have a face, have a personality. And, you know, that is going to stick with you. Right. Shivalika? Hi. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Great. So, uh, I think I'm just going to keep it to the fact that, you know, uh, especially, particularly in times of a crisis, you know, consumers' interaction with the company is all about uh, triggering trust and loyalty. One little thing here and there kind of just takes it away. 
And given in this situation, it's very, very important, like Indu mentioned, how do we engage with consumers? How, how do we also ensure that we not only engage, but how do we engage with empathy, care and concern? So that's really important in today's time. Um, you know, also understanding con consumer sentiments and what we at PepsiCo kind of have seen, especially in these last one and a half years is hope, trust, fun. They've been our key pillars in the sense because, you know, as a consumer, we need, we need hope. As an individual, we need hope, trust. You need to trust each other. And the fact is that there is fun required. There is that little element required which can basically make you feel more celebratory, more alive in that sense. Another thing that I want to talk about is the fact that, you know, all brands at this point in time or organizations, they need to know their target audience. But plus, they just know they don't need to just be mouthpieces in terms of coming up with stepping up a message. They also need to basically ensure that there's action to it. So when you're talking about purpose, then you need to be purposeful first. You need to obviously reflect that. For example, if you, you know, for PepsiCo, the key thing is winning with purpose. But the fact is, if during the pandemic in both, you know, or any other situation, if we are not being purposeful, we're not thinking about the environment, we're not going out and, you know, helping the communities in need, then it's, all a waste. And that's exactly what we do. We, we we action it as well. And the last thing is that I think, again, effective communication is not only important externally, it's very, very important internally. And being humane, being empathetic, have showing concern, being purposeful, all these are basic pillars to ensure that we, we, we actually say and do what we really mean. So yeah, that's pretty much what I have to say here. Anandita, closing remarks from you. Okay, so here, I mean, we have spoken enough about uh, communication and brand. I would uh, sl I mean, sl uh, talk about the awareness, quickly on the awareness part, uh, part of something, you know, the communication, whatever we are doing it, is it only, should we only stick on to what we want to communicate or the, uh, you know, peripheral surround that we have to see? Suppose Atma Nirbhar Bharat is a fantastic initiative, but what are the things we need to do for that? What is ease of doing business? Where India ranks in, uh, you know, doing business now by World Bank. It is in 63rd position. What are the parameters to start a business, to continue a business? Uh, what are the, you know, there are six, seven parameters, how to, uh, you know, end a business. So when we are, uh, you, you know, uh, harping on the point that we have to be uh, self-resilient and self-sufficient. So what are the facilities available around? So it is just an example. Basically, I want to say whatever the product is, uh, uh, with the communication about the product, I think the peripheral awareness is very, very important and also uh, coming to uh, you know someone already said that yes uh, all communication uh, you know, it, it has to reach to every level that is true for some products but some products you have to have a clear segment you know so it, it has to reach to those particular customers and also some products we have seen a very established uh, jewelry brand uh, they have come to a strong CSR messaging but then again the when the CSR messaging what is it about now it, is it about uh, promoting, uh, you know, uh, uh, like women education? Okay, fine. Then it's okay how you promote it. But when a very established, uh, you know, a brand ambassador uh, wears a very ordinary village, uh, you know, dresses up like a villager and goes to withdraw pension, we have to think, does it really click what we uh, want to get? Because then the, we, we, we cannot match the two personalities, you know, that product, uh, mm -hmm. what the messaging should be and the person who's doing it. No one believes that. So I think, you know, we have to make a total balance. We have to go with a total balanced approach in our uh, communication so that uh, the product itself become a, a brand in itself. If you see, it's very funny to say, but, uh, you know, 90% uh, of our domestic help, when they need to uh, use a washing powder, they say, Ma Madam, serve de DJ. Whatever, irrespective of the brand, it is serve for them. Yeah. Or for many uh, children, when you want to have a chocolate, they will say Cadbury, irrespective of the brand. I'm sorry uh, for people who are in that brand. So this is the, uh, you know, resonance, what we are looking for with effective communication and awareness. I think these two things need to have a good I mean uh, an effective marriage for uh, you know uh, in, in days to come and also with a purpose as everyone has said human uh, approach uh, with very um, you know to live by the philosophy by the brand and of course a very uh, uh, you know a messaging that will 
you know keep in my you know keep uh, will be in people's mind for a longer longer time for them to be an established brand right so should we back to you and then jyotsna thank you um you know a lot has been said and uh, but not everyone has said it um it's it's a sheer joy for me to listen to everyone and these are champions and heroes for me uh, what is amazing is when you bring women into the room you're not just looking at profitability you're also looking at user centricity brands yeah. that obsess about what is it that will truly make a difference in the lives of their users and when i say stakeholders i mean your employees i mean people who are associated yeah. with you in every shape form and purpose of the way um 70% of all people surveyed in the latest edelman's trust barometer talk about putting trust at the core of what brands are doing how can you build trust if you're shamming it if you're telling a story and if you're doing a campaign that's peripheral um i believe there are six very very clear metrics that drive this arrow to a higher level of trust so if you're disingenuous you're going to lose out if you're commercially motivated you're going to lose out if you're are opportunistic especially in a world where it is fraught with uncertainty and human tragedy the with the kind of proportion that we've never seen before you're going to lose out if you're only branding motivated uh, let me look at a transactional opportunity and plug my brand there mindlessly you're going to lose out when you start gaining is when you are csr centric when you really care about your community and when you're purpose led so brand purpose needs to go above and beyond being an expression of a statement that you put out in your annual report it has to be a core value proposition it needs to address societies like uh, greta thunberg said you have to respond to the environmental situations like your house is on fire and believe me friends who are on the call today our house is on fire so if you don't care about the environment if you are not focused on the positive potential impact of the company that is creating products day in and day out uh you will get knocked off sooner than later and that's where covid 19 um jotsna and i'm going to end very quickly on this um brand focus and purpose have been married like never before companies have had to move away from differentiating their products and they're joining hands with the government they're joining hands with networks so creativity collaboration and curation and finding common minimum points of interest with partners from your own sectors who've been your competitors is the way forward if you truly want to purpose and if you truly want to build a brand that stays and that truly is at the heart of your consumers and your business thank you so much for this opportunity i've really enjoyed this conversation thank you so be humane be purposeful thank you ladies this was very informative thank you for your time and thank you for speaking to us that's a thank you so much and wish everyone all who are there and stay safe yeah, please take care stay safe and be connected Absolutely. thank you be connected yes thank, thank you thank you. thank you so much so i'm going to hand this back to my colleague uh, mr bhatia yeah unfortunately khyati got stuck i think there is a drop back so i'll take over for some minute because this is a women conference women like to stay out for some time <laughs> Oh, we, we love our men, Karan. They're more than welcome. Otherwise, yeah, we yeah. <laughs> the converted, no. and especially when they speak good things about us. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and you are celebrating women, so you definitely need to share the stage with us for a little while. For sure. Right. Absolutely. Yes. So we also have. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, thanks sir, for your lovely session. It was really thought provoking. I was watching it, and uh, we look forward to see you more. We'll keep engaging. Thank you. So Bye. moving Bye. over Good. to our next panelist. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Josna, for amazing Thank moderation. So moving you. on to our next panelist, we have uh, <coughs> Miss Phoebe Seggins, who is the Chief uh, Operating Officer for Little Black Book. Welcome, Phoebe. Can you hear us? Hi. Um. I think. Hang on. My video is on. One second. Okay. I think now you can start on your camera. Oh, Hello. There you are. Hi. Hi, so nice to see your face. <laughs> Same here. I hope everything is fine in UK. So, <clears throat> Phoebe, uh, uh, she'll talk about the topic: break the glass ceiling, put on different shoes, and get ready to make yourself uncomfortable. Uh, a little brief description at five two. Phoebe Siggins has spent uh, a lifetime in platform shoes and trainers. 
but this talk isn't about uh, retaining her feet after a year lockdown wearing slippers it's about confidence like many women it's one of the things pb wishes she had more of a as a young person <clears throat> sorry my my bad something uh, she recognized women is more of in order to move forward in their career quickly and regardless of gender Phoebe Siggins gained her position as a chief operating officer of global marketing and news platform Little Black Book at the age of 28. Phoebe joined uh, uh, Little Black Book PR arm LLB Lab in uh, 2014 as a PR accounts manager. In uh, just two short years, she was running the entire department and has supported over 10th uh, fold growth in its clients ba uh, clients base during her lifetime at the business. So, we're a very warm welcome to you, Phoebe. such an honor uh you know uh, reading about you and we've been interacting a lot so i'll pass it on to you and you know you can just share your presentation or anything you want to share with our audience amazing over to you thank you thank you so much um i i wanted to take to actually start off by thanking you all for taking the time to listen to me speak today um when i first was approached by um current and exchange for media i um or to talk on the topic of breaking the glass ceiling i was so humbled to be asked to speak uh in front of uh, so many business leaders and incredibly successful people in the field of pr today um so what i would like to talk to you a little bit about is my experiences so far um Uh, as as uh, you've just heard i'm the chief operating officer and head of pr at uh, little black book um some may know it as lbbonline.com um so doing a talk this way is fairly new to me i tend to be the interviewer as opposed to the interviewee i'm normally crafting talking points and thought leadership for other people rather than myself um So at the times that I speak in public it's normally in front of a live audience most of whom I can see all their lovely faces so please excuse my fresh approach to this it's it's a bit new to me um but uh I I hope you enjoy it so um today what I'd like to talk about two things I really believe have carried me through right from my school years and education up to the point of taking on uh, a more senior leadership role um in 2020 um and those two things uh, are are putting myself in uncomfortable positions and uh putting on different pairs of shoes uh and when i say that it's not because i'm 5 foot 2 and i love wearing a platform heel this is actually in the metaphorical sense about building confidence and understanding other people and uh, i'll tell you why so when i told my friends i'd be speaking on the topic of women in leadership and breaking the glass ceiling they all nodded to to one thing you should talk about imposter syndrome um perhaps embarrassingly i hadn't heard of it but i obviously quite often had the signs of it written all over my face i feel at least six different people maybe told me the exact same thing so for anyone like me who wasn't familiar with the phrase um imposter syndrome refers to a psychological pattern in which an individual doubts their skills talents their accomplishments and has this kind of internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud or not feeling like they deserve to be where they are so as i looked into this i found a study by kpmg um from 2020 that found over 75% of female executives felt that they had experienced this at some point in their career and i could certainly count myself amongst them um and as i started to think this is something i also hear so much from my own clients and female business leaders that i work with it is a daily conversation so having started to research this i uh the topic immediately threw me back to a panel series i've been running um for one of my clients basically this panel brings together um senior heads of production from across the USA um to talk about their their experiences and on these panels we always ask one bonus question right at the end to to everyone who we're speaking to um and that question was always if you could go back in time to when you were 10 years old and could tell yourself one thing what would you tell yourself so 
across that series, I found men and women answered this question very differently. Um, and on one of the panels in particular, I found myself together with um, three really forging successful female heads of production. And they all said the exact same answer unprompted. I would have told myself to be more confident. I would have told myself to believe in myself and my abilities and to not worry about what people thought of me so much. And in all honesty, this is something I, I, I had in my head the whole time. It would have been my answer too. And the more um, I started to, to think about this, I realized that building up my confidence has been so important to my progression in the field of PR and communications and, and essentially breaking this, this glass ceiling. Um, but I found the incredibly frustrating thing about confidence is it's not an academic skill. It's not something people teach you in school or something you can easily teach others. It's, it's not something you can buy for yourself or gift to anyone else. Um, it's not something you can easily acquire without making big changes to the way that you think and act personally. Um, it's also one of the things I really believe men and women experience quite differently. Um, I still wouldn't call myself an extrovert today. Um, I know I've come a long, long way from the kind of nervous doubter that I, I used to be. Um, and whilst I can't offer up a, a kind of silver bullet solution to a lack of confidence or imposter syndrome, I do believe two things that have helped me go from that complete wallflower to where I am today um, was, as I mentioned earlier, putting myself in other people's shoes, learning from them and making myself uncomfortable. So in order to, uh, I guess, explain myself, I really feel I probably have to first put you in, in my shoes. So I grew up in the 1990s uh, in a big seaside town in the UK. Um, I'm incredibly lucky to be able to say I had wonderful, supportive and creative parents who never imposed any gender bias on, on me or my brother. Um, primary and secondary education was free, compulsory, accessible to all children. And uh, the kind of thought that was ingrained into us was that if we, if we worked hard, the, the sky was the limit. Um, and that was something that just stuck with me that, that the moment I got into school, I loved learning and I, and I pushed myself towards that. I, I wanted to achieve. Um, and at age 10, uh, my teachers recommended that I take a test um, to an entry test to one of our state run grammar schools. Um, again, this was something that was free and accessible to all children. So I, I was incredibly lucky to get the opportunity to do it. Um, and I ended up going to one of the, the top achieving schools in the borough, uh, South End High School for girls. So academically at this point, I had no doubts about my abilities in regard to my gender. Um, if anything, being at this all girls school, it, it kind of reaffirmed to me that, that my gender wouldn't hinder my results. It, it may actually improve them. So um it's funny because there must have been something a bit in the water in the early 90s in in my home county of Essex uh, as we were we were often told we were one of the highest achieving school year groups the area had produced um and teachers would often mention how the girls were outperforming the boys um which you know was often celebrated because it, it was rare but outside of school I, I'd grown up with a brother, male cousins, a lot of family friends who also happened to be boys. Um, so I was quite often in male company, but I was starting to notice at this point in time the, the rifts in our levels of so, social confidence, um, especially as I worked my way through secondary school. Um, I kind of feel a growing amount of curveballs being thrown my way uh, that, that simply didn't bother my brothers or my cousins. and other people that I knew. So I kind of actually at this point say I thank my lucky stars that I didn't grow up in the age of Instagram. Um, I think in the, the 90s and 2000s magazines and TV were kind of enough to rock my perspective on my body image, how I should act and uh, you know what limited options might lay ahead for, for, for women, especially if you wanted a, a family later in life. So I guess this is when I first started becoming aware of what the glass ceiling was. 
um, perhaps not so much uh, under that phraseology, but, but the fact that no matter what grades I got, there was going to be some barriers to, to achieving what I wanted to achieve. So um, despite the fact I was doing well academically, my confidence started dropping through the floor. Um, definitely during secondary school, I, I just wasn't comfortable conversing with people who weren't my close friends or family, or they weren't in my age group. I, I'd become very insular. Um, but I'd also started to cotton on to the fact that when I entered the real world, my safe bubble of being at a smart girls school with good grades was gonna burst quite quickly. So by the time I got to the end of my fifth year, I realized I had a decision to make. Um, even if I continued to work really hard, that lack of confidence was gonna start holding me back in my next stages in life. Getting a job, applying to uni, starting a career would all be much more difficult for me. So how could I stop this? Um, as I mentioned earlier, I, I couldn't learn confidence from anyone else. I couldn't buy it. I had the realization I was going to have to completely change my mindset and my immediate environment in order to do it. Um, I had to put myself in an environment I didn't feel comfortable. Um, and essentially I wanted to be ready for the boys club of the working world that all women kind of told me about. So I took the leap to move to a sixth form at the boys grammar school. So um, these schools, uh, the sixth forms tend to be mixed at the, the grammar schools. Um, but just to give you some context, there are about 150 uh, pupils in my new school year. Um, less than one third of these were female. Um, it, it was a different part of town altogether. And I knew only two people there, but in my mind, it was something that could potentially mimic a working environment of the future. So the first day I walked in there, I was absolutely terrified. Um, I often get these kind of vivid flashbacks of walking into our common room at break time on the first day of school, looking in the room, realizing there was no one I knew in there, turning on my heel and walking straight back out and hiding in the toilets. Um, I, I thought I would never be able to speak to anyone, um, really thinking I'd made a huge, huge mistake and I'd left this comfortable environment where I was gonna uh, get the best grades I could, I could get. Um, but I had to tell myself there was no way of backing out. I, I put myself here for a reason. And I had to come up with a way to work out how to interact with new people. So I started putting myself in their shoes. Um, I'm sure you can imagine what a group of teenage boys are like who suddenly have 50 girls thrown into what was previously an all boys environment in which they were already familiar and confident. Um, testosterone flying all about the place. Um, they were vying for our attention and trying to prove who was the most dominant. Often that translated into banter, which kind of sometimes would scare or upset most girls. Um, but by detaching myself from the words coming out of their mouth and putting myself in their shoes, I noticed one thing very quickly, a kind of overly defensive reaction to their comments and jokes only fed their desire to kind of be more cutting. Getting upset was helping prove that dominance. So what I realized was in fact, they wanted to be challenged. They were also all very smart boys and they appreciated someone who could speak to them on their level. So I kind of sat back and observed, what do these people find interesting? What makes them embarrassed? What commonalities do we have? How can we have an engaging conversation with each other? So little by little using that approach, I began to get more comfortable being somewhere completely different around people who acted completely different to what I was used to. Um, and I began to make some really great friends, friends that I'm, I'm still happy to say very close to um, today. And when I look back, making that change is something that I can point to as something that, that started to get me where I am today. I realized at that point that confidence can be earned. Um, and that I had to recognize when I needed to try new things that were outside of my comfort zone. So this combination approach is, is what I believe I've used ever since to try and take step forwards in my career. Um, 
if I fast forward slightly, I, I then studied history of art at the University of Warwick. Um, having creative parents, I've always had an interest in how um, the creative world uh, collided with social and cultural history. Um, something that has become hugely valuable to my career now. It's you know I, I get to thrive on this because I speak to I get to speak and hear from business leaders all day long who who who, who bring these two elements together to create amazing campaigns. So. I guess at this point, alongside trying to develop my social confidence, I was still working incredibly hard academically. Um, I came out with a first class degree and it, this was the academic pinnacle I'd been gunning for since those teachers first told me to take the entry exam to grammar school. Um, I thought this would open many, many doors that these teachers had promised me. Um, and, and, and to, in my mind, I felt it proved that as a woman, I, I wasn't at a disadvantage academically. But um, alas, when I left university, um, we were coming out the back of a quite steep recession in the UK and there just weren't graduate jobs about. Um, at this point, I still wasn't confident enough to, to, to get through the interviews, the, well, the few interviews that, that I had. And what I had to do was still um, earn my keep at home. I, I didn't come from a wealthy family. I had to, um, you know, pay for my social life, pay for my food, pay for my accommodation. And I kind of just took whatever part-time jobs came my way in order to do that. Um, and it wasn't until a year later that I was able to get an unpaid internship at a small healthcare startup in London, um, using kind of some of the funds that I'd saved to, to, to cover the travel costs. Um, it wasn't the creative field that I hoped for, uh, but once again, I knew I was gonna have to try something different if I wanted to move forward. Um, and at this point, I was obviously so grateful they gave me the opportunity when, when no one else would. Um, and actually this uncomfy moment turned into a very happy accident. Um, this job at Network Locum, which is now known as Lantern in the UK, it, it paved the way for my current role. Um, the CEO, Melissa Morris, uh, was a former McKinsey consultant and she was only a few years older than I was. Um, I was kind of in awe of the fact that she had secured investor funding for a business that would support what I always saw as one of British, uh, Britain's greatest institutions, um, our National Health Service. Um, and after a year uh, of part-time jobs post uni, I, I was desperate for a chance to prove myself, especially to this incredibly, um, this just this amazing, this amazing woman. So she, she took a chance on me, uh, uh, just, uh, despite the fact I, I kind of knew nothing about medicine, doctors, the systems behind the NHS. Um, so what I did was I just I threw myself into the research and talking to as many GPs, practice owners, anyone they would they would put me in front of. Um, obviously, at this point, something I was I was still very very nervous about. I didn't want to trip up. Obviously, these are highly educated people in a field that I, I knew nothing about, but I knew I had to learn. So I had to get over my fear of speaking to them and, and again, find that common ground that, that would help me learn. So um, I have to mention at this point, obviously, despite running this forging and incredibly busy startup, I'd have to thank Melissa and her team because they personally took the time to train me in how that business worked from top to bottom. Um, it was everything from the sales and marketing that I was hired for in the internship to customer management, website development, funding proposals, digital marketing, reporting, business development, clinical governance, and um, their teaching and, and, and my kind of drive to learn meant I went from an unpaid intern to a full-time communications manager after just one month and it was one of the greatest starts I, I could have possibly had and it, it's still something that 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 feeds my knowledge and my approach to, to my job today. So then uh, the job arose at LBB in 2014 for a junior PR account manager. Um, 
And when I saw the role, I could just see the culmination of all of these amazing skills I had been learning in the industry. Um, the skill, like in, in the place that I'd always wanted to work in, in advertising, communications, media and production. And despite the fact that I loved and admired my current colleagues, that I'd been swiftly promoted and that the business I was in was clearly moving towards bigger things. Um, I just couldn't pass up the opportunity to sidestep into the creative industries. So I guess once again, my goal was to learn as much as I could about a completely new industry to me. And this is where putting myself in people's shoes really began to make a difference. Um, the unique thing about LVB Lab is that the PR agency was born out of its news platform. So unlike anywhere I had ever worked before, I had this incredible global resource at my fingertips, something that could provide me with all the teaching on who's who and what's what that I ever needed to know. And what struck me about it was that it gave everyone a voice from junior to senior, from post-production to brand marketer. I could get into the minds of anyone in the business, something that I knew up to at this point would, would help me get ahead. So despite not having done PR before, I realized quickly that the first thing you have to get to grips with is who your clients really are, who their customers really are, and what's interesting about them. I'm sure it's a given for most of you listening today that the first thing you need to do is to get to know your client's business, their audience, and the media that you're working with inside and out. Um, but I believe there's another level to all of this. Um, what are the extraneous factors that might affect the way that those clients or journalists interact with you and the audience that they're trying to reach? Um, I always think one of my biggest pieces of advice for other young people or for leaders who are supporting young staff is that when you're a woman and, and grappling with a fear of imposter syndrome or a lack of confidence, um, working with business leaders who are your clients but who are people that you've admired for a long time that you look up to that you want to be in and 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 learn from it can be so hard to take a step back and realize that they might be just as eager to hear your thoughts perspective and your advice about your field as you are to theirs so I guess for me, being able to put yourself in their shoes isn't just a case of knowing what their business does and what goals they need to hit. It's about being able to anticipate what them and their customers want and need along the way and also um, give yourself the confidence to give your best advice. So as I moved throughout my career, I, I recognize it was just as important to learn from your colleagues and, and, and bosses too, to, look, to learn from their experience. Um, when I joined, and they still are, half of our team were journalists working on the news side of LBB. Um, and they could actually put me in the headspace of anyone I was pitching to in, in the wider trade media. Um, and the CEO, Matt Cooper, he was in fact the kind of real life um, walking little black book who seemed to have worked with anyone and everyone in the business. So their knowledge is something that still keeps me moving forward today and still something I do every day to try and understand my clients and this, this business more. Um, I guess at this point, it would also be remiss of me not to mention that I couldn't have learned so much and moved so quickly in my career at LVB had it not been for the support of Matt Cooper. Um, he's never let age, gender, race or sexuality kind of blind him from people's ability. He has taught and nurtured every single one of us on his team with this kind of passionate and encyclopedic knowledge. Um, and for this, I, can, I know I can say I'm one of the very lucky and fortunate few to have had such great role models to learn from. Um, as a parting thought, uh, I believe breaking the glass ceiling is about keeping it broken and keeping it open for the people coming up through the ranks. Um, from the same report I mentioned earlier conducted by KPMG, they found that when asked which dynamics within the workplace were most valuable to help reduce feelings of imposter syndrome, 47% said having a supportive performance manager and 29% said feeling valued and being rewarded fairly helped combat that lack of confidence. 
When it came to running my own team, I wanted to give back some of the wonderful support, advice, teaching and insight that I've received over my career. I've perhaps found this is where uh, putting yourself in other people's shoes is most important. Um, I mean, it's a well-known fact that employees are more productive and happy when they feel empowered, when they feel that they are on a forward trajectory, that them and the business they are in is going somewhere. Um, in order to put them on that path, I think you have to be able to put yourself in their shoes. You won't know how to make them feel empowered if you don't know what empowerment looks like to them. You need to understand what type of trajectory they want to be on and help them get up to that speed. You need to work out how they learn best and how to keep them going because it is so, so different for everyone. Um, and I think for me is, is always keeping in the back of my mind the, the confidence hurdles I've overcome and, and, and helping others to do the same. So if you do one thing to help your confidence or the confident, confidence of others, I think you need to pull on a different pair of shoes. Thank you. Thank you, Phoebe. That was wonderful. And I am sure that, uh, you know, a lot of these young girls who are watching you right now are getting inspired uh, with your story. I have a few questions quickly I want to ask you. Um, you've been a female leader who's revered and respected. What do you think are potential challenges and opportunities that lie ahead for future leaders? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I'd love to say that, that these challenges will uh, the challenges that we all face now will be less for the, for the next generation. But when you look at the stats in terms of how slow our industries are moving towards gender parity, it's, it's frightening, really. And actually, I can't remember where I read it, but more recently, there's a lot of evidence to show that the pandemic has decelerated in like the, the recent um, <laughs> progression that, that women in business had made. So, um, I guess the biggest challenge will be to keep, uh, I think, keep moving forward and, and learning how to accelerate that process to, to give women more opportunities, to make them feel more confident and to, um, I think, yeah, just speed things up. <laughs> Um, also, Phoebe, you worked in diverse organizational setups. So what cultural difference that you observed as world becomes closer and there's like diverse uh, workforce in almost every organization now? So would you like to share some anecdotes from those? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, for me, and I, I know this is, there's evident, a lot of evidence to support the more diverse businesses you work in, the more creative they become, the more successful they become. And like I mentioned, I've been so fortunate to work in two places which have been incredibly diverse. And I think that the progress of those businesses speak for themselves. If you have diverse people within the business, you, you, you get more success and, and you get it quickly. Um, so, and yeah, I mean, there's countless amazing people that I've worked with and actually day to day, the, the thing I enjoy most about my role is that I get to speak to people from all over the world, from all different backgrounds. And it's not just my own team that I get to experience and learn from. It, it, it's everyone in this industry. And, and that to me is, I think, gives you that beautiful, well-rounded approach and, 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 and ideas. Absolutely. There is another question, which is about the global PR communication scenario and how women are leading the bandwagon, as we all know, since LBB is widely covering global market. What has been your experience in terms of the global PR scenario, communication and PR? So and, and do you mean that as a woman or or just? Uh, yeah, so I, I think for me, actually, it, it's been funny because a lot of the people that I work with in communications, like you're saying, they are women um, and they are, uh, you, you see you see it a lot. So globally as well, most of the global heads of comms that I work with at agencies or marketing or in production companies, like you're saying, they're all women. So for me, that there's been role models there throughout my, throughout my career. But the one thing um, I think, I guess the biggest challenge is, is, is keeping it fresh. And I, I sometimes experience the fact that some women who have, have been through a lot in their careers and have overcome this huge adversity is that 
it seems they sometimes find it difficult to not pass that down to the next generation. I think it's for, for global female PR leaders, I think no matter what you've been through, it's about open, like not having to put that down to the next generation. It, it's making their path easier and, and, and um, yeah, not lumbering them with any of the, the things you might have had to go through yourself. Thank you so much, Phoebe. It's been a real pleasure to hear your story and to let all the females and the younger girls, especially entering the industry, know that how a real imposter syndrome is, how important it is to overcome it and develop your own confidence in the world of PR mm -hmm. and communication. Uh, Karan, Thank, you. Would you like to say Thank you, Phoebe. It was great having you. Look forward to have more engaging conversation and in other events as well. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much for inviting me to speak. I'm incredibly humbled and a bit like that imposter syndrome. I didn't quite believe I'd be invited. So um, oh, absolutely. Look, look forward to and have a nice trip. Take care. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank, you. Thank you so much, Phoebe. With that, without wasting any time, we're going to move straight to our next panel discussion, which will talk about success or failure, our prerequisite for personal growth. We have esteemed panelists on this session. We have Ashkin who's uh, the personal branding and Instagram marketing expert, Ashkin Pro. We also have Amay Polikar, journalist, political analyst. We have RJ Jini Mahajan from Radio City. We have Komal Lutt, from, uh, who's the founder of Tute Consult. And moderating this session is Mr. Sudhir, Mr. Sudhir Mishra, founder and managing partner, Trust Legal. A very warm welcome. I'm going to check on our... Yes, other panelists as well, requesting all of you to please switch on your cameras and mics and join us on screen. And Sudhir, over to you to take the conversation forward. Uh, thank you, uh, Kathy. How are you? And uh, it's a pleasure to moderate this panel. I'm a lawyer, but uh, I know why uh, Anurag wanted me and Karan wanted me to come for this panel. Uh, the reason is uh, I have gone through many successes and failures, and maybe there is a story behind it. But uh, uh, I'm a I'm a great believer in women power. Most of my law firm have a majority of uh, women working from partners to associate to senior associate. And uh, that has been my journey. I'm always very uh, guided by their intuition about their energy and their positivity. So it's a, it's a privilege to be here, moderate a, such an important panel. Uh, Guinea, I have been hearing you on Radio City. All of us uh, know you very well. What, you, what kind of positive stories you talk about. You talk about challenging stories all the time. Komal, I know about your work also. And uh, that is something. And Akshin, am I pronouncing it correctly? Akshin? Yeah, your name, Akshin. Akshin. Yeah. So, so, so welcome you all in this. And the topic, is, uh, the topic is very, I don't know who thought about it, but it's very interesting. Success or failure are prerequisite for personal growth. I think uh, all of us, I come from a small town and uh, uh, I had mostly my 10th and 12th almost under the tree in, in place in Bihar, uh, which is called Sivan. Uh, it's almost like a village, a very small town. And uh, came to Delhi University, did my graduation and uh, later became a Fulbright scholar, became a lawyer. Now I'm a door tenant in London in, uh, in the Attorney General of the United Kingdom's chamber also run my practice out of India. It has been a very torrid journey for me. I have seen a uh, lot of failures uh, in early part of my life. And honestly speaking, uh, I was not knowing that failures also teaches you something. But uh, if I look back uh, when I'm 50, I can surely tell you that I feel that my failures, whether it's an interview of IS in 98 or uh, some bigger failures in course of my court litigation, uh, they taught me so much. Uh, they were much bigger teacher to me than whatever success or small success or big success uh, as a professional I got. So I was very excited about uh, this uh, topic. And I will start with uh, Guinea, you, because you will set us a uh, tone for this conference. Uh, what do you think about this topic? What comes to your mind? Also, uh, I'd like to say I'm very complex talking to you because you just told me what all you've done. And I'm like, where is the failure in that? This is all super success. But, um, but I think I can talk a lot about failures because I think my life has been a series of failures and every time a failure has come. Mm -hmm. And I've thought that this is it. Life is quite over. It's actually given me a new direction to move in life. 
So um, failures teach you a lot, but also I like how they've said success and failures both are equally important because inevitably we talk about failures, but success is very important for people to actually have faith in you, for you to know that you're going down the right path. Good evening to everybody out there. I'm sure that all of you are extremely successful people. And I do believe that for everybody who's extremely successful, they've had to have some major failures come their way. I also think that those people are very, very lucky who at the age of 10 or 12 from a small town or a big town can actually sit down and chalk out their life and their life goes like that. I wish, I, I don't know anybody like that in my life. And I think that those people would be supremely lucky. Baki sabke saath, we start taking a route and then you have a failure, you have a cross sign and then you got to change direction completely and go down a different route. My route was, um, I was going to be a very successful corporate person. I wasn't going to do anything related with media or anything. And, you know, I had it sorted. I wanted to do an MBA. I knew the institute I was going to do an MBA from. I cleared the return and this is it. Life was going to be set. Then the interviews happened. Something went wrong. And um, this was my first biggest failure story. Throughout school, I think I'd been an above average student. I didn't know what failure was. I come from an army background. Uh, I was shifting every three years. So life had taught me to be on my toes very fast. But I think not getting through that MBA exam was my biggest, biggest failure. And I thought life had ended. I went into a series of really bad decisions and decided to go into a shop and start selling stuff there, which was horrifying for my parents. One who was an army colonel, the other who was an established doctor and their daughter who is relatively successful is going to a store to sell. But that store is where somebody once asked me to start making announcements where all of you've been to stores, right? Where you say, ek yeah. saath ek free, ya 20% discount if you're taking a 1500 saman or something. Those announcements actually led me to meeting somebody who said, we're from All India Radio, do you want to give us an audition? And I was like, are you serious? And that's where, you know, life completely turned. Um, another failure, I don't know if it was a failure or not, was I was working with a radio station, which was a talk radio station. I was very, very passionate about it. And I remember when Meow shut and um, I had to go back to say commercial radio. Mm. So from a 40 minute talk time, I was coming down to five minutes of talk time. And I was like, this is not my cup of tea. And I, I left radio and I decided to go down to management, which was my original goal. Mm. Realized wasn't my cup of tea and then came back to this. And again, it was a failure in terms because everybody was like, you're going up the corporate ladder. You're being stupid. You're taking a demotion of Sats. So, but well, those were decisions that I took and um, were actually forced down my throat at that point in time. But um, they shaped me into the person I was. So failure is very, very important. Yeah. Also keep you very grounded more than anything else. Yeah. And uh, before Sudhir, I go back to you. I'm going to say that success is equally important because if you don't get success, I think it's becoming a world where people judge you by your successes. People also want to judge you by what you've achieved or not achieved. It doesn't matter how much hard work's gone into it. I so I think success really matters at that time. Your awards would matter. People talking about you matters. Um, also success sort of, for me personally, I think that you'd be very successful at something that you are passionate about. Hmm. Uh, for me as an individual, I can't be successful at things that I don't feel passionately about. So I think that success was very important for me to know that this passion was well-placed. Absolutely. So, so yeah, I'll equally back, important. Yeah. I'll come back to Guinea. One very okay. important observation which I have is that when I was getting success, I was being challenged in uh, after 10 years of working for forest, wildlife and conservation, climate change, when nobody was doing that in India. I was told that this So I created a firm which is one of the largest media broadcasting law firm in the country today. And uh, if you ask me whether this gives me more happiness, happiness, of course, any success gives you. You are one of the top taxpayers. You feel pride in it. But, you know, failure is very personal. Success is universal. That is something which yes. people see, your exterior see. But failure is something which is a Sufi thing, which, which you live with. And you really internalize it. And that gives you the energy and other aspects. Success and it shapes you. Absolutely. Success it sometimes you. gives you a bigger vision and direction. Very few are lucky. And you made another very important observation that Tendulkars are very few who know that 16, that I'll become a great cricketer or one day I'll get a Bharat Ratna. People like me were not even knowing what they will do till 27, 28 actually. And everybody said, Ye karega kya So that way we are fine. Uh, what are your thoughts, Komal? How you see success? How you see failure? 
So very interesting conversations, uh, Ginny and Sudeed. And uh, I agree with Ginny when uh, you said that after hearing your career trajectory, um, I'm trying to find the failure bit in it. I'm totally, totally in tandem with her. Um, I think success is important. Let's, let's uh, absolutely agree on that. That validation is needed to be able to say, hey, you're doing okay. If you don't get that, uh, hustle is uh, a great word, but it also has its negative connotations. If you're only hustling, you need hustling with success. But I think failure, or rather setback, failure is a very heavy word. You need both sometimes to be able to learn and unlearn and relearn. And so uh, it's always uh, my way or the highway. It, it's what is it to take the road ahead and the long road ahead. Um, I use this quite often when I say like entrepreneurship, for example, is like building a flight as you jump off the cliff. Yeah. Because you don't know what you're in for. You're doing that, whether you're an intrapreneur or an entrepreneur or something who's just even attempting to do something, failure or setback is important for you to relook at dimensions of life. Because yeah. you don't know what's in store. It's like going to a menu card if you've only been served Indian, you don't know there exists a Chinese Thai Mexican food out there. You do, do need to know there's a global cuisine and a world out there. And I think that is something you learn and you step up instead of scaling up only with the time and experience. So that's my two bits on it. Wonderful. Uh, very well said. Uh, Ashkin, I will ask you that we, we three have talked about uh, success or failure, uh, which propels you more. What actually propelled you more? You are an influencer and you have such a role. Of, so just tell us what propels you more. Actually, both are very important, I can say. Because, um, okay, one example I say, uh, one hand will not climb, isn't it? So one hand is the failure, another hand is success. So when you bring together, you will hear the sound and it will be the achievement of your goal. So... Uh, I can't say that which one is more important, both are important, because uh, to fail, it means to learn. Uh, to fail, it means to grow one more step, okay? To fail, it means knowledge, experience. Uh, as more experience you have, as more you will grow. So, uh, yeah, uh, as you mentioned, uh, failures is only for yourself and success is for, uh, for everyone. It's true, uh, but uh, you know you can't just close your yourself, you know, and uh, stay alone and say that okay, I failed and that's all. I I, I never will try again. No, uh, I just want to say that we have to look babies uh, how they are trying to walk. Okay, how they are trying to stand the like uh, catching, trying finding uh, you know to stand. We are a baby when we are trying to achieve. Uh, to new goal. Uh, our new goals, uh, it's like a, um, like a baby, we have to try to do our steps. We have, uh, maybe how many times we fail? Many, yes, and never will feel discomfort that, oh, I never will try to walk. No, we have to try to walk like a baby. So to fail and to have a success, it's equal. And I wish that, yeah, now no one will fail the feelings of failure, but, uh, to, f to have the failure feelings, you have to be ready for it also, because on your journey to achieve to something, uh, there is not only, you know, just the successful um, uh, stories. You have to understand what is the behind also. You have to learn from your mistakes. Whole our life is like a huge journey that we are going through, failing and standing up and continuing. So it's a, like a long-term process that we have to go through it. Yeah. Very well said. So these are the initial thoughts. Giddy, let me tell you, I did few podcasts and I used to listen to you sometime in the evening uh, when uh, I'll switch on the radio and I have very good friends who are RJs and uh, 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 Sharath is a very good friend who, who, Sharath, uh, who does in the morning show on, um, uh, that is Red FM, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah, uh, Fever. And uh, all of them are training me on my podcast, Rahul Markin and him. So they asked me, who, who is the person whom you really want to meet? I said, I want to meet Guinea Mahat. Are so you this, serious? Thank yes, you. <laughs> I said that. And when they were four days back, and I'm saying it very uh, openly, the reason is I told Anurag, uh, he said, there is one panel. I said, I have no time because today there's a very important matter going in Supreme Court. He said, there's a panel and this is the panel. I said, I'm going to moderate that panel. How sweet. So, Thank you. So, so this I'm saying very openly. Look, um, positivity stories, success, failure. Uh, uh, Jiddan Krishnamurti has said that 
what you should practice is detachment. If you are detached from success or failure, just be indifferent to it. It's very difficult thing to do actually. That how indifferent you can be, like you watch it flow in front of you. Uh, that's what I think uh, Ashkin also tried saying that, like a baby, uh, you are doing that journey. Uh, I have actually started realizing when COVID was at its peak in the second phase. I was appearing for many hospitals before the oxygen bench in Delhi High Court. And we had this letters coming to us that shall we take a consent letter from patient because we can't provide oxygen for the next month. And I was telling them that we will not sign these letters. I assure you by four o'clock in the morning, I'll get the oxygen to your hospital. And I'm talking about large COVID hospitals like Venkateshwara. I was representing them. My son had COVID at home. My mother had COVID at home, but I was in these hospitals. Not even once it bothered me that what is going to happen. So beyond success failure, how you deal with fear, how you deal with selfishness, how much detachment you practice, ultimately will decide your success and failure uh, stories to guide you. So, uh, so coming back to you, uh, Gini, tell us, uh, you, you were a journalist also, and yes. you came in, uh, you are a positivist. You always talk about a positive side. Uh, whenever there is some question to you, you will say, or you give a very light response to it, it sometimes, which I think is what childlike, which uh, Ashkin has very rightly said, it's childlike, which everybody teaches, every religion teaches that. Tell us, what is your, what is your motivation? I don't have a motivation. I think that life is, cannot be led by being extremely negative or being extremely cynical. I think COVID was a re-realization of that. Uh, when COVID happened, especially the second phase happened, all of us, you know, I'm sure that there was a time for everybody where you got caught in the whole social media of helping for oxygen, plasma, beds. And it just went on and on. And after a point in time, you didn't know what was going on. And there was this whole nervous dread that we were all living with. And at that time, I was looking at a lot of things. And all of us were actually looking at shows which were more humor, which were lighter, which would make us feel less anxious. Because mm -hmm. as people, I think we want to gravitate towards slightly happier stuff. I also think that's an over enthusiastic response that we are seeing to COVID guidelines now when people are going out and eating chole bhature <laughs> openly in the streets because we are positive. Hote. Um, but I think that basically, intrinsically, we all want to be happy. And happiness comes from small positive thoughts because you can't afford to get too cynical and bitter in life. Mm. And I think that as somebody who's in a media sector, it's our job to make people feel a little better. And I take that a little seriously so there will be days when you will be low and i think everybody should indulge in those low days when you come out and say that i don't know what's gonna happen and i'm scared and I, i've said that on radio a lot of times that mm -hmm. i'm scared because now this this is going beyond control it's in the air i don't know how to protect us but then you get out of it two days later and you want to again spread happiness because that that's intrinsic i think it, it's that's more intrinsic. intrinsic than anything else and yeah. when you were speaking right now about covid i think COVID taught us all that the things that we run behind, right, mm. in normal days is not something that you want in life. What you want in life is peace of mind, a little bit of happiness, a bit of people that you feel happy with, not mm. spending time in things that you will later on do with those people. So I think that, that that's helped in making that's us good. all slightly positive in that sense. Komal, uh, tell us some personal uh growth stories, how you, you are a businesswoman and you do so many things and tell us that in your uh, journey of being an entrepreneur, uh, what is your personal growth, which has guided you more, your success or continued success or there has been fellows which were the milestones for teaching? I think continued success is a great utopian Instagram story. It's, it doesn't exist in your life. <laughs> let's, let's be very real about it. But, Thank God for those. Uh, thank God for those setbacks and failures. So it was a very interesting conversation. I was doing a Harvard uh, course, and the professor mentioned uh, something that perhaps stayed with me. And he said that oh, we're not scared of change. We're scared of losing what we have in the current, which is why we are about to change because we feel we're going to lose what we have. But it, why don't we celebrate failure? Sometimes it's such setbacks make me say, right? Whatever happens is for the good. Um, you also need to embrace and celebrate things. I think at some point, it helps you grow as a person. It just, uh, yeah, it is very difficult to be detached. So when it, I had a big smile on my face when you and mentioned about detachment, because it, it's great to say the practice part of it 
is very difficult. I remember when I was transitioning, so I was working for eight years uh, before I took the plunge of starting my own company, and it was purely situation. Let's put it that way. And so at 25, I started my company. I don't think I slept well for three months because the fact that you don't get a stable paycheck home, uh, though you don't think about it in that manner, sort of feels like, okay, how am I going to manage this? How are you going to pay your team? You're not thinking for yourself, but you suddenly have an attachment to so many people that you're associated with. Absolutely. That you're not just the founder of a business. So I think uh, unlearn, relearn, being able to celebrate, uh, it, taking a deep breath and saying, okay, not only the shall pass, but time is the only currency not coming back. So either I make time to move forward instead of moving on, or I was self, which is normal to do, and I'll celebrate it, but I have to do it because I need to get over it. And then where else can you walk? So you have no option. So keep your goals and heels higher. Uh, that's yeah. how I sort of have lived by. And uh, that that's, uh, helps me. Uh, there's a journey to it. I, I think we. I'm enjoying my journey thoroughly. Wonderful. It's so steady, but I'm, I'm loving it. So good. Uh, Guinea, I'll tell you that I am actually, you know, the only social media I know is LinkedIn and I have 75,000 followers there. I'm not on Facebook, Instagram, I don't know. So I just kept the Arjun kind of focus on one particular thing. And that's what I do in life. But feeling responsible about your ecosystem, mm. uh, which you talked about, and which is a, such an amazing thing, Komal, you said, feeling responsible towards your ecosystem, the people who are dependent on you, the people who look up to you and your journey and being ethical. And that's the island concept. It's an island concept which they say that don't bother about what others are doing. You you have your own journey which will have integrity, which will have trust, which will have a lot of gratitude and perseverance and you propel yourself with these things. So basically when you talk about personal growth also, it is not in terms of money or it's in terms of something, it's more than that. So when you generate money, you generate for yourself, for example. When you generate wealth, you generate for the entire community, your ecosystem. So these are the thoughts uh, which should guide you in your journey. Uh, Ashkin, tell us more about uh, the examples which you gave us uh, that how do we deal with, uh, like, like you give brilliant example of children, very young children. Tell us more about uh, what other things uh, should guide us when we interpret success or failure. Um, uh, well, <laughs> no, knowledge. Uh, so you have to, you know, the first thing, uh, okay, I, I give you some uh, keys. So uh, the first thing that you have to fix the goal that what you want to achieve, okay, the, that is the most important part. Uh, before the goal, you have to like, you have dreams, yes, you have to realize which one is more important for you. Okay, you fix your goal. Uh, and you after fixing, I want this, or I want to achieve of uh, this level, you have to do analysis of your resources, okay? It can be knowledge, it can be financial part, it can be your connection, your network, that your friends, who you have around of you, and uh, who can help you, or what resources, or what kind of resources you need to achieve to the goal. Or if you need to you know, improve your knowledge, improve your skills, uh, to get that goal, to achieve to the goal, okay, what you have to learn, how to learn, uh, from where to find the teacher or the, the I don't know, expert. So um, when you already write down all these steps, uh, everything will be clear for you, uh, like uh, what you have to do the next. And always be uh, ready. The second point is always be ready to uh, study, okay? In all uh, your life, okay, you graduated university, it doesn't mean that you are a super professional and that's all. Everyone should hire you, everyone should come and ask you so your services or buy from you because you have to grow okay you have to be ready always to study always every day get something new improve your knowledge improve your skills because um, your knowledge is the most important is the most valuable thing that you have uh, as uh, the knowledge can maximize your potential can maximize your talent and can open doors front of you uh, and um 
you be ready to learn. Yes, that is the second key that I will advise everyone not to fail to have a success. So always, if you to try to search and nowadays, internet gives us great opportunity. You can sit in India, you can uh, take a courses from, I don't know, from another <laughs> side of the world. So, and you can improve your skills. So that is the second point that I'll advise. And the third one, I'll say that, you know, uh, be responsible, whatever you want to do. Don't start one day and second day you say, oh, I'm busy, I have a guest, I have to go somewhere. So be responsible, uh, whatever you want to do or what you are doing, because if you don't fix it in your mind that this is very important, I have to do. OK, for example, no one one day will become an Olympic champion, isn't it? So you have to train yourself every day. If the champion train himself, one day and the next day say that, oh, I'm busy, I can't go. So he will not become Olympic champion, isn't it? So you have to be responsible of your goals, of your future, of your life. And the fourth point that I would like to advise that uh, always look around the few, How, like, you know, be uh, in good uh, people's, um, uh, like be uh, always uh, with good people, surround yourself with good people, uh, people who will uh, not uh, only help you, they can uh, advise you, they can teach you, or you can inspire from them, or you can learn something from them. That is very important. Because uh, to be a failure or to be a successful person in personal life, in business, in any, uh, like generally in your life, uh, it's very important to have a connection. Uh, we have connection, we are starting to have a good connection since our childhood, since our school. So as strong as our connection, it doesn't mean like, you know, financial part, okay, I did something for you, you have to do to me. Yes, uh, it's not like that. You have to be kind to people. You have to, you know, give something always be ready to help others, especially nowadays. Um, like this pandemic is like a <laughs> really big challenge for everyone. If you are able to give your knowledge free also, don't feel bad to give it free because it will come back to you. Absolutely. So this is my <laughs> key point. A, it is such an exhaustive list. And I'll tell you, I'm so surprised that we are talking about same kind of stuff. Uh, I, I just got a, a quote from Amy Poehler. He said the same thing. You can't do it alone. Find a group of people who challenge and inspire you. Spend a lot of time with them and it will change your life. This is what you said in one of the points. So what, and this is the quote of the day somebody has sent me. So good things are being manifested here. I can see, Guinea. One important thing I'll tell you, when I gave the interview of 1998 for IS. Um, me and my father, we came out of the final results and he was a very dejected person because, Guinea, you know, in Eastern UP, Bihar, IAS preparation is a journey of life. Like, you spent four, five years in that. So, I was very dejected, very disappointed, but he said a very important thing. He said, son, you have no chance now. You, you came out of 12 lakhs people in last uh, 600. You didn't clear it. But the knowledge you got, that knowledge will not go away. It will be used somewhere. So, what happened? What you just said, Ashkin. Seven newspapers I was reading at that time, I'm still reading seven newspapers, even in pandemic. And it helped me a lot in my profession. I never realized it. So my marks in my 10th was very less. It was 60, 61%. I had 59% in 12. I had barely got an admission in the evening college in Delhi. I taught my college in final year. I did very well in IS, but if you rejected from IS into nobody takes you because your academic curriculum was very bad. So I told my father one day that I will be teaching one day in the best law schools. I just manifested. So today, I have a Fulbright scholarship because of IV fellowship, which I got in 2005 because of my work on climate change and environmental law. And I'm teaching in OP Jindal University, which is one of the best private universities in India. As an honorary professor, I'm also teaching at Southampton University in London. And I said, okay, I can't study in LLM or something because of my marks, but I can teach. For that, there is no academic criteria. Your excellence, your success is the criteria. So life has a strange way of rewarding you. Life has a strange way of telling you that no verdict is final. No defeat is final. And it's only a moment which can change your entire life. Give me your final thoughts 
uh, about one, two, three, which we should follow. This is my time to ask you those things, which I, I can't ever call you and ask that. It's so difficult to get you there. Yeah. I think that after hearing everybody, I've realized that success is very important because it takes you from point A to point B. But success also brings in a certain amount of fear. This is what I feel at this point in time because you're too scared to take risks because you've been successful for a while. Yeah. I think what failure does, and it's a very interesting thing because now that you're slightly an adult about it and you're not breaking down at every failure, is that it gives you the freedom because you have nothing to lose. And when you reach that point of nothing to lose is when you actually open up and go ahead with full steam about whatever you believe in. Yeah. So I think both equally important but sometimes I think after every five years of successful living, there should be one massive failure in our lives. I'm God, I'm not calling in for it, but literally so that you get back and you're able to take those risks, which success sometimes after a point, point in time does not let you take because it's predefined. Why would you want to shift the focus? So I think that's very important. Beyond that, I just hope that beyond success and failure, whether you're very successful or whether you're a failed individual, the one thing that you're looking for is happy people around you because that's what you want at the end of the day. Again, COVID, biggest teacher in this. And I hope that all of us just remember that. That's, that's very essential in both cases. But yeah, don't be scared of any. I mean, my president just quit the other day. And one last lesson that she gave all of us was, don't be scared, be fearless. Okay. I think that really works in all situations. Okay. Don't give up. Okay, wonderful. Just final thought, 30 seconds for Komal. What are your final two suggestions to us on success and failure? Yeah, you're mute. You're mute. Uh, be a fan and be your critic both. Take both in stride. And the opposite of failure is not success. And the opposite of success is not failure. There's that journey. Walk that. Keep your goals high. You'll be fine. Ashkin? Your final 30 seconds? I just say, will say that uh, failure is the uh, oil and your success is your engine. You So put <laughs> oil in your engine and go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you. All over to you, Kathy. I'm so privileged to moderate this panel. Thank you, Sudhir Bhai. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Well, thank you. I said that we've had an influx of knowledge and insights during this sessions. So if you'd like to share your key highlights from the session so far, go ahead and do that by tweeting to us using the hashtag E4MPR Women Achievers. And now we're moving towards our next panel discussion, which will talk about work beyond COVID. Hybrid working models are here to stay. And we have panelists in this session bringing on screen. Anjana Asrani, Communications Lead, Puma. Pasna Dash, Founder and CEO, Jajobar Brand Consultancy. Simran Kudesia, Communications Lead, India and Southeast Asia, Airbnb. Piyal Banerjee, Head, External Communications, IPM India. And moderating this session is Ms. Nafisa Shaheen, Correspondent at Exchange for Media. A very warm welcome to you, ladies. Thank you so much for the lovely welcome, Kathy. Thank you. Yes, we and hello all you lovely ladies and welcome to session five of the second edition of e 4 mpr and COPCOM Women Achievers Summit and Awards 2021. So before we begin, are you, uh, are you guys all vaccinated? Yes. Fully vaccinated. Awesome. Okay, so, I was done at first door, so. Okay. Okay, so you're on the step. And Peel, everyone, I guess everyone is, uh, at least I've got the first dose. Okay, so you know, as vaccinations uh, bring us closer to a post-COVID world, many business leaders across sectors as well as countries, you know, have started contemplating the future of workspaces, you know, on how, when, and where will uh, they fix those workplaces that, you know, sit dormant for the past one and a half years. So while I was researching for this session, I got to know that there are two sets of employees. 
the first set believe that they will be comfortable working uh, remotely after the pandemic ends, which I feel is a distant dream, but we all can be guarded by optimistic thoughts. While the second set of employees feel that we will be moving towards a hybrid working model. So I, I'd like to start this session by asking my co-panelists about your views on if hybrid working models will become the norm moving forward. So we will start with you, Anjana. What are your thoughts on the same? Oh, thank you so much for the introduction. Us together, Nafisa. It's really great to be here. So I think, um, see, the fact that the whole world went into a work from home at the same time kind of really put the focus on remote working and hybrid work models, right? Um, and at the moment, I think companies are experimenting different, different methodologies or models, as we can call it. Like there are some companies that are saying, let's have a more staggered approach, come in two or three days a week. Uh, there are some uh, where, you know, they probably declared till the end of 2021 that it's going to be work from home or some have even left it completely up to the, um, uh, to the employees themselves. But I think as organizations think about the longer term, hybrid working models will become a reality. But um, having said that, it will only be, in my opinion, be uh, uh, impactful or useful for certain sectors, right? It cannot be uh, applied at a mass scale um, at the moment. And, uh, and as we go through this, I think it's, it's more about what are the new policies? What are the new initiatives that, are organi that organizations are thinking through to make sure hybrid work models become, uh, you know, or we're creating a more level playing field for employees in a hybrid work model because it's going to come with its own challenges. It's going to be brand new. There's going to be a lot of unlearning that needs to be done, uh, you know, culturally and, uh, you know, um, in terms of organizations that, that are thinking through this. So, yes, it is going to be a reality, in my opinion, but in a very, very selective manner. Okay, so uh, according to Anjana, it will be limited to some of the sectors and we need to do a lot of unlearning. What are your thoughts, Apasna, on this? Um, thanks, Nafisa. Firstly, great to be joined by such incredible women. Um, and I think this is an important question to ask specifically in the services industry and industries like PR, right, where all the capital is actually human capital, right? So how you place them is very, very important. Um, my personal experience has been that, uh, you know, my employees actually leaning more towards working in person and uh, tilting more towards being in the office as opposed to being at home. Uh, very surprisingly, we've always had a very democratic setup where people can choose and vote in terms of whether they want to work remotely or in person. And um, surprisingly, what they've actually come up to me and said is a couple of things, right? One is that in India, the work from home infrastructure still needs a lot of work, right? Access to Wi-Fi, um, you know, just making sure electricity is there on time, um, a private space to work. So those challenges still exist for people at large. Um, secondly, um, in a field like PR or communication, a lot of it is to just do, um, you know, creative conversations, creative thinking in person makes a huge difference. Yes, there are tools, et cetera, that are available. Um, and I think thirdly, people loved having that dedicated space for work and, you know, work there and then come back home. So they actually felt like work-life balance was getting heavily cannibalized um, when they were working from home. So these are the three things that got them to really want to be in office. But I actually completely agree with Anjana that the future is definitely hybrid. I don't think we can have a one size fits all approach here, right? There are specific industries and specific companies that can do this completely or not. And I also think that um, I don't think we've reached the end of the cycle, right? None of us have a crystal ball to say whether the pandemic is here or it's over. Every week there's a new development, right? And I think we'll have to be really agile. But I think in the uh, in the long run, and when I say long run, I mean till the end of the year, I think hybrid models are definitely here to stay. Um, and in certain industries, specifically PR and comms, I think they'll be tilted a little bit more towards working in office. But you have to keep the right checks in place. For example, we've gotten every employee vaccinated, we're enabling vaccinations for them, etc. So thoughtfully getting them back to the workspace is uh, what I recommend should happen and possibly will happen. Okay, so as uh, you know, Pasna mentioned about infrastructure for working from home. So Sunan, I'd like to ask from you, like how can employees at their workplaces accommodate or try to accommodate this hybrid work model that we are moving forward? Sure, thanks, uh, thanks Nafisa. And you know, I sort of really agree with what Pasna also just mentioned. I think it's you know it's very important that employers are you know taking like a very cautious approach when they're getting employees back. So I can you know when talking about Airbnb, I can tell you that we've been given flexibility till September of 2022 to decide whether we want to work from home. Even if our global offices start opening, it'll be like a phased uh, reopening. 
and employees will still have the option to work either from home or you know relocate to another place you know live anywhere as they say uh, in in the terms of travel so i think that is definitely uh, a hybrid model will definitely be here to stay employers are doing all their best you know to sort of a making sure that employees are getting vaccinated when they're bringing them back into work spaces you know the spaces are now set up in a way that uh you know not too many people are on one table uh in some offices i also realize that you know you also have to check in before actually going to work and you know to realize that it's a very important thing to do but i think the most important thing uh which you passed now also mentioned is that you know that that human interaction that people sort of miss uh that was the best part of going to office you know so even if you were interacting with your colleagues you know some of those best conversations and ideas especially in the teams uh, you know across pr marketing communications we actually used to come across having those chai bar conversations right so i think it's a very important uh it, it's a very important tool uh you know for people to sort of interact with one another you know get that creativity and get that energy from one another but i do think that employers have to be extremely cautious as they sort of bring employees back to workspace what are your thoughts on this spiel yeah so thank you for the opportunity and it's lovely to share stage with all you wonderful women today um so i want to step back a little bit you know and uh, i think everybody is echoed a similar sentiment that you know the hybrid model isn't going away um you know it's obviously a blend uh, we're a people centric country we're all about you know sort of meeting each other doing our chai pani doing a little gossip engaging and that's that's going to be perennially a want that all of us have but having said that i think this entire concept of working remotely and working from home had a huge trust barrier like the minute somebody would say pre pandemic ke acha wo ghar se kaam kar rahe hain so you never know ki puri attention se kaam kar rahe hain ya nahi kar rahe you always feel like they are not all all hands are not on the deck or there's something else that the individual is doing and possibly not being as efficient possibly not being as dedicated and you need to sort of check into that right so all of that has completely been dispelled i think so work from home is a reality and work from home is a reality now people managers are embracing it was thrust upon us at the back of the pandemic overnight no less but i think it's a format that everybody's figured out where you know that you know it is something that you can do it is something that you can seamlessly sort of incorporate so i think it's a cultural ideological and psychological shift that things can happen you know when you're not physically engaged so that's number one and that actually has to be ingrained in the culture of every organization that hybrid is not any less it's as much as effective and as productive if done well number one that so it's cultural top down communication which has to find its way into the policies into the cultural narrative into the stories that you're telling your employees so that's number one number two is of course the infrastructure right and you know the government has repeatedly put you know enough and more pre- preventive and precautionary sort of guidelines which need to be implemented it needs to be in a rotational manner it needs to be phased out uh, it needs to be one that uh, makes your employee comfortable you know it doesn't feel like a you know sort of mounting the everest to come to work uh, so there has to be abundant communication enough soft landing just keep the personal touch keep it not a memo but a dialogue so that people are looking forward to it saying that you know it's a safe haven for us to go to so i think just putting all of that in order and i think everybody's spoken enough about the temperature checks the vaccination so do one camp do two do booster camps and you know make health care a you know intervention agenda almost not a camp that happens as a rosy you know thing to do at the end of two years but almost like probably every six months to you know understand what is the what is the privilege of good health so i think all of that come together in making hybrid a reality because i definitely feel that if a blend is right uh, both things can work beautifully so definitely all for it i think we all will I agree with what PL has just said, and you have pointed out a very important topic of productivity. So while we were working from home and everything started, and we had no playbook, so uh, we have seen that some of the sectors have gone really high on in terms of productivity, while rest have gone, you know, seeped down. So um, when we talk about this hybrid work model, so will it have its own implications? or will this be a more comfortable and adaptable way of working for the future so this time we can start with simran sure thanks nafisa so honestly i you know to be very honest with you i think you know when we were going to office you know there was like a routine that you were following you know you could shut your computer down you could actually 
you know, uh, take a breath, have a cup of tea when you come back home and then you sort of feel that the day has ended. You know, all of us as communicators are so compulsive about checking our emails that we would still go and check our, e uh, check our emails on the phone. But now working from home, there is no end to your day, right? Because A, everybody thinks you have nowhere to go. You've got nothing better to do. And you yourself are now tuned in a way that, you know, if I have to do this tomorrow, why can't I finish this at 10 o'clock this night and, you know, get one thing off my agenda? So when there is no end to your work day, you know, instead of being productive, I also feel that there is a sense of fatigue setting in you know there is no switching off you're constantly looking at your phone you know in your in your mind there are like multiple tabs open at all points in time so there is no rest so i think sometimes if there is lack of productivity in some sectors maybe they're absolutely fatigued with this whole work from home you know another reality which is very true for women is that you know they're also sort of double hatting you know being a mom you know, being a homemaker, you know, managing everything at home and doing their Zoom calls in between, it's it's not an easy thing. And, you know, like men folk have obviously, you know, started uh, helping more, you know, the, but, you know, children are not going to school as well. So how much, how much of all of that can you sort of manage? So there's not one thing which is impacting your productivity, but there could be many things and the fatigue of overall, all of this, this pandemic fatigue, we've sort of hit the wall with the second wave. Right. When the first wave ended and, you know, we saw some bit of normalcy coming back and the second wave was like, you know, episode season two of a show you didn't like the very first time. Right. And nobody was sort of ready for it. So I think that's one thing that both employers as well as employees have to take care of that finding that balance, still taking your PTO, even if you have nowhere to go, is like an important way to just sort of sleep off and get that fatigue off to be productive on, on your next Monday. So that that's my take here. Okay, so what would you like to say, Anjana? Anafisa, so I think, um, see, as we transform into this hybrid work model, right, I think the expectations and needs of employees must be seen as an opportunity for organizations to transform their work culture. I'm not saying it's not just the cosmetic changes that need to happen, right? It has to be at a much, much deeper level. The concept of office will definitely change, like, you know, like what we know it as of today. Um, so in my opinion, I, I'm not sure if uh, enforcing rules like employees need to come in two or three times a week or, you know, just, uh, you know, kind of binding them by rules in terms of how many days a week they have to be there versus can we look at teams where we feel it's going to be more productive for them if they're in the office, right? Uh, simplest example is if I'm on the innovation team, does it make sense for me to come two or three times a week, have face-to-face -face meetings, do those, uh, you know, kind of catch-ups with them so I'm able to see progress in my work versus uh, say uh, someone who's working for the warehouse uh, or in the warehouse, right? He has to be there. He or she has to be there on the floor every day. So it's very difficult to say that, uh, you know, okay, come two or three days a week. And you're also not being inclusive because there are certain teams in an organization that don't have that uh, freedom or you know, that flexibility to offer a hybrid work model. Um, so yeah, I think whether, like I said, uh, like I've said before, and I think a lot of them on the panel have said, uh, the way organizations look at it will have to change. It, uh, of course, hybrid work models will become very a lot more adaptable than they are today. Uh, but I think it's also flexibility versus clarity of expectation. Right? Can we clarity versus yes? I think yeah. um, that's really important. So, uh, PL, what would you like to add to this? You know, Anjana's. Uh, touched upon a point that I wanted to probably belabor with repetition, but you know, uh, there is no one size fits all, right? So mm -hmm. I think it really depends on the function. It's specific to the function that you can sort of enjoy the luxury of, uh, you know, indulging in a hybrid format. Uh, but having said that, you know, uh, also I feel that within functions, for instance, the sales fraternity of any organization, which is intrinsically the backbone, as they say, of any commercial practice, like what we've done for our organizational is that it's rotational. So for instance, you have a brigade that goes into work at a certain stipulated time and the rest sort of take, take precedence from there on. So I think the way that a lot of organizations are looking at enhancing predictivity is by saying that it's people first, guys, for this term. And business sort of comes second. So we'll be ensuring the lives of our employees first and then livelihoods are a second guess. So I think um, in that, whatever needs to happen, whatever enhances, whatever is the mode uh, to productivity and to efficiency, one has sort of um, walked the path on. 
And uh, like I said, like, you know, it's important. Some people just have to go in, whether it's finance, whether it's sales, whether it's operations, especially it's a supply chain, they have to. But the way that they can possibly do this and divide and conquer, and we've seen that in our organization, is that do it on a rotational, phased out manner till such time that the inoculation process, the vaccination process is all done. One of the other things which is important is to do an antigen test after you've done your uh, entire you know doses that have come through you and just to see how much protection do you have and all of these things kind of find their way like i said previously into the policy framework of people today so i think we're sort of rewriting the entire script on that where everything is about safeguarding um you know uh people first and business second um and i feel that's going to be a trend now because this is not going away in a hurry uh we have the third wave uh, quite on our toes so exactly, yeah. one will manage but we don't have an idea yet we're still learning and unlearning that's the catchphrase of the season i guess um but yes that's what i feel about this uh one point that i would like to uh, you know put forward like i i work uh, for a delhi office but i am based out of uttar pradesh so uh, for candidates like me this hybrid working model can be uh, can be proved as a bliss because i can sit at, at the comfort of my home and work for an any international organization so i think this one point that uh, that can be counted as a positive side to hybrid working um come to us now get to sense on uh, this please firstly so many interesting points that came up um i think my biggest takeaway is that uh, you know uh, you have to empower your employees to co create these policies with you right this is something that impacts them deeply you know when the pandemic started a founder once told me that you know stop saying work from home say work from pandemic you know that's a completely different ball game and uh, what we started doing very early on i realized was that you know this is not one of those um, great hr policies that two people in the hr team can make and then implement via email you have to talk to them and i think they also need to be given the freedom to co create these policies so that's one thing that is very very important uh, that we've seen and second uh, i think there has to be a like somebody said on the panel you have to redefine what productivity is productivity does not mean being plugged in for 9 to 12 hours so what we started doing was you know give them metrics and say hey this is the metric this is the timeline feel free to do it in whatever format you like and whatever time you've got left right let's have fun right let's do a virtual meeting take the day off um, you know watch shows together do whatever you like so that gave employees a big sense of power and they felt like they were in control of what was happening to them as opposed to oh my god you know i have to show up i have to be productive i have to deal with vaccinations and so on and so forth so i think empowering people very important secondly redefining productivity um and third is uh, you know the the, the biggest problems uh, that erupt are when you set a certain policy framework and you think this is great i don't need to look at it again for the next couple of months right um i i think that's that's one approach that really hinders uh, you know great uh, employee productivity you need to relook at it every couple of weeks if needed until everybody is satisfied um and i think that's the third thing that we did we we did try implementing certain stuff for example we said hey on friday everybody let's sit and you know catch a show together but after two weeks everyone was like no we don't want to watch a show together we literally just want to go take a nap um or you know we 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 love the metric approach we don't like the whole being plugged into the hours approach so um i think the biggest takeaway is co create this with your employees and redefine productivity and uh, i think we've been lucky um most of our clients and a lot of incredible startups and founders have been so empathetic and i know there are people on the brand side here who have been so empathetic to the agency side and i think it really this pandemic also showed us the best of what happens when all stakeholders come together so many big agencies uh, you know work very closely with really big brands who said hey it's okay to not meet this particular target right now let's rework and relook that was such a beautiful thing to see throughout this ecosystem and i think we need to see more of that happening um so yeah i think productivity needs to be redefined relooked at and must be uh, co created with employees uh completely agree with you vasna i think uh, empowering our people is really important and being empathetic has i think has become prerequisite now that's not something that has to be there in the agenda that has to be the norm now so moving forward like uh, talking about work and productivity and talking about uh, office spaces so this this session will be incomplete if you don't discuss about the safety of both employers and employees so um how do you think um 
I will start with you only, Upasna. How do you think, uh, you know, employees can uh, remain safe uh, from or be at minimum risk? And what can employers do in order to maintain that kind of safety? Yeah, well, this is so important. And, uh, you know, I think a couple of things. One, of course, is really, um, you know, it's not uh, enough to just say, hey, go get vaccinated. You have to step up and enable them, empower them. We had somebody in the team who was dedicated to making sure that vaccinations happen, right? So one is you have to sort of empower them. Second is, I think uh, every week, right, you need to look at you know, I, I mean, at least I'm waking up every week and there's a new variant, right? So I've actually, uh, you know, touched base with a friend of mine who works in a medical profession. And I say, hey, just give me a condensed, uh, you know, a zoomed out view of what's happening and what should we be doing? So it's very important to keep track of, you know, what's happening externally, send out memos, etc. Third, of course, just making sure you're socially distant as much as possible. Um, while we've called back our teams to the office, we make sure, you know, office layouts, etc. have been changed. And both a lot of transparency transparency right anytime anybody is feeling sick make sure you you know you don't feel um scared to do this we actually heard some really scary stories about you know people being scared to say that they're feeling sick because they were like oh my god we can't ask for an off uh, so you have to remove that from their uh, mindset and you know just um, again take away sort of any fear and taboo and uh, just you know work as closely as you can with them to make sure that you are able to get them the resources that are needed to be safe and vaccination being of course um, the most important thing and also uh, cut down on in person as much as possible just because we're starting to go back from uh, to the office doesn't mean you need to keep doing these meetings etc so I think those are some of the couple uh, those are few things that we've already implemented and yeah. could be important. okay and Simon what are your thoughts on this sure uh, thanks Nafisa so obviously workplaces will change for good you know there's absolutely no playbook to how to you know come out of a pandemic so the, the important thing is that, you know, a lot of things, you know, from layouts to how we sort of interact with one another will change. You know, a very important perk for most of the startups and offices is a cafeteria where you could actually just go and have lunch with your colleagues, you know, in a common area and common space. I do think, you know, that that will probably go away for the next one year or two years. So I think, you know, some of some of those perks you know, employees might feel that a perk is being taken back. Right. So it's very important to keep and, you know, keep that communication going and keep telling them that this is what is important for your health and safety. The other thing about vaccination is that, you know, it's not just about companies looking at vaccinating their own employees, but I'll tell you what Airbnb has done. So we set up a camp and office and we told that you could bring in your, your family members, uh, your in-laws, your friends, you could bring your domestic help, you know, so bring as many people as possible, but get them all vaccinated, right? Like, I am, we are not out of it until we are all out of it. And that mindset and that approach has to happen. And like to somebody, like how somebody else on the panel mentioned that, you know, we don't know how many booster shots and doses we'll need to sort of get out of this. So I think it's important to have that approach for a longer term to ensure that, you know, employee safety is the number one priority. Okay. So uh, we have discussed a lot about, you know, getting vaccinated and, uh, following some protocols from by the employees and the employees both. But uh, um, don't you guys feel that the physical proximity that's there when we work in, in an office environment, the corporate culture that's there, you know, when students are trained to enter the corporate life, we are given a kind of training that we'll, we'll have to, you know, follow when we enter that uh, that phase so with this hybrid model coming into uh, action and uh, pandemic becoming the way of life so how will this be dis this physical proximity thing be disrupted at the workplaces what are your thoughts anjana on this you know that's a very interesting question uh, nafisa because there were some organizations i heard were experimenting to introduce pay cards uh, for those who moved into you know non metro cities because obviously the cost of living is, is much lower. And I think that is such a deterrent, right? And that is, that that just, I don't know, it, it, it seems very wrong at many levels and very uninformed and insensitive on many levels to me. Uh, so talking about proximity, I think proximity bias will be a real challenge. We can't run away from it, right? Uh, there will be people in the office who will feel more included, superior compared to those who are working remotely. But I think they, uh, like, you know, I think Simran, one of them pointed out earlier, I think it's the organization culture that needs to change, right? And it has to become a culture that hybrid working model is okay. And it's, it's absolutely fine whether you're at home or you're in the office. That's one. And two is, I think, um, you know, as leaders, we need to level the playing field for everybody. 
right? Um, imposter, let's face it, right? I think imposter syndrome is real for many people. Uh, and just because you don't speak up in a meeting, it does not mean you're not capable or somebody is overly confident just because they're speaking uh, a lot more in a meeting. So I think it becomes very, very important for us to level that playing field. Uh, give everyone an opportunity. Decide what the quorum for those meetings should be if you're in a hybrid work model. Uh, give everyone an opportunity to be heard, to be, uh, you know, to have a chance to speak. And finally, I think technology will evolve even further to enable us, right? Uh, I heard somebody from Microsoft say that, uh, you know, uh, virtual whiteboards are real and you'll have microphones in different parts of the room, but you'll also have camera technology where probably the camera zooming into the person who's actually talking from the room. So the person working from home feels like, you know, it's, it's a more close setup, right? Um, and it's a more uh, knitted setup. So technology will, will evolve to enable that, but uh, the most important thing is for leaders like us to level the playing field for everyone. Right. So Pierre Anjana talked about technology. Uh, would you like to add something on the same lines? No, I think I'd also like to mention, you use the word disruption, right? And disruption in the new age world is usually when something new and something novel is, you know, at the helm of things, right? So I see this as a positive transformation, right? We can look at it in any way and we can debate and discuss this. But I feel like it's, it's I don't see it so much as a disruption as opposed to a transformation to a newer and different way of working things out. And technology, I mean, look, I don't know how much one needs to say it's, it's the backbone of our existence today. It's not just about the workplace. It's about everything. It's like my grandfather at 78 is online today and trying to sort of make a WhatsApp call to me or just see me on the phone so that, you know, feels less of a divide. So I think technology, as much as I say, is going to be less because it's I don't think we could function in this world today without the backbone and creativity and the innovation of technology leaders and they're constantly sort of upgrading our lives. So it's kind of synonymous to that. And the other thing that I want to also say, and you know, we've discussed this a lot that, you know, I mean, there's no replacement to human interaction, human interface, but I also feel like, you know, work-life balance and one of y'all mentioned this is a lot more detail, how it's taking away from time, but I also feel it's forcing us to take time out because it is not just work from home, it's working for home. I remember the first six months, I could not work all the time because I had chores to run, I had things to do. And so I had to align it with my managers and my superiors that I'm gonna be off. So I know it's at the back of a really brutal time and a really harsh time, but it's forcing us to take that time away. And I wish we did it differently, but we have to stop work and do something else. Of course, the flip side of it is like, we'll start working at three in the morning or wherever we have time and there's no such line or such, timeline as it were but at least in our organization we're very clear that it's 8 to 12 and then you you know do what you need to and it's in a way forced upon us I just feel like we can evolve from this and make this as a good as a good learning as a leaf of progression and not so much as a, as about what we're missing out but what we're really entering we've just made ourselves future ready we probably would have done this about a decade into, into the life cycle of technology, but we've had to embrace it much ahead of time. And we've done a really good job uh, with the ecosystem that's come along, of course. But I feel like there's also an advantage in this. Like Nafisa, you pointed out, you're sitting in UP and you're, you're able to be with all of us and you're being productive and efficient about it. The barrier of you know, efficient working, if you're working from home remotely, has, is sort of going away, right? Everybody's embracing it. So I think... Um, it's not a disruption, it's a transformation. And I feel it's going to be good for all of us. Yeah, so it is a transformation and we have come towards the end of our uh, session. So as parting remarks, I'd like to ask all four of you, uh, you know, one key point to keep in mind to be virtually ready. Like we all are right now, all four, uh, five of us are virtually ready. So one, one uh, key point or one suggestion that you would like to give our listeners to be virtually ready. We'll start with Simran. Sure. And Thanks, Nafisa. Sure. So uh, people to people connection is the most important thing. That's one thing that, you know, a pandemic has taught us. And just think of technology as an enabler. Okay, technology as an enabler. Uh, Upasna. I think uh, tools have a really, really great way to make this experience much better. Find and invest in the right tools. They exist and they will just make your experience and interaction so much richer. 
investing in the right tool pl your thoughts engage don't transact and uh, make uh, technology a holy grail it, it humanize technology to sort of um, ebb the gap humanize technology and uh, we will we'll, uh, you know end with you anjana your thoughts on this Oh, so I think flexibility is great, but uh, it's equally important for all of us to draw our boundaries and be very clear on expectations. Flexibility, great. Great. Thank you so much, all you lovely lady, ladies. It was really an insightful and an interesting conversation, and I hope we'll uh, be able to meet soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Kat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nafisa. I'm going to invite quickly our next panel discussion uh, for the day. The journey to perfection, real life stories on success and failure of the women leaders. So I'd like to welcome Rakhi Lalwani, Vice President, Public Relations and Corporate Communications, IHCS. CL, Josna Ghoshal, Executive Director, Enterprise Lead Government Affairs and Policy, India, Johnson & Johnson. Shravani Dang, Independent Consultant, Ruby Sinha, Founder and Managing Director, Commune Brand. And moderating this session is Mr. Ruhail Amin, Exchange for Media, and Ms. Ruchika Jha from Exchange for Media. They're going to be talking about the journey to perfection, real life stories on success and failure of the women leaders. A very warm welcome to all of you. And Ruhail, over to you. Thank you so much, Kyati, and uh, welcome all of you. Hope I'm audible, first of all. Am I audible to everyone? We can all right. You. Okay. So we have a very interesting topic and uh, joining me would be my colleague Ruchika Jha, who would also be posing a few questions. And the topic that we have been given has a context, you know, it's like uh, not just about the practice of corporate communications and uh, the, the, the communication space is also linked to the societal, societal, you know, aspect to it. So. I have a couple of questions and I want to start with uh, Ms. Lalwani first, uh, if you can hear me. So we're talking about, you know, we're, we're all here. I mean, all of you are celebrated leaders and you have your own journeys to talk about. You have been through certain phases, the ups and downs. So what was the story before uh, you have become the celebrated leader that you are? A little bit of that, uh, Ms. Lalwani, starting from you. Uh, so your audio is muted, I guess. Uh, uh, I cannot hear. Uh, can I? I am unable to hear. Uh, yes. Can't hear. Okay, uh, okay, let me quickly jump to uh, Ms. Dang with your thoughts, the same question till Ms. Lalwani comes back. Uh, give me a sense of uh, the various challenges that you've faced as a women leader. Uh, there were many. I think uh, the most important thing is to uh, act and behave uh, as if it doesn't matter if you're a woman or a man. You're there to do a job and you do the job. Um, I remember once um, I was being interviewed and the gentleman actually turned around and said that, you know, I really like you and you're great and you're just the perfect fit. But you know what? You're a woman. And I said, yes, I am. So what? Um, uh, and I don't think he, he just spoke aloud and... Uh, I don't know what he had in his mind, maybe because I was married, I had kids, but I just put that aside and I said, it doesn't matter. Gender has nothing to do with the work I've been given or my responsibilities. I have to do what I have to do. And I think that's my biggest learning and that's the way I've dealt with uh, at all my workplaces, with all my uh, supervisors, with my uh, CXOs who, you know, I've been a devil's advocate to a lot of them. And that's the way I've been treated. Right, right. Uh, Ms. Lalwani, your thoughts? Yes. Uh, yes. Am I audible? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank God. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. leader, I mean, that uh, you are, and all, all of us on the panel, I mean, all of you on the panel, 
so there has been a story of course not been never come so easy and of course we talk about gender bias and uh, especially you know in the context of a corporate world tell me what all did you have to overcome uh, before you found that spot where you could call the shots thanks to him so uh, basically you know i think i'm really fortunate that i'm part of the tata group um, which has always been an equal and fair um, organization and gives women an equal and enabling environment um, to grow so i possibly am i'm in the lot that is blessed uh, but that doesn't mean that i didn't encounter my fair share of individuals um who would you know stereotype you who would sort of you know have these prejudices and um, you know who you would like who you would have issues with you know whether it was in the decision making table or any of that uh, you know management issues that you come across so i think um, what i did very earlier very early on in my career was to was the myth that i need to be louder uh, for my for my voice to be heard i need to be in your face for my presence to be felt and all of that was actually the wrong thing to do and i realized that i just need to make sure that i'm accepted the way i am and i need to be authentic and i don't have to pretend to be a man or um, you know say that okay now listen i i need to kind of show these guys that i can do it and you know i too can be louder and i too can be sort of uh, just like the men in the room and that was a mistake i made and yes there were individuals who were constantly judging me uh but i overcame that by just making peace with the fact that i am in the minority but i can still make my presence felt with the personality that i am with the value that i bring to the table and with uh, raising my level of competencies and skills um and i like i said the culture was enabling the tata culture is still enabling they always tend to nurture and you know sort of give women that opportunity uh, uh you know as much as that they would give, give the men so i'm kind of fortunate from that perspective so yeah i didn't have too many obstacles but yes certain individuals one had to kind of battle with then you know in terms of perceptions and things absolutely absolutely miss goshal uh, your your uh, um, story i mean have you faced such situations uh, Uh, what were Miss Dang and Miss uh, Lalwani spoke about? So now, uh, thanks, Rohil. Uh, Rohil, I'd be, you know, I'd be amiss and and probably not speaking the full truth if I said I haven't faced situations. But at the same time, I have to say that uh, you know the challenges that I faced were also to do with the fact that a bit of stereotyping, and not just stereotyping because you're a woman and you're supposed to only do so much. but stereotyping also because of the choice of career that i decided to take very early on which was public relations and somehow the career itself so hill was uh, rohil sorry was was uh, you know was sort of stereotyped into a women's career was stereotyped into a good to do thing was stereotyped into something initially which was you know which was not part of the decision making of a corporate uh, you know and a corporate culture and and was not that the center and was not always a function that had a seat on the table so for me that was you know in the early days of my career i would say what what was you know what was an eye opener but at the same time i think a couple of things happened one the importance of public relations and corporate communications became more and more realized uh, and more and more something that people realized was intrinsic as we saw challenges as we saw opening up of the economy as we saw global companies coming in as we also saw you know uh, issues uh, becoming center stage and which were you know which were literally leading the stock price of a company to go up and down uh, the importance of public relations became more and more and i think as leaders we started being appreciated and started getting a voice and a seat on the table and and that is you know to me that is the initial part uh, rohel which i will say was an initial part of the challenges that i faced in my career uh, right. not so much as a woman but more as the career choice that i took which was looked as as a softer career um some time ago and nobody will say that today nobody will ever say that today when we you know when with all the women power that you see in the room right now and all the corporate communication power that you see and then of course was the next step that i took in my career 
which I, I went into uncharted territory, which was into government affairs and, uh, you know, policy and into mm -hmm. CSR. And uh, those were areas that I hadn't done before. But at the same time, you know, the, the challenge of taking those on, the challenge of learning a new area, but also then leading that for an organization, perhaps with people reporting to you who had far more experience in that area. But what you brought in was your insight. What you brought in was the experience of a full corporate communication professional as well as a corporate professional. And that, you know, so those, those were the challenges around, around the way. But I think the one thing that has underscored my career uh, and has been the wind beneath my wings has been mentors and sponsors across the way. And at some point, you know, during this discussion, I think that's a really, really critical point that I'd like to bring uh, you know, up for discussion and the importance of sponsors, the importance of mentorship, especially where women are concerned and the importance right. of paying it forward. Right. I saw Ruby around. I think um, if she is here, okay, I, I can't see it. But uh, so I want to uh, uh, request my colleague uh, Rochika to ask her set of questions. Rochika, why don't you start yours? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ruhel. I hope everyone is um, audible. Good evening to our esteemed guests here. You have to be I louder. I can't hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Slightly better. Yeah. Uh, first of all, a very good evening to all the esteemed guests here present. My first question is that uh, women leaders value work-life balance. So what do you think are the key reasons that make them great leaders? Uh, Ms. Lalani, can you please start? Yeah, so if I heard the question, it was about how do they manage work-life balance? Was that yes. your question? And what are the key reasons? Yes, and what are the key reasons that make them be a great leader? Good leaders, okay. So yeah, I mean, women want to give their heart and soul to everything they do, whether it's their profession or their family life. And I think um, that's who they are. Uh, it's not like they have a great work-life balance. They want to have it. And sometimes for people like us who are career women and like my other colleagues here on the panel today, we struggle. But the thing is that we're equally passionate about making things work for our family and whether it's our children or our extended family. So that's who we are as people. What makes us a successful leaders is, I think, the obvious ones, which everyone perhaps has stated in the past, which is we do have a higher emotional quotient and therefore we can understand people better, bring in that layer of empathy, which is very important in leadership. And we bring that very easily because we are nurturing. Um, we're very collaborative. I think it comes very easily to, uh, to us to be a team player. Um, we don't necessarily like to operate solo because we feel teamwork can make the dream work. Um, but it, we're very good with, um, uh, conflict um, resolution, um, again, because we pick up nuances, we pick up dynamics very easily, and we're able to work around it and are extremely adept at, um, you know, at conflict resolution, like I said. Um, so a lot of soft skills, and apart from of the, the obvious ones of having the competencies and having the skills that is required for the job, um, these are uh, really good soft skills that make them effective and successful and empathetic leaders. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah. Ms. Salwani. Ms. Dang, I would like to ask the same question. What is your take on this? Uh, Ma'am, you're So your audio is muted. Okay. Uh, I agree with uh, Rakhi. I think at some stage we realize that we can't be and we are not super women. We can't do everything. But uh, at the same time, I think there is a drive within us to be good at work as well. And uh, at least for me, I, uh, I learned, uh, as I think uh, Rakhi also said, that to be assertive and not to be aggressive which worked. I'm very ambitious as well. And I think I am lucky to have a partner who understood that and that we are, we are both uh, wanted to be extremely good professionals and uh, also somehow managed to, you know, chart time between the family 
and between work, uh, manage the pressures. There were some uh, bad ones when my kids both had their boards and things like that. Or when I took a small sabbatical in between because uh, my kids were very small. Uh, so you manage to do these things because you have to. Uh, you have to, you have all your responsibilities that you need to do. Uh, and I, I think also, if you give your team that understanding that, yes, you give your best. And I also want that understanding from my, uh, you know, uh, mentors and, and uh, the persons I work for directly, uh, that helps. Uh, you know, the, the companies I worked with, whether it was Fidelity or the CSC, the, you know, and, and uh, uh, other international companies, and even the Indian ones. Uh, Indian ones tend to be a little more, I think, um, patronizing, which you need to put aside, the, uh, which is changing, which is good to see, uh, but yet they understand. Um, and when you deliver and you get your teams to deliver, uh, you manage to somehow get a work-life balance. It's not easy. Uh, do we get pangs of guilt on, on occasions from about what we're doing to our family or what we're doing at uh, uh, enable to do something at work? I don't think that's happened. I think we tend to push ourselves more at work and uh, something has to give way at home. So somebody picks up that flack at home. Uh, that's how it is. Or somebody doesn't pick up the flak at home and you make it up at some other time. It's never easy. I agree. It's always juggling. Yeah. Okay. So moving on to Ms. Moshal, uh, what, is, uh, what do you want to say on the key aspects that makes a woman a great leader? I think a couple of things. I mean, uh, Shravani and Rakhi have spoken about quite a few things, but the one thing I think uh, which makes us uh, really good at leadership is that we're good at multitasking and prioritizing at the same time. Um, and it's something, I mean, it, I, I don't have anything against men, so Rahil, sorry about that, but it's something that I feel women do better, that they're able to multitask far, uh, far better and also within the multitasking, prioritize far, far better. So I think that's one thing that I would say that it makes uh, women leaders really special in addition to what Rakhi and Shravani have spoken about. The other thing is we're not shy to ask for help. And, and that is something I think that really underscores you know, leadership. You're not shy to raise your hand and say, this is something I need to know more about. This is something that I need to learn about or ask for help. And I think, I think that, that, that asking for help also extends in the personal space where you have a conflict and you, know, and you have to have then an ecosystem of support around you to be able to then succeed in your career. You have to have something that's a support back home, someone, something, an ecosystem, a system in place that is there, that is allowing you to take all those chances, that is allowing you to extend yourself, that is allowing you to both for men and women but I think women are just better asking for help and better at setting up that ecosystem of support. So I think I've been extremely, extremely fortunate in having that ecosystem of support from the beginning, whether it's been my mother, my husband, or you know, or even my son and everybody else around me. And I, I think that's the other thing that makes women uh, leaders even more effective. Uh, not that men don't have that support, but they will think twice before asking for it. So, so these are these are the two sort of things that I think that sort of stand out for me. Okay, I, I want to come in here, Ruby. If you can switch on the camera, we can see you here in case you're able. To. Oh, great! Sorry, Ruby. I can see you driving. I was out on yeah. the road. <laughs> sorry, I, sorry, I told Saran. Lovely. So let's have some perspectives from you um, quickly. Uh, some uh, initial. What I my first question was some initial incidents or you know uh, situations that you remember before you landed up in that leadership role what all do you have to overcome so 
so sorry for the background noise you know suddenly i was uh, driving up but i stopped the car and now i'm uh, you know thanks thanks for this opportunity royal and uh, ruchika you know as uh, i started off as a journalist and uh, you know when when you start off as a career when i was studying journalism uh, there were a lot of men around and uh, but eventually when i went to do a course in film making there were very few women over there i think i was probably the only woman amongst the batch of men around there and from there when i uh, came to communications as people earlier mentioned there were a lot of women in our business but what i also saw is that a lot of women actually left uh, uh, midway in their careers so when you start your journey at the entry point there were a lot of women and uh, eventually you know uh, many of them had to take a sabbatical in between or leave because of all the challenges that they faced on the way and so eventually when i started commune my own enterprise uh, that's my, that was my initial purpose you know because i could i had faced these challenges myself you know after the birth of my daughters and i felt that let me bring these women back into the forefront so we started commune with a bunch of working working work from home mothers so work from home was a reality for us then and we got these trained communications professionals who had taken a sabbatical and were at home to come back and join the business and according to their flexibility of course the biggest challenge that i faced as an entrepreneur along the way was to get people to take me seriously and don't not think that it's a part time business that you're doing so uh, so you know so so if you are really looking at a scalable business uh, somewhere um, it's a challenge for even the woman to come across and you know what people are saying a lot of of my co panelists have said uh, work life balance is a big issue with women but uh, now it i also feel it's a, it's more about work life integration so if you feel you right. can really work it out amidst the challenges and there can be no excuse for not being professional enough with a client or committing you know or delivering on something that you have promised so uh, the yeah so that was one of the biggest challenge to you know really get big clients and people to take you seriously that you are in there for the long run perfect you know what's brilliant about this panel is that men and are in minority here very few panels <laughs> that you see so you know uh, ms goshal you touched upon you touched upon this subject uh, this word of uh, mentorship you know <laughs> leadership and uh, in that that plays a crucial role in uh, addressing the gender gap that we often speak about one my question to ms lalwani starting with you is how are you mentoring uh, the the i mean the women in in your workforce uh, uh, what is the current situation of the workforce like in your industry is it are men also very sensitive about that you know they have been on the receiving end of this conversation and they need to address these issues what is your observation on that front sorry audio uh, is muted yeah your first question was also about mentorship uh, and yeah. how we are doing that yeah so at a personal level i'm i'm mentoring a few people through various um, organizations and bodies like gwpr and um, also um a promise foundation at a professional level um, i've uh, just been made the head of uh, diversity for indian hotels company um and one of my biggest um, sort of goals and objectives is to increase the participation of women at all levels not just at the entry level which actually is fairly high in the industry across hotels across unstructured structure and like every other industry they drop off in the middle and at the senior level it's a huge challenge and honestly that is going to be my number one uh, sort of point in the agenda is to increase participation participation across all levels especially in the middle level so that they make it till that level to grow into senior leadership roles um the percentage is not great it's between 17 to 20 um i think at an average we're possibly a little higher being being a tata organization but we need to do far far better i mean as we know there is you know a, a huge potential population in our country uh, that is waiting to be tapped and we are an industry that i think fits very well for uh, for women uh, because they have so many natural skills uh, that they can sort of bring to the table um which is very great for hospitality so yes i think it's a, it's a huge agenda point for um my organization and me personally because i feel very very strongly about getting more involved 
So, yeah. Right. Ms. Dang, uh, where do you see the gender conversation right now in the times we live in? Has it improved? Uh, where is it headed? Oh, um, so let me flip your questions around a little bit when I answer them. I think uh, the gender conversation is at a very good place now. And if I've seen it from my career, and if I look back to even uh, to my mother who had a career, it's, it's unbelievable where we are. I think women uh, have a voice, they have a seat at the table and are given opportunities. And it, it's not happened automatically. I think we've all worked hard for it. I was lucky. I got the right breaks. I got the right buses. I got a seat at the table. Um, and at the same time, I think um, uh, there is an awareness that the leadership skills and the professional skills that women bring are very different. And a balanced leadership is is something that organizations do need. Right. Uh, and I don't think there's any um, argument on that front. Right. Uh, two right. things that have happened in the global world. One is of course, the Me Too thing that happened and other issues like that. I'm, so I'm just bringing that in. I know it's unpleasant, but that has enabled women um, worldwide to, uh, uh, bring in issues that was actually stopping them from having an equal kind of an opportunity or being equal in the same world. Uh, and those, that is good. That is good. Uh, that's what I have to say. Right. Ms. Gushal, uh, the point came from your earlier answer about mentorship uh, in your organization. How are you handholding people and sensitizing both the genders about, uh, you know, the divide that is there that we very often talk about? So, Rahel, I think I think you you hit the nail on the head when you said both the genders, and I think that's the point that I do want to bring at this point that it's not about mentoring women alone, um, and it is not about sensitizing women alone. If we don't bring in men into the conversation we'll never be able to be an equal absolutely. opportunity employer. And that, that to me is absolutely vital to the whole discussion. So even at Johnson & Johnson, you know, it is part of our credo, this entire piece about, uh, you know, about, about being a equal opportunity employer and creating an inclusive environment, respecting the dignity, dignity diversity of all people, irrespective of gender. So that is, you know, that is the most, most important thing that I want to, you know, wanted to highlight. And I think also, you know, for, for large organizations and a number of us to represent those or have worked with those, in order to succeed, in order to grow, in order to innovate, we need to understand the diversity of our customers, the diversity of our consumers, every, everybody that we say, uh, serve, and therefore, you know, this, this entire piece about diversity, about having a conversation becomes fundamental to that discussion. So when it comes to mentorship also, of course, we have formal programs at Johnson & Johnson, both at the regional level and at the, uh, you know, at the India level. But at the same time, there are programs that are focused towards, say, women, but there are programs that are gender agnostic. And for this reason only that it is most critical to bring in uh, men into the conversation. Otherwise, you're not gonna succeed with what you want to do. And, and the other thing I do wanna say is that, you know, especially COVID times have made it so important to understand about, you know, about this whole concept of a purpose-driven, compassionate, agile organization that can only come if we appreciate diverse views, if we get that, you know, empathy going into that entire discussion. And, and mentorship, of course, has a role to play there. But at the same time, uh, you know, it is it it has to be gender agnostic, um, and it has to pull in everybody. Because also, what's happened is Rohil that set stereotypical roles, even in the home environment, have changed. You know, the 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 areas yeah. which were demarcated, I feel, have changed as well. You know, both partners are playing equal role in 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 achieving success professionally as well as. Uh, in, in the home environment. 
and COVID has only sort of precipitated Absolutely. that. So I would just say that that's a critical area Absolutely. that we need, to, we need to bring up as well. Jordi, we have 10 minutes left. So before I go to Ruchika, I want to quickly go to Ruby uh, with her thoughts on this. Uh, on yeah. the question of, yes. On the gender diversity thing. You know, you know that's a very that's a very important topic and when you look at it there are two aspects you, uh, i'm just speaking as an entrepreneur right here because uh, i've been through this experience where i've seen it's very different the gender diversity is very different in india between the metros and the tier 2 and the tier 3 cities and there you require a lot of mentoring for women especially along with a lot of empathy which i feel is so important uh, from a leader leadership point of view so uh, what i what i started after starting commune i felt there's a lot of um, mentorship requirement for women at that uh, in especially in the tier 2 tier 3 cities so i started a started a platform called sheatwork.com which who which is like an information platform for aspiring women entrepreneurs especially from the smaller cities that's what my focus is beyond and we as well as we go to other geographies and these women can be entrepreneurs across uh, different uh, you know different professions or different uh, any sector that they look at and that's where we started even mentoring right. programs for them we had started skilling programs for them so uh, so for me i feel uh, you know if you get if you bring in more entrepreneurs you will have, you'll have 150 to 170 million new jobs uh, by you know women will bring in those jobs by 2025 so uh, so men do have a very important right. role to play in this entire conversation and uh, we can only do our best to bring in more right. and more women into this fold. Over to you, Ruchika. I was told it's five minutes, so it's going to be a 30-second yeah. answer. So over to you. Okay. Thank you. So uh, my, uh, I have a question that is that uh, today also we see that most of the decision-taking, making positions is in this country or any other country or organizations are male dominant. So what do you think that there is still a distrust in the women leaders? What is your take, Ms. Dan? Uh, uh, we've had a woman prime minister for men who don't agree with that at all. Um, you know, uh, maybe in some, I think most organizations, the decisions, um, uh, are uh, weighed against certain parameters. They are uh, taken because uh, it has to be a good business decisions, uh, a good business decision. So I don't think gender comes into it. All right. Okay, Miss uh, Lalva, what is your answer. take on this? Discrimination, uh, definitely. Um, but you can't just spin it only to discrimination. I think there is an issue of numbers of women at that level who are competent and capable enough. To, to take that uh, seat or that position. So we need to grow the numbers. We need to definitely mitigate the discrimination as well, parallelly, and also realize the importance of gender balance, which I think everyone has spoken about, which is very important today. And the fact that women perhaps very, very genders, um, whether it's to country or to organizations, uh, which is required today, you know? So whether it's in terms of social change, like you said, uh, Rahul, at the beginning of the session, or in terms of just, you know, uh, partaking in education and in increasing uh, sort of welfare initiatives for women or, or even climate change, which is extremely, extremely critical today, to realize the importance of the fact that women can bring in that change and to have them in the decision, in, you know, on the seat and in the decision making table. Uh, but yes, I feel that there's a lot uh, that we need to do as, as, as a unit as well as individually. So, yeah. Can I, can I say something here, please? Okay, yes, sure. See, if you look at school and college, 50%, if you look at school and college, over 50% of people coming out are women. They are getting into the work, work life, uh, into the workforce. So I think we are getting into better times yeah. when decisions will be well balanced and taken by uh, for uh, the right reasons. No, absolutely. We are, we are short on time, I'm sorry. Yes, 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 yeah. sorry. Uh, Ms. Goshal and Ms. Sina, to you. I, I just have one point here, which I'm going to quickly add. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, just one point, uh, you know, we need more women at the top. 
So if you look at it amongst the Nifty 50 companies, there's only one woman CEO in India. If you look at our parliament today, there are only 4.3% women parliamentarians. They were 20% earlier. So if there are no, if we need more women at the top, who can bring, you know, because women will know women, you know, problems which other women feel. So diversity from a women point of view, I mean, of course, organizations have their own business decision, but it helps to have more women at the top, which I feel, which is solely lacking right now in India. So, uh, I mean, right. you know, the data right. supports that. So just Ms. very Prashant quickly, quickly Rohel and Ruchika, to me, the challenge is not that women are not heard at the top. It is, of course, about the numbers. But me, for me, the challenge is unconscious biases. Um, and that, you know, when those come into decision making, that becomes a huge, huge sort of challenge. Uh, and, and therefore, it's not about the fact that I'm a woman, I'm not being heard. But it's about the fact that there might be people around the table who have an unconscious bias, or I might have an unconscious bias. And therefore, that's become a very important area, uh, Rohail and Ruchika, for, uh, you know, for companies to really focus on uh, today to, in order to ensure that everyone is heard, everyone's voice is heard, and that decision making happens in a very, uh, you know, uh, not always a democratic manner, but after everybody's opinion is taken into account. Uh, but ultimately, there has to be one decision maker. So, thank you so much. Uh, I feel an extreme minority. Okay, thank you, Karan. I can see him here. Okay, over to you, Kathy. Now, thank you. I just, thank you so uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody. Thank you, Raki. Thank you, Shabdi. Thank, thank you, Josna. And thank you, Ruby. And thank you, Karan, for coming and giving some balance to the gender. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you know, your Ruby was uh, traveling. I said, no, you'll have to come. And Raki was being very kind. And so is Josna. Shamni ji, of course, there is a very big announcement which we'll make later in the evening. We can't reveal it now, but yeah, <laughs> look forward to it. Thank you, everyone. You can call me Shavani. You don't have to call me Shavani ji. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay. you. It's out Thank of reverence you. and respect for you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so much. Thank you, Rohail. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for sharing the insights. Thanks. So Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you so much. Super bye. Thanks. So without further ado, I'm going to invite our last keynote session of the day, most awaited one here. I'd like to welcome Dr. Maya Akbil, B. Bill Akbil, Doctor of Clinical Psychology, Psychology for You. Welcome, Maya. Hello, Maya has decades of expertise with a multicultural and multinational population. She firmly believes in evidence-based and community-based programs promoting self-actualization in an integrative approach, promoting clients' inner resourcefulness. Today, she's going to talk to us about emotional agility, a key skill to achieving success facing change. So very warm welcome, and we are really looking forward to the session. Thank you so much. I'm, um, I'm really honored to be part of the Women um, Achievement uh, Awards and Summit. Thank you so much, Karen, uh, for having inviting me, and thank you for Exchange for Media. Um, to allow me to participate in this great event. I was listening to the previous participants and um, I was really happy to hear um, really fall into the psychological functions that I'm gonna address with you right now that really contribute to women achieving success and not only women, uh, but also men. Uh, I'm just gonna take a minute to uh, share the slide and here we are. What, what I find very interesting is that, and what we're looking at right now is we are facing very peculiar times, um, times that are really hard. And I find it always very controversial when I hear people talking about how we could lead the stress-free life right now. Well, I wanna say we cannot really lead the stress-free life since the outburst of the pandemic. Um, and, and by the way, I hope that things are much better in India. Um, I hear throughout the world that even here in Morocco where I'm, um, where I'm based, things are not doing that uh, great, but hopefully things are gonna just get better with all the, um, the I said the interventions that are put in place by the different governments. Uh, but what I wanted to say is we cannot really talk about stress free. Um, I really want to talk about stress friendly. And to talk about stress friendly, there are a lot of 
and different psychological functions that take in place. And one of them um, is what we call emotional agility. Earlier, um, four great women, I, I had the chance to hear what you were sharing in terms of your personal and professional experiences. Um, all of you were talking about empathy, about this ability of juggling different things, um, the agility of leading the work and personal lives, uh, the multitasking. And right now, women and men are exactly facing that since, um, since we've been uh, facing a pandemic that has really put our lives um, I would say upside down. And I really like this quote because we never know if down is better than upside unless we experience it. So right now, as I work with my clients, I really can observe a broad range of emotions as I listen to them sharing how their lives have been completely changed uh, and moved around. And um, they were really facing a different way of looking at things and perceiving their daily routines uh, from leaving uh, work, dropping the kids and going to their offices. Uh, men, women and kids found themselves um, in the same place trying to figure out how they were going to go about their daily activities. Um, some are embracing what is ahead and others really feel the grief of, for what our normal lives um, used to hold for us. And the current forecast gives us an outlook that make it seem that normal will be um, will actually be gone for an extended period of time. So, so we either put in place new tools and strategies to face what is ahead or uh, we live the struggles of trying to go back to what is familiar, uh, but without much um, success. So this situation that we're living really gives us the opportunity to enhance our emotional agility. How we see the current situation is mainly rooted in three factors, our beliefs, our experiences, and our assumptions. So as we can change um, the circumstances, we cannot change the current pandemic, uh, but being able to adjust our frame of reference and to choose how we react to this situation is where our personal power lies. And I wanna say not only the pandemic, but just the daily changes, working from home, having to um, organize uh, the workspace at home while the kids are next door and having to um, take online classes and then doing the homework. So this is something that really applies on um, every single level of our daily lives. And when we look at the modern psychology, um, we see that how, how our belief system impact our own abilities and potential. Um, it really fuels our behaviors and it predicts or not our success. Uh, much of that understanding comes from the theory that has been presented by Dr. Carol Dweck, where she speaks about the growth of the mindset theory. And basically what it says is that changing even the simplest um, belief will impact uh, nearly every aspect of our life. And I think all of us did experience that with the lockdown, where we, um, throughout the planet, we found ourselves locked within our homes, um, having to really look into what seemed normal as being abnormal and to relearn how we could manage our daily responsibilities and our daily lives. So depending on which way we see the challenge or the opportunity, uh, Dweck's work shows the power of our, our most basic beliefs, whether conscious or subconscious, they strongly affect how we want and whether we succeed in getting it. So basically, much of what we think we understand of our personality comes from our mindset. So if we're thinking we could handle another lockdown, let's hope it's not going to be the case. Well, we might really develop the internal resources to face that situation 
one more time. If we really think that we don't and we can't handle that, well, basically that's not gonna be um, a walk in the park. So if you're like most people, a typical day at the office or working online uh, from home raises all kinds of challenging and involuntary thoughts and feelings. So stress can be a sign that we are doing things that are valuable. Um, and a lack of stress, well, could be a sign of boredom or doing something that is disengaging. And it is often during times of greatest growth and learning and challenges that we are experiencing stress. And as Susan David, the psychologist says, you don't get to grow in your career, raise a family or leave the world a better place that you found it without some stress or discomfort. So basically, discomfort is the price of admission to meaningful life. So today the question is, do we have the emotional agility to put our inner turmoil to good use and do we address it or do we just run from it doing exactly what we know um, what to do and how to do it basically just going with the familiar habits so how can we tell good stress from bad stress well the answer is pretty simple it really comes down to coping. Bad stress is caused by stressors that are beyond our individual personal coping resources. Um, you're gonna tell me, well, we don't have all the same coping resources, and that is true. Um, bad stress is really different from everyone. So just like what overwhelms one person might be a walk in the park for another person. So when we look at uh, leaders, um, workers, executives within the work environment, there's a prevailing wisdom uh, that says that they should be either stoic or cheerful, so basically stress-free, and they must project confidence and damp down any negativity bubbling up inside them. So basically, if we're look, if we're talking about women achievers, there is that expectation, especially when they are um and leader positions that they're not and they should not be emotional and they should not address any kind of situation from an emotional point of view or perspective but actually that goes against basic biology all healthy human um beings have an inner stream of thoughts feelings that includes doubts, criticism, joy, stress, fear. And that is just exactly what our minds um, need to do. That's the job they were designed to do, trying to anticipate and solve problems and avoid potential pitfalls. And I, I believe that every woman is going to say that it's exactly what we do on a daily basis. We are multitasking. We're going to be thinking about uh, how we're going to do the next project presentation uh, in front of the CEO. But at the same time, we're thinking about that homework that our son or daughter has to do while planning uh, a family dinner. Um, and that's exactly what our brains do. But for them to do that, they need to be attuned to what they pick up from the external world uh, through our emotions. So at work, individuals stumble, not because they have undesirable thoughts and feelings, actually that's inevitable, but because they get hooked by them like fish cut on a line. And this happens in one of two ways. They either buy into their thoughts, treating them uh, like facts, um, and um, they avoid any situation that evoke them. So let's say if um, some of, um, if, if a worker uh, thinks that her job is not good enough and that she doesn't, is not comfortable presenting orally, she will avoid constantly putting herself out there and presenting her ideas to her uh, chief because she believes she cannot do it. Or it could be a different way. Um, a person will challenge the existence of the thoughts um, and try to rationalize it uh, by actually exposing herself to a situation that is against her core value. Either way, 
the person, the individual, is paying way too much attention to her or his internal chatter and allowing it to sabotage important cognitive resources that could be put to better use um, for her um, achieving success. So the internal, the internal chatter turns into stories that interpret the facts. Um, it is therefore important to identify what kind of internal chatters we have. Um, mind you that 16,000 is how many words we speak on average each day. So imagine how many unspoken ones course through our minds, and most of them are not facts, but evaluations and judgments entwined with emotions, some positives and helpful, and some less. So I'm thinking about all those women trying to juggle personal, professional life, their couple, their family relationships, their children, caretaking, while not expressing how they feel and not accessing their internal resources because they have to portray themselves as only thinkers and achievers who are only thinkers. And basically, uh, that would be a perfectionist uh, style um, of internal chatter, uh, which is a thinking trap. Uh, and these stressful thinking traps make actually change hard. And as we cannot change the current circumstances, the pandemic, or as an executive or worker or a collaborator cannot change the work environment, well, her ability to adjust her frame of reference and to choose how she can react to that situation is where her personal power lies. Um, and to adjust to a frame of reference where there are three important things uh, that needs to be put in place, agency, agility, and attitude. And today I'm really gonna focus on emotional agility. Emotional agility means you can accept, understand, and manage your thoughts in a productive way. Effective leaders don't buy into or try to express their inner experiences. Instead, they approach them in a mindful, value-driven, and productive way, developing what we call emotional agility. And emotional agility really englobes empathy, the ability to juggle between different tasks, the multitasking and performance agility. So in our complex, fast changing knowledge economy, this ability to manage one thoughts and feeling is really essential to achieving success. Uh, in his research studies, Frank Bond showed that emotional agility can help people alleviate stress, reduce error, and become more innovative and uh, boost their creativity. So, um, Susan David, who was the first to address the notion of emotional agility, speaks of four essential steps. The showing up, the stepping out, the walking your why, and the moving on. So the first step is having the space to show up for your emotions and stress. Not to dwell on them, but to learn from them. What am I feeling right now? What does it say about my value? An emotional agile um, woman is able, and a man is able to recognize her, his or her feelings with self-compassion and understanding. The stepping out is the next step. Well, basically it means specifically labeling the problem. For example, I feel stressed. Well, I wanna tell you, I feel stressed doesn't really mean much. Um, it might mean an individual is disappointed point in is in a situation it might also mean he or she does not feel right about an obligation or it what? might mean they are not being heard perhaps and uh somebody speaking i'm just gonna stop i just heard or i'm just gonna go on no no you um, go on you go on please okay so it might I feel stress. You, we really need to define what it means. So it might mean also that I'm not being heard at work during my meetings or at home. So once a stressful situation is diagnosed specifically, it's much easier to create an action plan to move forward. Walking your way is the third step 
of emotional agility. It involves self-identifying values. Even in times where we are right and others are wrong, we still have the capacity to make choices that are values aligned. It is important for individuals to reflect, even in the context of all this change, for example, who do I want to be? Even in the context of a conflict, who do I want to be? It is important for me to be um, a contributor? Is it for me important to be a collaborator or an innov um, innovator? So I think it's really important that to um, ask ourselves what kind of person I want to be in the situation that I'm facing, even if a situation is a conflictual one, a challenging one, and a stressful one. And then moving on. So once we've impacted what we're feeling, um, why we are feeling the way we are feeling and aligned all the next steps with um, what we want to be and focus on, it is time to move on and take action. So emotionally agile individuals handle, handle situations as they come up, feel them fully, make a plan and don't delay. And I know I'm smiling because most women have that. Um, I believe one of the speakers earlier was saying that women uh, leaders are inclined to have much more success because that's a natural resource they have. So emotional agility is both a practical set of tools and a means of building uh, resilience. It is a pathway where individuals can stop ignoring or being beaten by their stress and learn to become more comfortable with feeling uncomfortable. So if a mother is really stressed because she needs to be up on her task, uh, ready for her um, AM presentation while she had to care for her baby, well, that's okay to feel uncomfortable and it's okay to feel um, and to be attuned to her emotional needs so they can guide her to get um, to, to, to get what she needs to be a better performer, be it as a caretaker or um, as a work collaborator. So whether it is in the workplace or in personal situation, emotional agility provides the framework for people to think about who they want to be in difficult situations and then become that person. So um, I, I really thought that all of us um, beyond our borders, beyond our languages, beyond our cultures, we look to um, inspiring people. And like these inspiring individuals who embrace their fears, face the diversity, define their values and foster change, each one of you, each one of us, really can foster emotional agility to build a dynamic that will tackle problems, inspire growth, and effectively manage stress um, along the way. And I really believe that developing emotional agility will get you um, and um, anyone to open their wings and to continue achieving and thriving. So while I really like this quote, because while crawl through life, when we were born uh, with wings. So for me, women achievers are women who were able to really spread their wings and inspire younger girls um, and continue transmitting um, their ability to be emotionally attuned to their needs and the needs of their ecosystem. A woman who is an achiever and who has succeeded, she didn't succeed alone and she doesn't succeed alone because she's always working within her community. I'm going to stop here and I'm going to let you. Thank you, Maya. We have two questions which Kathy will share with you and then we'll sign off. The, okay. We have the winners waiting, so we'll just proceed. Yeah, Kathy, please move on. Absolutely. Uh, so 
Dr. Maya, firstly, thank you for sharing those insights here with us. And uh, we have this question which says that what are the advances and barriers within psychology for women? Could you, could you just say the last part because I couldn't hear you. Yeah, what are the advances and barriers within the field of psychology for women? Well, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna answer the question differently. Um, in the field of psychology, we really look at uh, personality functioning, uh, behavioral attitudes um, and thoughts. So I'm not gonna talk in terms of um, successes or barriers. It's, uh, it's a field that really um, tries to look at the individual's development from an integrated and an integrative um, perspective. So specifically for women, research will always look at what are um, women's, uh, what women are facing as challenges, uh, but also as successes. Um, and there are different themes that we could look at uh, in terms of uh, what women are facing um, as challenges and successes throughout their lifespan. Right. Um, Dr. Maya, a very interesting question uh, I have for you, which I'm sure a lot of our viewers will benefit from, which is that do you think gender disparity and mental health are interlinked? It's an excellent question. It's really uh, an excellent question. Um, I'm, I don't think, and that's um, based on my experience and expertise, I would, I would link the gender disparity to the economical access to mental health. So we know statistically that women ha have less access to health overall because of lesser access to higher um, salaries, you know, and, and the rates of poverty are higher within the um, uh, female community versus the male community. So accessing mental health is not due to, to gender disparity. It's more due to not accessing it because of a lack of means. Right. That's one. The second point is when you look at um, small communities, villages, uh, the inaccessibility to mental health is due to the fact that there is no way to access larger cities and towns because there are no com commutes, um, means of commutes. So men are able to access public transportation while at times women don't access that easily public transportation. So they don't access um, health services. Right. And uh, if you'd like to throw some light on what uh, COVID kind of implications has had on people in general, if you'd like to throw some light on that. I think really the pandemic has uh, exposed humanity to really question our essentials, to really reevaluate our core beliefs in terms of our abilities and limitations. And what we have found is that people who were previously more attuned to their emotional needs and had developed stronger internal resources facing challenges did better facing the lockdown and facing um, all the consequences of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And people who were struggling beforehand, you know, yeah. well, it was much more challenging to make sense of what has been going on since the outburst of the COVID. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Maya. It's been a sure, pleasure certainly. to have you on this platform and share your expertise and your insights with us. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And congratulations to the winner. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Maya. So, um, Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Care. It was amazing. Uh, uh, Kiyati, uh, um, uh, Mr. Ahuja is joining us in some minutes and then followed by... Uh, so we'll take a quick one-minute break and then sure. we'll get on with the valedictory session. Absolutely. 
So till then, let me uh, thank all of you who've been part of this summit so far. And if you have any key highlights that you'd like to share with the wider audience, then don't forget to do so in the comment chat box or tweet to us using the hashtag E4M Women Achievers. And yes, we have the awards coming right up and my friend, colleague Bhavna Bhatia will be taking you through it. So I'll be signing off here and uh, leaving you with some audio visuals while we get the stage ready for the E4M second edition of E4M Women Achievers Awards. Thank you so much, everyone. We will see you again shortly, but not with me, but with my friend Bhavna. So till then, stay tuned, everybody. Can we have the AV still then? Hi, Bhavna. <laughs> hi, hi, how are you doing? Very well. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing great. So firstly, thank you so much. The Excellent. Let's first have a look at the AVs and we'll progress. It is a scooter. Hot pink or baby pink? Girls go Wow. Nay pleasure. Right? Okay. Pahle na, mene power ka socha. Nahi hai ye kya socha? Kya socha? Mileage. Khandala chale. Okay. Chodna. Phir socha about power too. Hey, ratio. अब इन सब में तुम्हारे पिंक का सोचना तो मैं भूल ही गई अब पता है क्या सोच रही हूं क्या सोच रही हो व्हाई शुड बॉयज हैव ऑल द फन बोल न्यू स्टाइल जिपी राइट बट वही इजी हैंडलिंग नए हीरो प्लेजर प्लस से में नहीं पड़ती हो तब हर बार मनाती हो तुम आजादी हर बार जब नहीं देखती तुम घड़ी की सुई जब हर बात को नहीं कहती तुम सही हर बार जब तोड़ती हो ग्लास सीलिंग जब खुल के एक्सप्रेस करती हो फीलिंग तब हर बार मनाती हो तुम आजादी हर बार जब लगाती हो कमेंट्स पे ब्रेक जब करती हो अपने करियर को एक्सेलरेट और हर बार जब तुम बेफिक्र बिंदास सड़कों पे निकलती हो तब हर बार मनाती हो तुम आजादी क्योंकि आजादी तुम्हारे लिए एक दिन नहीं एक आदत है मनाओ आजादी हर बार हर दिन वी बिलीव दैट एवरी कॉर्पोरेशन एंड ब्रांड हैज अ पब्लिक and today's public is more powerful than ever before. They have the power to topple CEOs, reshape strategy, influence government policy, kill products and create unicorns. They demand truth, transparency and the highest behavioral standards. We are embracing change, constantly innovating the way our clients and the public communicate, whatever the sector and whatever the challenge. Our client obsession means constantly evolving new products and services. We are innovating the future of public relations. Our belief is that brands with a clear authentic purpose and performance strategies aligned to business objectives are most likely to succeed. We use strategy, creativity and innovation driven by data and analytics to put your purpose and performance at the heart of all communications. Together, purpose and performance drive audience preference. We call this approach 3P Communications. Hill and Knowlton Strategies, always in beta. So ladies and gentlemen, well, we hope you're having a great time. Welcome to the second edition of the Exchange for Media, PR and Corp Communication, Women Achievers Summit and Awards 2021 presented by Ad Factors PR, powered by Standard Chartered Bank, Hero Motor Corp, PhonePay, Hill & Knowlton Strategies, Gold Partner, Tute Consulting. 
Well, ladies and gentlemen, the summit and awards are the celebration of the contribution of women and their relentless pursuit of excellence in the field of public relations and communications. My name is Bhavna Bhatia, and I shall be your host for the awards segment. Well, the second edition of the awards identifies, acknowledges, and felicitate those women leaders who are shaping the industry through their incredible work. Through this initiative, we would applaud the agencies and corporates who are setting remarkable examples by encouraging gender diversity in their work culture. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this year's jury panel was headed by Dr. Anurag Batra, Chairman and Editor-in-Chief, PW Business World and Exchange for Media, Nidhi Hola, Director, Integrated Marketing, Microsoft, Mr. Parthath Ghosh, VP and Head Corporate Communications and CSR Samsung, Ms. Rama Paul, VP Marketing, ABP, Mr. Sanjeev Handa, Senior VP and Head of Communications, Corporate Communications, Maruti, Mr. Subhaya Mishra, MD and Head, Corporate Communications, Standard Chartered Bank, Ms. Jasrita Deer, Head Marketing and Communications, Antara, Mr. Atul Sharma, Managing Director, Rudolfin, Ms. Pallavi Singh, Senior Business Advisor, Mr. Abhinav Abhishek Gulyani, CEO, Hill and Norton Strategies, Ms. Ruchira Jetli, Head of Marketing India, HMD, Ms. Kavita Jaktiani, Chief Marketing Fidelite, Ms. Prachi Mohapatra, Marketing Head, Dr. Reddy's. But let me tell you firstly, a big, big thank you to all our jury members for taking out their valuable time. The jury went through a rigorous screening process and shortlisted best 100 out of the 140 entries. Out of the shortlisted entries, top 50 plus winners, Talbots, were selected and will be honored today. Well, we also have two special Lifetime Achievement Award winners as well. Last but not the least, we also have 10 best organization which have set new precedents, milestones, and have supported the women word force through various initiatives. We will be honoring those best organization for women empowerment tonight. Well, ladies and gentlemen, before we move further with this fantastic evening ahead, let me remind you on our hashtags once again, which is hashtag E4MPR, Women Achievers were, uh, Awards as one word, E4MPR, Women Achievers Summit as one word, and E4M, e PR Women as one word. So ladies and gentlemen, before we progress into this wonderful ceremony, let's first have a look at the intro AVs and partner AVs, please. Requesting the team to please have the intro AV and partner AVs, please. Amna, uh, I will, uh, because uh, Dr. Batra and Naval are here, let's ask them to give an address and then we move on to... Of course, part. of course, let's do that, let's do that. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are very honoured. We do have Dr. Anurag Batra and Naval Ohuja who are right with us. Uh, Dr. Batra, first, over to you, sir. Thank you so much, Bhavna. Thank you for hosting this and uh, doing a great job. Uh, Karan, congratulations to you and to the entire Exchange for Media team for making this happen. Uh, uh, this is the second edition today that... Uh, deliberations and the ideation and the uh, thoughts that were shared by the leaders throughout the day uh, gave new perspectives to the communication and PR and COPCOM domain. Uh, seeing these women leaders, uh, we can safely say that our future is bright. And as I said in my opening address in the morning, the marketing, advertising media industry has a lot of women leaders, thankfully, uh, at all levels, at senior level, middle level. But within that PR and COPCOM possibly has more women leaders uh, than the average. So that augurs well for the industry. Uh, we're in the first week of July. June is celebrated as the diversity and inclusion uh, month. So clearly, uh, you know, this initiative has come at the right time. This is the second year. If it is so good and big in the second year, I can't wait to see it in the third, fourth, fifth year. I only want to say that the, looking at the winners, the age of achievement, is only getting lower and lower. And clearly the winners are multifaceted in the true sense of uh, they have a day job, they have an evening gig, they have hobbies, and they're juggling families. So clearly they're multifaceted in the true sense of it. And I salute these winners tonight, these organizations who have let these uh, leaders prosper and foster. So all the world's best. And uh, the world of PR and COPCOM is changing because social media because of online reputation management and i think in the last 16 months when the uh spends on advertising marketing media 
at least for some time came down. Uh, PR and Copcom made sure that the connection with consumers, with stakeholders kept going. Uh, July is the month of mega IPOs. Uh, you'll see many IPOs being announced and con coming up. That again means that the PR and Copcom professionals will be very busy. I think over the next 10 odd months, you'll possibly see a lot more IPOs. And in terms of the July itself, the announced uh, and the actual number will be, uh, we're looking at $25 billion of being uh, raised on the Indian borders. So clearly it's a month that will keep the PR, PR professionals uh, 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 busy. So I will uh, just say this and hand it back to you so that the awards are unique in progress. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Anurag Batra, for joining us and giving us your inputs on the same. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to call upon uh, the stage and screen, uh, Nawal Ahuja, who is uh, the co-founder of Exchange for Media Group. Uh, Nawal, over to you. So we have him for the valedictory. Thank you, Bhavna. Thank you and good evening uh, to everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure for us to have you join this uh, second edition of the Top Women Achiever Awards. As Anurag has already mentioned, uh, PR, corporate communication uh, is not a domain that has an issue with gender diversity, unlike lots of other parts of corporate India, especially the media entertainment sector. Uh, it is up there already where women have broken glass ceilings. And this uh, initiative uh, in a lot of ways recognizes that uh, effort that women have made in the industry to break the glass ceiling, to <clears throat> make it to the top. Uh, as Bhavna has mentioned, and as you will see in the AV, this year we got uh, more than 150 entries, uh, which were uh, shortlisted down by the editorial team of Exchange for Media. And uh, finally, I'm told uh, 50 odd winners were chosen, all of them top-notch uh, professionals in their respective domains. Uh, what is most interesting this year also is the uh, you know, recognition of corporates who are making extra effort uh, towards gender diversity. Yeah, and I think that's a very important aspect of uh, you know, what's happening uh, across corporate India where companies are going uh, the extra mile to uh, create an environment for women to succeed, for women to sort of uh, compete better, uh, giving them extra opportunity to be able to ba balance their various uh, you know, uh, pressures and various uh, uh, goals. Uh, so I think that's an important thing. And some of you who would have uh, logged in through the day, uh, I did uh, listen uh, partially to a couple of sessions, one by Manmi of Phone Pay and the other one by Lucy Harvey of Hill Knowlton. I think they were very interesting sessions around gender diversity, what's happening, you know, uh, as far as inclusion in the industry, in the corporate uh, and PR industry is concerned, hybrid working environment, what COVID has done, it's put significantly extra pressure on a lot of women because now you are, you know, the line between office and home uh, is not just blurred, it's completely disappeared. You are sitting at home in your office. So that's doubly hard to handle, so to say. So as Anurag said, kudos to all you women for uh, having led admirably. Uh, we look forward uh, to, you know, the knowledge you have to share and congratulating all the fantastic work you've done. Just a share of nugget, you know, I was uh, discussing this with a colleague the other day. Eight of our nine uh, you know, uh, heads of various division in exchange for media are women. So you can imagine, uh, you know, uh, uh, gender diversity for us uh, is something we practice. Uh, it is not just something that we talk about. Uh, with that, thank you again, Bhavna. Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. And I look forward to uh, celebrating the winners tonight. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Navan. And it's great to know about the gender diversity uh, in, in that respect, because you're, you're walking the talk out there. So thank you on that, uh, Navan. And uh, thank you, Dr. Anurag Batra, for joining us. Two amazing visionaries who just uh, kick-started the awards for us. So a big, big thank you once again to both of you. So ladies and gentlemen, it is now time before we start with this wonderful ceremony. Let's have a look at the intro AVs and partner AVs before we get ready to welcome all the wonderful winners on the screen. Could we have the AVs now? The second edition of Exchange for Media, PR and Corporate Communication Women Achievers Summit and Awards 2021. Presented by Ad Factors PR. Powered by Standard Chartered Bank, Hero Motocorp, PhonePay, Hill and Knowlton Strategies, Gold Partner, Toot Consulting. 
the summit and awards are the celebration of the contribution of women and their relentless pursuit of excellence in the field of public relations and communications. The second edition of the awards identifies, acknowledges and felicitates those women leaders who are shaping the industry through their incredible work. Through this initiative, we also applaud the agencies and corporates who are setting remarkable examples by encouraging gender diversity in their work culture. This year's jury panel was headed by Dr. Anurag Batra, Chairman and Editor-in-Chief, BW Business World and Exchange for Media. Ms. Nidhi Hola, Microsoft. Mr. Partha Ghosh, Samsung. Ms. Rama Paul, ABP. Mr. Sanjeev Honda, Maruti. Mr. Subhayu Mishra, Standard Chartered Bank. Ms. Jasrita Deer, Antara. Mr. Atul Sharma, Radafin. Ms. Pallavi Singh, Senior Business Advisor. Mr. Abhishek Gulyani, Hill and Knowlton Strategies. Ms. Ruchira Jaitley, HMD. Ms. Kavita Jagtiani, Pedalite. Ms. Parachi Mohapatra, Dr. Reddy's. Exchange for Media and the Jury congratulates all the winners. Hi, my name is Pallavi, and I'm glad that I was part of Exchange for Media PR and Communication Women Achievers Award. Uh, it was amazing to be part of, uh, you know, this jury because I had industry peers who were also part of this jury. Um, and I think for me, it was most important to look at the entries which came in and a lot of efforts everybody's put in. It's amazing uh, for all the women professionals who've put in so much effort to fill in the entries. So everybody, I think, in, in my view, is a winner for taking that effort um, and giving it that amazing shot. Uh, for me, the important there were two important criteria to judge the entries. One is apart from the work uh, which is your domain, how have you uh, kind of uh, uh, you know shown uh, or paved the path for the organization's growth overall, uh, and how is it how your role has led uh, to overall growth of the business. Uh, in, in, in the role of what you've done, whether it is to do with PR, communication, working with different peers and organizations uh, to get your um, company up there in the list. And second, most important thing for me was how have you developed yourself as an individual? Because that is the key as a professional. How are you changing and how are you developing? Um, that was the second one. And I think um, if you look at for women achievers, um, we've come a long way to what it used to be a decade back. Organizations are more recep receptive for women now, um, uh, especially for whether it's senior positions or for that matter, even if I were to say some interesting strategy work, but we still have a long way to go. I mean, I'm only talking about maybe 0.5% or lesser uh, of what has happened till now. I think organizations have to still invest a lot of time and not just do a tick box of hiring women and giving them a platform, uh, but it's also very critical to um, help them um, and they should help themselves as well. And um, yeah, so and the last one I would just say, um, I just want to say that everybody during this time has done amazing work. What I read through all the, you know, detailed notes, what Exchange for Media has put out and it was very, very nicely done, simple to evaluate. And it's a great platform. I think for me, it's a great platform, Exchange for Media. Anything to know about marketing, advertising, uh, any news, uh, any new thing which is coming into the market from an industry perspective. So yeah, I wish them and I wish all the women who've uh, come in the entry, best of luck. You guys are winners any which ways. And be safe, take care, um, and let's really make this community proud. I'm so glad I was part of it. Thank you so much.
let me start by congratulating Exchange for Media for organizing an event that celebrates power of women in the communications industry. It's like come and Exchange Strategies we're have... very proud to partner the second edition of E4M, PR and Corporate Communications Women Achievers Award. That? The yes. experience during the jury meet was very rewarding yes. and exchange of ideas very thought provoking. It was a delight to be a part of an esteemed jury panel that cut across industries. The entries this year for the second edition of E4M PR and Corporate Communications Award for not only exemplifying clarity of thought, but also showcased innovation, leadership, and a remarkable zeal towards driving and contributing to the future of communications in India. The entire process was very transparent and the criteria very holistic. However, for me, it was important to see leadership skills and the future and contribution to the industry. All the stories this time were very authentic. Women today are leading organizations or actively contributing to the success of an organization and are really driving us into the future. And platforms like Exchange for Media, Women Achievers Award, recognize and celebrate the contribution made by women. I would say very good experience. Um, when this invite had come, one was wondering that, uh, looking at the number of people, how are we going to make it uh, happen? Uh, because so many heads and so many opinions. Um, also, the nominations ran into about 140, which had come down to a short list of about, long list of about uh, 80. And from a long list, we had to bring it down to a short list of, let's say, uh, about 50 odd. So. One thought this is going to be a daunting task, but uh, full marks to the Exchange for Media team, the planning team. Uh, they meticulously planned it out in terms of breakout rooms, in terms of uh, you know breaking us into two, three different groups, and then allocating about uh, you know twenty-one odd entries to each one of the you know breakout groups to do. Um, so I think my experience has been very good. It was meticulously planned, well thought out. Um, and uh, the experience of meeting other jurors uh, has also been uh, quite enriching. If I talk about the first, the quantum, then I, I, I am given to understand that 140 nominations were received, out of which the Exchange for Media team brought it down to about a long list of 80. From a long list of 80, our task was to bring it down to a short list of about 40 to 50. Uh, that tells you about the quantum, and uh, which means that this is this continues to be a very popular uh, summit and award. As far as the quality is concerned, um, I can speak for the entries which were allocated allocated to me, uh, and the quality was quite good. The quality was very good, in fact, I would say, because um, there were a couple of entries that I was. Um, confused about and I had to uh, go over them at least thrice to say where, where do I put them uh, and, and when you have this problem of plenty, um, this problem of plenty happens when there is good quality across the board. 